morning and welcome. If I could have all members of the ICC take their seats. Thank everyone for being here uh -huh. right and early this morning. Joshua Gordon, I'm the director of the National Institute of Health and the chair of this body, the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome members of the conspiracy uh, uh, in, on in, at Rockville, Maryland, and IMH Neuroscience, as well as members of the committee who are, who are online joining, joining us today. Also, pleased to welcome members of the public, uh, both uh, seated, seated here in the as well as those who are uh, watching video cameras. It's my pleasure uh, to uh, give you uh, uh, an update on what we are going to do today. I'm going to introduce some new members of the IACCs that are sitting around the table. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Dr. Susan Daniels, the executive secretary for IACC, who will take us through things business. Um, before we do that, welcome some of the IACC members who are new and ask them to just briefly introduce themselves. First is Dr. Brooke Mao, who comes to us from the Department of Justice. We're really pleased to have a representative of the Department of Justice join us on the IACC. Would you like to say a few words to introduce yourself, Brooke? Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm incredibly excited to be part of this group. Um, I recently joined the Department of Justice at the Bureau of Justice, where I oversee the criminal justice and behavior grant portfolios. So we do a lot of work bridging law enforcement and uh, behavioral health cross collaboration stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you for being a, an excellent demonstrator of how to use the mics. Just make sure you press the button, make sure it turns green, and speak directly into the microphone. That's so that not only people in the room can hear you, but also, of course, our members and the public online. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Maria Fryer, who previously represented the Department of Justice on the ICC. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christine Kavalik from the Department of Education. Yourself. We'll ask Christy to introduce herself later on. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, perfect timing. I think you're seated over there, but while you're doing that, I'll 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 uh, I'll acknowledge Dr. Larry Wexler. Most of us around the table know very well because he's the longest serving member of the IACC. He retired just a few months ago after the last meeting. And I'm really disappointed I didn't get to acknowledge that at the last meeting, Larry had been a really valuable member of this committee. But in the meantime, both, I'm, I'm sure an equally valuable member of the committee. Would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Sure, I'm Christy Kavlik, and I'm in the Office of Special Education Programs within the Department of Education. And I served as the alternate under Dr. Wexler prior. Nice to have you join us today. Another recent addition to the IACC is Ms. Camille Proctor. Camille was here at our last meeting, but didn't have a chance to introduce herself. Camille, would you like to say? It's not going to hear you. Not here last night. No, she's here. Okay, she'll be here. We'll have her introduce herself later. Um, but there is another new member of the committee sitting to my right. Dr. Monica Bertagnoli, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health, recently appointed. I'm really pleased to have her join us today. Um, usually, the NIH director is represented by an alternate, um, but I really, really wanted to come meet you all and address you this morning. So she'll introduce herself in just a few minutes. Um, but before that, uh, I acknowledge we have some committee member news to share. Dr. Matt Siegel. Not here, not here today, um, has been appointed to a dual leadership position as the Chief of Clinical Enterprise and Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Boston Children's Hospital, as well as the Chief Behavioral Health Officer at Franciscan's Children's. He will be in his new position next week, though he's not here today. We wish him the best in his new role. Uh, before uh, turning it over to Susan for the morning's business, I just want to acknowledge we have an exciting 
agenda for the rest of the day. Uh, we're going to hear a presentation from the federal interagency work group on autism. That is the group that Susan, in her capacity as the National Autism Coordinator, convenes to make sure that our federal agencies follow up on the recommendations of this organization. Um, they're going to be presenting on their various agencies' activities in the autism space and on how this group works together to achieve the goals that you all set forth for us. Uh, we're also going to discuss committee business this morning and this afternoon. We'll have public comments as usual, discuss them, and then have a panel on justice and law enforcement issues. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, uh, who's going to take us through the minutes, make some housekeeping uh, announcements as usual before we uh, begin with the program. Go ahead, Susan. Good morning and welcome. It's great to see many of you here, and thank you for joining us in person and online. Welcome to our members and also to the public watching us. So we are looking forward to today's meeting, exciting agenda that we have prepared for you. With us all day. Um, so next, I'm going to take attendance officially so that we can know who's here. So I will go to the attendance list and we can just say here or hello. Uh, Josh Woodward. Here. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Monica Hello. Diana Bianchi. Here, Alice, attending on behalf of Dr. Bianchi. Thank you, Alice. Amanda Bryans from the Administration for Community you know, uh, Children and Families. Up here. Anita Everett or Alternate Mitchell Berger from SAMHSA. Yes, this is Mitchell Berger. Oh, sorry, didn't hear you very well, Mitchell, but thank you. Yes, I'm here. Varshoni FDA. Hi, this is uh, Tiffany Varshoni. I'm the division director in the Division of Psychiatry at FDA. And also, I'll be in and out today. So, my um, alternate, Martine Salage, is on the line as well. Hi, everyone. This is Martine Salage. I'll be here when Dr. Varshoni steps away. Thank you, Martine and Tiffany. Cohen from UPA. Hi. Good morning, all. Good Jennifer Johnson from ACL or Amanda Reeker. Christy Hardy for NINDS. Hi, Susan. I'm here for Dr. Korshitz. Thank you. Everyone, if you're speaking into the mic, move it kind of close to you because I think it doesn't need to be a little India is going to be joining us in a little bit. Alison Marvin, SSA. Uh, good morning. Alison Marvin, SSA here. And I would also like to mention that we have a new alternate, um, Heather Gomez Bendania, Dr. Uh, Gomez Bendania, who will be my new alternate. And she is um, listening in, but I will be here the whole meeting. But I just want to at least welcome her, acknowledge her, and welcome her. Yes, yeah, so we welcome her. Thank you so much. I believe that the VA, Scott Patterson, uh, is not able to be here due to this minute issue, but um, the VA is also represented by the panel the HRQ or alternate Justin Mills. <laughs> and we just might be done for the Here. Here. Good morning. Laura Donalds. Here. Good morning. Barbara Rowland from IHS. Um, Bobby Peltier sitting in for Barbara Rowland for you. IHS. Lindsay Mackey, is and Judith Cooper. And then Judith is in the room. She's waved over there. Kristen Kaplan. Present. Nicole Williams. 
Yeah, hi, good morning, everybody. Scott, my name is Robertson for the Department of Labor. Good morning, everybody. Scott Michael Robertson from the Office of Disability Employment Policy. Thanks. Thank you, Karen McKenzie Williams. And Rick Wojcik from NIEHS. Yes, I'm here, Rick Wojcik, uh, Director of NIEHS, and I'm joined by my colleague, Cindy Lawler. Unfortunately, I'm, I made a commitment to give a presentation at the NIDCR Council, so I'll have to step up, but Cindy will be here and, and will be briefing me on, on the, uh, the meeting. Thank you so much. And now I'll go through public members. Alice Carter. Here. Thank you. Sam Crane. Hi, I'm here. I'm joining from uh, from home because I had a, a bad uh, disability day day. Um, I'm online. Thank you, Aisha Dickerson. Maybe arriving a little bit later. Tom Frazier. Here. Good morning. I'm here. Good morning. I'm here. Alicia Chappell. Good morning. I'm here. Craig Johnson. Good morning. I'm here. Yeah, Good morning, everyone. Present. Good morning. I'm here. Good morning. 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 Nancy was not able to join us today. Ivanova Smith. Good morning. This is Ivanova Smith. I apologize. My camera is not working. I am here. No problem. Thank you, Ivanova. Hi. 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 Good to see you, Harry. Helen Peter Busberg. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And Julie Taylor. Present. Thank you. And last, Paul Hi, good morning. Is there anybody that I didn't um, read off on the list? Good morning. This is Leah Lozier from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I think I was called earlier, but I'm just having some trouble with my audio. No problem. Thank you, Leah. And I see I am just beginning, so say good morning. <laughs> It's fine. It's great. You're happy to be here. Do you want me to say good morning? Yes. Oh, it didn't light up. Here we go. Aisha Dickerson. No. There we go. Aisha Dickerson. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So good morning. Good morning. Thank you. And I'm sorry that I didn't take the time to read everyone's titles. It's it's just it's a big committee. Um, and Dr. Burton only being new, there are 40 of our members of this committee. So um, everybody's online, though, and you can see all the implications there. It's a fantastic group of people that have dedicated their time to serving the legislature. So we really appreciate that. Next, I would like to turn our attention to the last meeting on October 11th. We provided this for the youth industrial. Does anyone have any comments about the draft? Is there anything that we benefited? Yes, this is Yetta Myrick. So on one of the round robin notes where we talked about the Family Voices project that I worked on, this is DC Family Voices and Family Voices is national. So I just want to make sure that that is corrected on the notes. Okay, thank you so much. Somebody from our team will make sure that's corrected before it's Anything else? Well, any more comments on the minutes? Can I get a motion on the floor for seven minutes? This is yet yeah, I can put a motion forward. All in favor of accepting the motion? It's watching. Are there any opposed to accepting these minutes with a correction? And anyone abstaining from voting on the 
All right. Well, with that, it looks like we have a new board accepting the minutes, and we'll make the post to the website as soon as the meeting's over. And if anything else comes up, any minor corrections, please just contact the office, and we'll get it taken care of. Thank you so much. So then, with that, we have some housekeeping announcements. Just letting people know. Um, Use your mic when you're speaking, and when you're not speaking, turn it off so that it doesn't create any feedback. And both online, uh, keep your microphone and your camera off unless you're speaking. And we will be having the same process we've had before for anyone who wants to communicate via writing versus orally. You can use Zoom for the members only. You can use Zoom to write in the chat to the being called send comments here, which is Mr. Stephen from my team, and he will keep the chat and he will read it for you. But you can also, when you want to be acknowledged, you can do Zoom. And if the chat is sent to Stephen, then like that. Um, and let us know anything else that you might need in terms of support for today. I want to make sure everyone feels comfortable. Um, Yes. We're hearing that the people on the phone are getting a lot of rebounding, so it's very important that we get right on top of the mic for them because they're getting erratic feedback. It is now, but it wasn't before. You have to really lean in. All right, so I think that is all that I have, and I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Gordon. Thank you, um, to, and thank you again, all of us. Meeting over the way to uh, welcome Dr. Mer Monica Pulley uh, to the committee today. As I mentioned before, as the 17th director of the National Institute of Health, Dr. Pulley assumes a seat in this committee, although most of the time, including later today, her duties will require her to be elsewhere. She insisted she had the opportunity to come today uh, and, uh, and hear a little bit of the business that we do and also speak to you. Uh, about her role here. Um, Dr. Bert Dignoli is uh, an amazing surgical oncologist and scientist who's made fantastic contributions to, uh, to reduce the burden of cancers. Uh, she's also been a, a tremendous contributor in the area of clinical trials more generally, and uh, for a year more, served as the director of the National Cancer Institute before President Biden asked her uh, to take on the role of director of the National Institutes of Health. And um, I'm not going to take any more of her time her to uh, introduce herself. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. And uh, good morning, everyone. I am really thrilled to be here for this kind of introduction. And I would say I have the tremendous honor of being the 17th director of the National Institutes of Health, but I have another tremendous honor in that I am the very proud mother of an autistic son. My son's name is Ben, he's 27 years old. He lives with his father and me, and he is a very happy guy, very mischievous character, and is a much loved member of our family. And I am so lucky to be Ben's mom. As you all know, every person with autism is unique and every family's experience is unique. Our story has been one of great challenge. Um, ben has some significant medical problems, but also great joy. We've been so fortunate that our experience overall has been very positive. And as NIH director, I want to strive to have that experience be true. NIH has long played an important role in federal efforts to identify priorities for autism research and services. The National Institutes of Mental Health leads and manages this interagency autism coordinating committee and also supports the activities of our national autism coordinator. I want to thank Dr. Joshua Gordon for his service as the IAC chair and Dr. Susan Daniels for serving as the IACC executive secretary and HHS national autism coordinator. As the director of the NIH, I'm also very pleased to be appointed as an official member of this important committee. I may not be able to attend every meeting, but I will always have someone here on my behalf to represent the office of the director and keep me informed about the committee's work. 
NIH is the largest funder of autism research in the United States, and we are proud of the important advances that have resulted from our investments so far. A couple of updates. A major goal has been to improve autism screening. NIH funded studies have helped translate findings about early emergency signs of autism into practical screening tools that can be implemented widely. For example, we are supporting the development of tools that can screen for autism in toddlers and the preschool age children by teleappointments and even a tablet based uh, screening app. The parents who had to go through the challenges of screening 25 years ago, 26 years ago, um, I really can say that this is a tremendous advance. NIH supported research has also found that multi stage screening and early intervention programs appears to increase autism spectrum diagnosis by as much as 60% compared with standard care. With the most significant improvement in detection of the Spanish speaking family. We are hopeful that such screening will improve early detection and reduce health disparities, which we also know are critical um, of critical importance to this community. Our research is also helping with what we know about the biological mechanisms that underlie autism. We support research to examine the link across genes, cells, brain circuitry, and behavior. We support longitudinal studies of brain development in children with autism in efforts to develop reliable and objective biomarkers for autism and measures of social function and communication. Really important because having such reliable measures are critical for testing new interventions um, to improve the lives of autistic individuals. NIH is also proud to support improved training and services for autistic adults and for youth transitioning to adulthood. In short, there is so much to do on so many fronts, the research laboratory, the clinic, the community people, and even, even individual families and homes. We want to partner with the breadth of people with autism and their families and communities in ways that are helpful and address the issues that are most pressing to them, to all of us. And I have and interdisciplinary teams of autism researchers and the inclusion of varied perspectives in the research process. And we are committed to important research that advances understanding of autism across the spectrum and across the entire lifespan. We continue to seek input from the autism community, including autistic self-advocates, and we will continue to work with all other federal agencies to help improve health and well-being of autistic individuals and their families. As NIH director, I am committed a relationship with those we serve is defined by the phrase, nothing about us without us. I don't expect that my son and will ever be able to live independently, but I am hopeful that he will live his best life, a life that brings him purpose and satisfaction. Every person with autism should be able to choose their own life and to have the support that is needed to achieve. At NIH, we will do our best to listen to this community, to partner with this community, because this is the only way we will be able to deliver our best efforts in this community. Thank you so much. I am so honored to be a member of the community of love and support for autistic people everywhere. And I look forward to working with you to make there is, so thank you. Turn it back over now to Susan Daniels, who's going to give us national market support updates. Thank you so much. And we really appreciate it as well. Thank you so much for being here.
So now I'm going to give the National Autism Coordinator an update, which is going to be the shortest one you've had since this new committee started because we have a special presentation for you today. So first, the National Autism Coordinator. I want to share with you that we recently completed this Report to Congress on supportive services for individuals with autism, and it was sent to Congress earlier, but it takes us a while to get the version up online for you. So now it's available online, and this is a report to Congress that was made on report language that was provided to us, and the report covers um, supportive services in which the health care will be beneficial for individuals on the autism spectrum, and provides some information about many different modalities of services that can be provided and also coverage policies, which was part of the request. And it highlights needs and opportunities for strengthening the system. And I encourage you all to read the report, especially community members, to see what is in there. Um, and this report is coordinated by my office and with the collaboration of different federal agencies and departments. And so we really appreciate everyone's Cooperation on this report is available on the website. Thank you. This slide just shows the list of some of the different types of services that are available um, that are in covered in the report, and so you can look through that, and we did try to be as comprehensive as we could with kinds of services. And some of the recommendations or the areas in the report that were identified as ways to strengthen the service system would be increased focus on family navigation or services navigation, as the system sometimes can uh, be across many different areas, and it's difficult as individuals, and so navigation is a great opportunity. Um, uh, continuity of coverage, workforce shortages, diagnostic services, uh, shortening wait lists, and the opportunities provided by telehealth. So we encourage you again to look at this report. If I could just interrupt for a moment, sure. Susan. I just want to make an editorial comment here. Um, officially, this body, right, is advisory to the secretary, and um, and officially, the national office coordinator tries to take what this body suggests and get all the different federal agencies to incorporate that into their policies. That's the purpose of EWA, as you'll hear from later. This report presented an opportunity. For this body, unofficially, through the National Office of the Coordinator, to present those recommendations to Congress. And Congress asked for this report so that they can figure out what they need to do legislatively to support these services. So this was a tremendous opportunity for, for Susan, for the office, for the secretary, and for you all to send a message directly to Congress. So I really appreciate the hard work that you've done over the last several years because a lot of the things that we've talked about in this room, as you can see just from that presentation, are in this report as recommendations to Congress. So thanks, and thank you, Susan, for putting it together. Thank you. So that is the main portion of the National Autism Coordinator update this time. I did, we did prepare the full listing of all the different activities across federal agencies in a document that is on the web. And I neglected to tell everyone who are tuning in online, all of our materials are on the web. You can access them there. So I'd encourage you after the meeting to look through the National Autism Coordinator update before the meeting. But now I'm going to turn to the special presentation that we have from members of the Federal Agency Work Group on Autism, which is the group that I share as National Autism Coordinator. And this group uh, has a number of different things. A group that meets um, in a non-public fashion because we are able to describe, um, to work on initiatives that are being planned and discuss in public. And we're able to take into consideration the recommendations of the IACC and how those can be implemented across the federal agencies. So this all federal working group was initially started 
several years ago in 2018 and now is named the Cuba. And we meet three times a year as well as have special meetings like we do in the fall to talk about initiatives. And we, this is the body that I use to carry out my responsibilities as National Autism Coordinator to help implement what the IACC has recommended. And the information that is exchanged in the group also helps us prevent duplication of effort, which is also a part of the Autism Leaders Act and one of our responsibilities. And the information that the FEWA generates does come back to you through the National Autism Coordinator updates, the reports that are put together by HHS and our office. And in other ways, we try to disseminate information. So we really appreciate the cooperation across federal agencies in the FEMA. It isn't a voluntary group. And we have excellent membership. And next slide. So this is a listing of all the different federal agencies that are part of the FEMA. And many people who are on the ISCC who are federal members also on the FEMA. We also have some additional agencies and departments that are not on the ISCC. So, with that, I'm going to have this presentation today, which is going to be an opportunity for federal agency officials to share some of their recent initiatives that are part of their strategy for addressing the ISC strategic plan and autism through their disability and autism programs. And we can't have all the members of the FIBA speak this morning, so we're going to have some speak today and some in April. So we are going to hear from Christy Cavendish from the Department of Education, Emma Vayner from the CDC, Lisa Jalabi from NIMH on behalf of NIH, Scott Robinson from the Department of Labor, Jennifer Johnson from the Administration for Community Living. Allison Marvin from the Social Security Administration, and Rob Oxenborf who represents the National Science Foundation, which is not a member of the IACC or FIBA, but collaborates very closely with us. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, which is Christy Kaplan. Each of you feel free to introduce yourselves um, as you start your presentation. Thank you. Um, my name is Christy Kavalik within the U.S. Department of Education, and I'm in the Office of Special Education Programs, which is part of the Office um, of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. Within the department, OSERS, the Office of Special Education Rehabilitative Services, and the Institute for Education Sciences, is where a large part of our work around um, people with disabilities and um, people with autism is situated. Within OSERS, we have two offices, the Office of Special Education Programs and then the Rehabilitative Services Administration. RSA administers Title IV of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And then OSEP, where I'm from, administers the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, which is the act that provides services to infants, toddlers, children, and youth with disabilities, um, birth through 21. I'm going to focus today on some of the work of the Office of Special Education Program, as well as the work of the Institute um, of Education Sciences um, under the umbrella of the IDEA. So the IDEA um, serves about 900,000 children with autism, in addition to infants, toddlers, and preschool children with autism and their families. The topics we focus on through national activities funding are research, um, technical assistance and dissemination, personnel preparation, educational technology media, and parent programs. These national activities um, are funded under Part D of the uh, IDEA. Next slide, please. I wanted to focus specifically on a few areas that we are focused on in OSEP this fiscal year within the personnel preparation line item, and then within our technology um, and media line item. Across 
um, the early intervention and special education systems. We have a shortage of workforce who are prepared to support children with disabilities and their families, including children with autism. And so our investments are trying to address um, the shortage of the workforce. We offer um, on the screen this coming fiscal year, these various uh, programs and a large part of them, the are preparation programs. So universities apply for funding and that funding then goes to support scholars in completing their bachelor's, master's, certificate, educational specialist, clinical doctorate, or research doctorate um, to work within the early intervention, special education, or related services fields. If someone receives um, their degree funded through an OSEP grant, they then owe years of service to the field. So that's the way to try to support people both entering in the field and then working in the field. We have a specific focus within OSEP on trying to increase the diversity of the workforce in early intervention and special education. And some of our investments this upcoming year are specifically geared towards minor, minority serving institutions, including HBCUs, um, historically black colleges and universities and tribal um, colleges in, as well. The other area just, and so how we have those programs set up is that applicants indicate who they will be preparing within their applications and some of these um, applicants specifically identify that they will be preparing uh, personnel to work in the field to have a specialization of working with children with autism. Not all the grants do, but across the, all these areas, there are grants that specifically focus on supporting children with autism. Our educational technology program, the, this is an area that we're focused on supporting um, educational technologies to be implemented within early intervention in school systems. And so the stepping up technology implementation takes an existing technology and supports the implementation of it in a real world educational setting. And then we are going to be funding this year, the National Center on Digital Access and Education to support more accessible educational materials for children. The next slide, please. I wanted to just highlight where the Institute for Education and Sciences, the National Center for Special Education Research, NICSER is what we call it for short, um, what they will be competing for this upcoming year. NICSER funds special education research um, across um, four types of research projects, exploration, development and innovation, impact and measurement, the way this is structured is that it's field initiated. So those who come in propose a project and um, some of the projects can be are proposed are specific to supporting children with autism in one of these areas. The other program that NICSER funds on an annual basis are training programs in special education to prepare individuals to conduct rigorous and relevant special education and early intervention research. So these generally go to um, new faculty that are entering the field. So early career faculty, those in postdoctoral um, programs so that they can start developing their area of research and specialization. And again, it's field initiated. So um, applicants may propose research that targets um, research around autism. And then a new grant that NICSER is funding for this upcoming year, again, with a focus on the workforce, because we know there are such shortages, is a center on the K-12 Special Education Workforce Grant. And it's to fund a research and development center to try to um, learn additional research on the special education workforce and how to support them. 
And then the last slide I just wanted to highlight was a document that the Department of Education released in collaboration with the Department of Health and Human Services that might be of interest to the committee. It's a policy statement on the inclusion of children with disabilities in early childhood programs. And this statement is a revision of a statement released in 2015. And the vision and of the statement is that we set the expectation that all young children with disabilities should have access to high quality inclusive early childhood programs that provide individualized and appropriate support so they can fully participate alongside their peers without disabilities, meet high expectations and achieve their full potential. So this policy statement offers recommendations to states and local programs of how to look at their systems across different areas to increase inclusive early childhood programs for children with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you so much, okay. uh, Dr. Adley. And now we'll hear from Matt Davis, CDC. Hey, good morning. I'm Matt Manner, and I'm the Chief of the Child Development and Disability Branch at CDC. Uh, next slide. Uh, oh. I'm just the one in between. There we go. Thank you. So uh, CDC is a public health agency with a broad public health mission and more specific to autism. CDC's autism programs and activities were first described in the Children's Health Act of 2000 and more recently in the Autism Cares Act. CDC autism programs include surveillance, including uh, tracking autism through the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, or ADAM Network, conducting research through the Study to Explore Early Development, or SEED, and promoting developmental monitoring and early identification of autism through the Learn the Signs Act Early program. While some of these programs have existed for uh, you know, more than a decade, CDC has increased its focus on autism across the lifespan and addressing disparities through public health surveillance and research. And uh, I just want to mention, I didn't have time to focus on the SEED research study this morning, but wanted to mention that in uh, this past year, SEED uh, launched its in-the-field data collection for its current longitudinal phase, which is going to follow up on previous SEED participants who are now uh, adolescents or young adults. Next slide. Uh, to highlight some of the recent activities from our surveillance program, the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, or ADAM Network, it uh, tracks the prevalence of autism among children age eight, uh, progress in early identification among children age four, and seeks to better understand the needs uh, and, uh, of adolescents on the spectrum as they prepare to transition to adulthood and uh, uh, post high school exit. So last April, uh, the CDC presented to the IACC on the latest ADAM data, which included updated prevalence estimates and uh, also showed disruptions to uh, early identification uh, that coincided with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And at the beginning of uh, this last year, CDC also received a budget increase to expand ADAM and the team has worked to establish uh, five new ADAM sites uh, to increase the number of sites that are collecting data on adolescents. And CDC was also directed to use the ADAM infrastructure to reestablish uh, cerebral palsy surveillance. Also in 2023, the first uh, publications uh, from the ADAM adolescent activities uh, came out. So there were two, two papers that focused on uh, the health and co-occurring conditions of uh, uh, children age 16. And then a second publication looked at um, services and supports indicated in uh, IEPs and, and uh, transition planning goals. Next slide. So the, the Learn the Signs Act early program encourages early, ongoing, and family-engaged developmental monitoring of all children and early identification of developmental delays so that children and their families can receive the services and supports they need. They do this through a variety of different activities, including 
of producing and providing free tools and resources, such as the Milestone Tracker app for families and professionals who serve them. We learned uh, earlier this week that the Milestone Tracker app is probably going to cross the 2 million download threshold any day now. So we think by Monday, it'll, we can say 2 million. Uh, CDC has also supported seven cohorts of ACT early ambassadors since 2011. Ambassadors are state or territorial leaders working to increase collaboration and coordination among early childhood programs and embed Learn the Science Act early into early childhood programs. And so as of last October, the program has grown to 60 ambassadors. They're in uh, 49 states, Washington, D.C., four territories, and three tribal communities. And both uh, individually and as a group, they are just amazing, amazing people. Uh, the Learn the Science Act early program has also established uh, partnerships to integrate the developmental monitoring uh, into programs and systems that serve young children and their families, uh, particularly focusing on reaching low-resource families through partnerships with the USDA WIC program. They provide technical assistance and collaborative learning opportunities uh, are, are, being, are being provided through WIC staff in 23 states and two territories. And they also are collaborating with the AAP to target messaging to pediatric healthcare providers about the importance of developmental monitoring, screening, referral, and follow-up. And we are now working closely with HRSA to embed these resources with their health center grantees who have been recently funded to focus on early childhood development. And I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Bailey. And next, we will hear from Lisa Gelati from the NIMH. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Lisa Gelati. I'm a program officer with NIMH, and uh, I'll be highlighting just a couple of NIH initiatives that may be of interest to the committee or that you may not be aware of. Uh, next slide. Okay, the first is the NIH Autism Centers of Excellence. The ACE program supports research on autism throughout the lifespan, including innovative and cost-effective services and interventions. The awards support research at individual centers, which feature collaboration, collaborations between a team of experts, and also at research networks, which involve multiple institutions. Um, each ACE has adopted a specific plan for enhancing diverse perspectives, or PEDP, that outlines strategies to increase the number of individuals from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds in the autism, biomedical, behavioral, and clinical workforce, as well as to increase the participation of underrepresented populations in autism research. Um, these centers are supported by a number of NIH institutes, including NICHD, NIDCD, NIEHS, NIMH, and NINDS. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see some information about the funding and the scope of the awards. Um, the current group of awards uh, are act will be active until 2027, and there's also a link to get more specific information about each of the ACE centers. Uh, next slide. Hmm. Next slide. Oh, uh, yes, that one. Thank you. Um, the next is the Intellectual and Development, Developmental Disabilities Research Centers. Um, these were established in 1963. Um, the NIH-supported IDDRCs are located at 15 universities and children's hospitals across the U.S. to provide support for state-of-the-art research in intellectual or developmental disabilities, including autism, using multidisciplinary, collaborative, and integrated approaches to advance the development of services and interventions for IDDs. The research projects include approaches to increase understanding of risk and resilience, um, use of novel technologies to improve assessment and treatment, and development of interventions for management of co-occurring mental health conditions. 
Um, the, there's, again, some information about the funding and scope. The current group of IDDRCs will be active until 2025. And at the bottom, there's a link for information about the announcement. Uh, next slide. Okay, and finally, the Rare Disease Clinical Research Networks, um, the RDCRN program. Um, oh, and I should say up front that this uh, program is led by the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. Um, the program is designed to advance medical research on rare diseases by providing support for clinical studies and facilitating collaboration, study enrollment, and data sharing. Through a network of consortia, scientists from multiple disciplines at hundreds of sites around the world work in partnership with patients and patient advocacy groups to study more than 280 rare diseases. The current group of RDCRNs include uh, 20 active consortia working on multi-site longitudinal studies, as well as pilot and feasibility projects to advance treatment for rare diseases, including Thala McDermid syndrome, which is associated with autism. Um, these are all cooperative agreements, and again, um, at the bottom, you can see a little bit of information. These are supported across multiple institutes, including NCATS, NICHD, NIMH, and NINDS, and uh, there's also a link where you can get some additional information about the centers, uh, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Jelani. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. Um, I'm Dr. Scott Michael Robertson. I am an autistic white man with blue eyes, brown hair, and glasses, wearing a red shirt and a dark jacket. I believe this navy with lines, and I've got the Office of Disability Employment Policy background behind me at the U.S. Department of Labor. And we are an agency that focuses on increasing access to employment and career pathways for diverse people with disabilities. Our mission specifically focuses on activities to develop and influence policies and practices that can increase the number and quality of employment opportunities for people with disabilities, again, from diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse disability experiences, all different types of disabilities. We place a cross-disability emphasis in our work, and we also focus on other specific areas of disability, such as um, support for empowerment of neurodivergent people and fostering neurodiversity at work, and fostering and aligning with priorities under the Federal Autism Cares Act um, and supporting the other work of our sister agencies, especially in regard to improving access to employment in government and in industry. And so our portfolio focus um, emphasis is on employment and careers, specifically competitive integrated employment access for people with disabilities, career pathways, and currently the federal good jobs initiative across the federal government that the Department of Labor is taking a lead on, and driving greater support for diversity equity, inclusion, and accessibility, or DEIA priorities um, under federal executive orders and other key executive policies and practices. And at the bottom of the slide, I have the Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP's, our home agency logo. And next to that is the recently celebrated um, 50th anniversary for the Rehabilitation Act um, of 1973 that uh, we had celebrated um, in the last several months, and have the logo for that there. Can we flip to the next slide? So I wanted to focus specifically on our work uh, around autism. We do a lot of other cross-disability work as well, so you can find that at our website, dol.gov slash agency slash ODEP. But I wanted to concentrate on our, the autism work just today. And our main work around autism is our research project um, that is called the Research Support Services for Employment of Young Adults on the Autism Spectrum. We often call that RAS for short um, because it is a, you know, long and um, the emphasis for that work is on youth and young adults because that is the charge that we had from Congress in congressional appropriations that asked us to do this project. It is by far 
the largest investment um, in autism from our agency's history um, in more than um, 20 years as an agency, um, specifically, um, what are we, 23 years as an agency. And the goal for this project, the RAS project, is to increase access and expand access to inclusive employment and career paths for autistic youth and young adults. And also, this has greater implications actually across the life course as well in terms of what works well for autistic youth and young adults um, works well for all autistic people at, at all different spots of the age range. And the funding for this project is under a contract with Mathematica, a partnership with Mathematica. Um, it's almost a $3 million project. It's $2.9 million to be precise. Uh, launched a few years ago in fiscal year 2021. And the project has been engaged in doing data analysis, running listening sessions, especially with autistic youth and young adults. We, in our listening sessions with autistic youth and young adults, we had about, I believe it was about 96 um, autistic youth and young adults and then many other constituents, uh, literature reviews, um, other forms of data analysis. We've already released uh, many different project reports from this project, and I just wanted to highlight a few on um, programs, models, and strategies from the research literature. Evidence on the effectiveness of programs, models, and strategies. Bears and facilitators to employment and careers. This is a report that came out of directly out of our listening sessions. And the most recent report on vocational rehabilitation characteristics, service use, and outcomes. This was an, al an, an analysis that Mathematica had done on the VR system, um, especially uh, the years leading up to uh, right before the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are also planning um, a survey right now of autistic youth and young adults. It's sort of in the planning and development stage. I can't share too many specifics. I'll be able to share more specifics down the line. Um, but this is going to be um, an activity that will be looking at surveying autistic youth and young adults directly about experiences and perspectives with employment and careers and bearers experience, for instance. And the point of contact for all these project activities is David Ro Rosenblum who is our federal project manager uh, for this RAS project. And then I am um, a point subject matter expert for neurodiversity at work, um, helping assist the project and its activities going um, throughout um, since it launched in FY 2021. And there are links to all these reports on the slide that you can see later on. And can we flip to the next slide? And finally, I'd like to also share some related neurodiversity at work activities that we have at ODEP. We, for instance, have an employer TA center, the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion, or EARN for short, ask, EARN for short ask .org. This technical assistance and policy development center has released a neurodiversity in the workplace guide, as well as a toolkit for supporting workplace mental health and had also hosted a, a webinar previously on hiring and supporting neurodivergent workers strategies for success. This webinar is archived online and you'll see also in our round robin notes sort of late breaking as we have a couple of sessions that were uh, recorded um, and posted online recently that I can mention in the round robin session uh, related to neurodiversity at work and mental health. And also our job accommodation network, AskJan.org, which is another technical assistance center funded by ODEP, has a neurodiversity at work webpage and has previously hosted a webinar on accommodation solutions for neurodivergent workers. Um, as noted in our Rad Robin, we also have another webinar coming up in that space. It also has specific web pages uh, for accommodations in the workplace for awesome mental health conditions, intellectual disability, many other disabilities in the A to Z library for work accommodations. And then JAN staff are also available to provide free expert and confidential assistance on demand on work accommodations and supports. Um, they have teams for specific types of disabilities, including for instance, a cognitive and neurological team. And again, this is all free expert confidential assistance, your taxpayer dollars at work, if you will. Anybody can connect with JAN, including um, job seekers, workers with disabilities, um, employers, service providers, family members, anybody who is interested in learning more about different ideas for uh, addressing barriers for work accommodations and supports and services, especially those aligned with the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. 
Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's it for us. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that update, Dr. Nicholson. I think we're going to hear from Dr. Jennifer Johnson, the Administration for Community Living. Are you able to access? Okay, we'll come back to Jennifer. She might be having some technical difficulties. So I'll skip ahead to Leah Lozier, Dr. Leah Lozier from uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Hi. Good morning. My name is Leah Lozier, and I'm a social science analyst in the Office of Policy Development and Research at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. And I am both an IACC and a FEWA member. Next, please. HUD's mission is to create strong, sustainable, inclusive communities and quality affordable homes for all. HUD is working to strengthen the housing market to bolster the economy and protect consumers, meet the need for quality affordable rental homes, utilize housing as a platform for improving quality of life, build inclusive and sustainable communities free from discrimination, and transform the way HUD does business. Now, HUD does not have autism-specific programs but it does serve persons with disabilities through all of its housing programs, including programs specifically uh, for those with disabilities. Among the 4.6 million households that had served through its rental assistance programs in 2023, 34% were headed by a non-elderly person with a disability, which includes about 30% in our of public housing, public housing households and 35% of voucher households. So we're really serving folks in all of our programs. But the focus of today's very brief presentation, I want to highlight four programs specifically for persons with disabilities. Next, please. So the first is the Section 811 Supportive Housing Program. Um, I'm sort of referring to this as the traditional program. This program provides interest-free capital advances, essentially funding to build and operating subsidies for nonprofit developers of affordable housing for persons with disabilities. The program is available for very low income households, meaning those with an income of less than 50% of the area meeting income. A related program is the Section 811 Project Rental Assistance or PRA program. And really the key difference here is integrated units. So under this program, state housing agencies that have entered into a partnership with state Medicaid and Health and Human Services agencies can apply for grants that subsidize rent for people with disabilities in affordable housing developments. The program subsidizes up to 25% of units in a property to ensure that people with disabilities are fully integrated into the community. Participants must have extremely low income in this, uh, in this program, which is at or below 30% of the median income. They must be 18 to 61 years old at the time of admission into the program, and they must be eligible for Medicaid or other health and human services. Next, please. So two other smaller and somewhat lesser known programs are mainstream vouchers and NED vouchers. NED stands for non-elderly disabled. Um, vouchers are a type of rental assistance that enables a household to rent in the private market and pay approximately 30% of their income in rent. So for mainstream vouchers, um, this is specifically rental assistance for non-elderly persons with disabilities. It follows the policies of our regular housing choice voucher program. And in this program, at least one adult member of the household must have a disability. As for NED vouchers, this is also rental assist assistance for non-elderly people with disabilities. But a key difference here is that the head of household must have a disability. And this comes in essentially two categories. The first is for non-elderly people with disabilities to access affordable housing in the rental market, which is very similar to our voucher program. And the second one, the key difference here, is this is for people with disabilities transitioning from nursing homes and other healthcare institutions back into the community. So that's it for me, thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Lozier. 
Thank you for being here with Dr. Allison Marvin on the Social Security Administration. Hi, hello, good morning. Um, I'm Alison Marvin, Social Security Administration, and I'm a statistician and researcher in the division of the Analytics Center of Excellence at the Social Security uh, Administration, and I'm both a FIWA and IAC member. Uh, and um, we, uh, as I say, we do not have autism-specific programs, but our programs do serve those on the autism spectrum. And um, we have two uh, disability programs. Uh, one is um, SSDI, which uh, pays benefits to insured disabled individuals and certain family members. And when we say insured, that's when people pay in from their, their payroll, their, their payroll, their paycheck, that part of that goes towards that. And we also have SSI, Supplemental Security Income. And that's for those with limited income and resources. That is funded by the general tax revenues. Um, I'm just going to touch on three areas where SSA does uh, help in addition to having these uh, support programs. One is uh, employment support, where we have policies um, in place to help our beneficiaries return to work by protecting their cash and medical benefits. Uh, the, the, the fear of losing medical benefits is is a major concern and often prevents people from trying to step back into the work world. And we also have our employment services, notably our Ticket to Work program. And uh, these are programs which help beneficiaries return to work and, and try and help them really succeed in the labor force. Ticket to Work is a free and voluntary program that contains individuals with in free employment services, for example. Um, next slide, please. Um, the second area is we are research and demonstrations. So, as I've noted here, demonstrations, they're temporary initiatives to identify services, supports, and policies to support people with disabilities. So, we try and uh, uh, see what works and um, try to see what lessons we learn. And, and you can also try and see what lessons we've learned if you see that first bullet. Uh, this is a link to uh, our, our State of the Science meeting on lessons learned from past demonstrations. This is a really, really interesting site, and you can download for free the book in PDF form, which contains all the presentations at that meeting. And you can learn a lot about the demonstrations, and you can learn a, lo a lot about what we learnt from exploring what we've learnt at these demonstrations. So really recommend that. And we also just completed our... Uh, support, supported Employment Demonstration Project, and I wrote that up in last the last meeting's round robin document, so you can read all about that uh, there and obviously in this link. And we evaluated our PROMISE um, uh, project as well recently. Other, and we have um, lots of research and analysis. We have our own journal, Social Security Bulletin. Um, we have data and surveys. We have public use files for people can use for their own statistical analyses. And um, if you want to look at the data from the SED project I just mentioned, those public use files are currently available. And we also have statistics. We have uh, statistical books, uh, which you, um, have, for example, SSI and SSDI, and it's often broken down by diagnosis, including autism. So you can actually go in there and there's Miles of data which can be downloaded in multiple formats. So that's all available for people to use. Um, next slide, please. I'm just going to mention, this is the last point I wanted to talk about, was research funding opportunities. Uh, we have the ICAP, Interventional Cooperative Agreement Program. This allows um, allows SSA, there's a, a legal, it's a legal way to allow SSA to partner with non-federal groups on research relating to SSA. And we have just um, made uh, an announcement uh, about this, and you can read about those in our current round robin document. I wrote that up, and you can see we have two awards. 
And one of the awards is actually about the, it's on the ABLE accounts, Achieving a Better Life Experience accounts, which are tax advantage savings accounts for individuals with disabilities and their families. And I've I pushed them in previous meetings, but there is a specific project relating to helping people, encouraging people to, um, you know, the uptake in ABLE accounts. As far as the Retirement Disability Research Consortium, um, those agreements were announced in September, and I mentioned those at the previous meeting, and you can read up about those in the previous round robin document. We also have uh, an annual stipend program for graduate students, the ARDRAW program. And uh, this was in, in hiatus while we looked for a new administrative partner. But this is one of the places where we have students who have specifically um, completed projects on autism. So this is where we actually have our autism specific research. And we've had some wonderful, wonderful uh, autism specific research from the graduate students. And I will let you know when we have the new awards up and ready to go. So um, we're looking forward to encouraging more students to apply for this program when it's up and running again. Thank you so much. And um, that's from the Social Security Administration. Thank you so much, Dr. Marvin. I'm going to move back to Jennifer Johnson from the ECL. Jennifer is on. Hi, yes, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my apologies for having to step away for a minute. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Jennifer Johnson, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Administration on Disabilities, uh, which is uh, a center within the Administration um, for Community Living. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Administration for Community, Community Living, or ACL for short, we are part of the um, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, and um, we fund disability and aging organ organizations that help support people with disabilities and older adults to live, work, and participate in their communities and also prevent them from going into institutions. Next slide, please. So I want to briefly highlight some of ACL's leading priorities. Uh, first, talking about our work on expanding home and community-based services, or HCBS, um, and addressing the institutional bias uh, to support uh, people to age in place and also to divert people from going into institutional settings, um, as well as uh, safely transitioning them back into the community from institutional settings. So a big part of that work has been focused on the um, what we call the HCBS settings rule, um, which in March of this year will be um, one year since the end of the transition to the um, HCBS settings rule. Uh, so again, we've done a lot of work in collaboration with CMS on the uh, um, implementation and uh, doing visits to states on uh, the implementation of the settings rule. Next, I wanted to briefly highlight the work that we are doing on supporting caregivers and building the caregiving economy. Um, I think for members of this team, uh, everybody is very familiar with the um, real crisis we have uh, in the direct care workforce that supports people with disabilities to live in the community as, as well as older adults. Um, and that a lot of uh, care is um, then um, ends up uh, being provided by family members uh, because of the um, real lack of direct care workers that we have right now. Um, so we have a number of um, in, uh, activities and initiatives uh, that we're um, working on uh, to address um, the caregiver crisis. Um, we have a significant investment and a grant to the National Council on Aging, aging uh, um, on the direct care workforce. Uh, and that is a project that is not only addressing the caregiving needs um, of older adults, but also the caregiving needs of people with disabilities across the, the um, lifespan. Um, we also have uh, the National Caregiver Support Program. Um, and the Lifespan Respite Program. Uh, also within ACL, uh, we uh, have oversight and support the RAISE uh, Family Caregiver Act um, and the RAISE Committee um, that's authorized under that act. 
um, as well as the Supporting Grandparents Raising Grandchildren Act. Um, and through those uh, two committees, uh, we have um, issued a national strategy on caregiving uh, to address, again, the, the caregiving crisis and uh, also help uh, support uh, the caregivers uh, that um, are providing uh, care to individuals um, with disabilities and older adults. Um, I want to just last touch on our priority around adv advancing um, equity um, to uh, address the needs of marginalized populations, and we lo really look at that from an intersectional perspective. Um, and uh, this priority really uh, is reflected in everything that we do. So in just the um, uh, work and initiatives that I just described as an example, you know, uh, in the implementation and addressing those, um, we are taking a uh, um, equity lens and an intersectional lens to, to all of that work. Next slide, please. I now want to move to briefly highlight uh, priorities within um, the administration on disabilities. Um, while we have other uh, disability-related re work that we do in um, ACL, including through the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, um, I'm just gonna, because of um, the short time that we have, uh, highlight the work that we are doing within AOD. Um, the first uh, being on investments that we have around health equity to really promote um, health equity for, for people with uh, disabilities. And so we have a number of initiatives and investments. Um, and on the slide, um, there are several links to more information about these projects. We don't have websites for everything because uh, some of these are new, like the uh, peer supports for uh, um, augmentative and assistive communication devices. Um, the uh, uh, another one that I just want to highlight that I know has been of interest to this committee is the IDD counts, which is work that we're doing to. Um, fill gaps in data that we have on the IDD population, which would include people with disabilities. Next slide, please. The next one I want to highlight, the next priority, is achieving economic security and mobility. And a lot of this work is um, focused on career um, uh, trajectories for uh, people with disabilities and supporting competitive integrated employment. Uh, we have uh, 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 state grants that um, it, it, we're in seven states uh, with grants called Community Collaborations for Employment to support coordination and collaboration uh, uh, to facilitate youth uh, transitioning um, to post-secondary life. Um, and then we also, uh, just to highlight uh, another project that we have is a longitudinal study that looks at uh, the um, trends in competitive integrated employment for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Next slide. Very important to our work is um, protecting rights and preventing abuse. Uh, and um, we uh, have had over the years uh, investment in um, a number of grants, uh, eight grants uh, specifically uh, to, uh, for what we call um, in brief living well grants that are just really looking at health and safety in the community. Um, and uh, better use of data to mitigate um, incidences of abuse and neglect. Uh, so we have uh, just come to the close of those projects. Some of them are finishing up their activities, but we're continuing evaluation of that and using those findings to help inform how we can best uh, improve health and safety in the community. And then uh, we also have the Center for Youth Voice at Youth Choice, which is addressing the school to guardianship pipeline uh, so that um, as uh, youth are transitioning out of school, they get more information and families get more information about alternatives to, to guardianship. Uh, last, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the next one, uh, the last one uh, that I want to highlight is empowering fa uh, individuals, families, and communities. And uh, this one is also very important to the work that we do and very um, core to what we do. And so we have a number of projects that we are funding um, that are intended really to uh, build uh, self-advocacy, self-determination skills for uh, individuals with disabilities, and also um, raise awareness and uh, help others understand how to support that within individuals. Uh, so uh, that is my last slide. Uh, I'm ready to turn it to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nelson.
And last, we're going to hear Dr. from the Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everybody. Rob Oxendorf with the National Science Foundation. Happy to be here. Um, next slide. So um, NSF is located in Alexandria, Virginia, with a mission of to promote the progress of science, advance the national health, prosperity and welfare, and to secure the national defense um, through research, essentially. Um, next slide. So NSF was founded as a federal agency in 1950 and supports curiosity-driven, use-inspired, basic, and fundamental research in all STEM disciplines. Um, NSF is the main public funder of academic research in areas not supported by NIH and also NASA. Um, NSF is divided into multiple funding directorates, including math and physical sciences, computer and information sciences, engineering, geosciences, uh, um, biology, social and behavioral sciences, STEM education, where I reside. I'm a program director in the STEM education directorate. Um, and there's a brand new directorate focused on technology, innovation, and partnerships, um, which began last year. Um, pictured on this slide are some examples of notable areas of investment um, made by NSF over the last uh, 70 years. Um, so here the, you can see areas related to astronomy, um, computer science, um, material science. Um, NSF likes to tout that the um, early search algorithm developed by the founders of Google was a doctoral research grant to Stanford University where those two individuals were graduate students and they had this great idea about how they could more efficiently and effectively search this new thing called the internet. And that then gave rise to Google. Um, NSF has a strong tradition of broadening participation in STEM, um, long committed to expanding opportunities to STEM uh, for people of all racial, ethnic, geographic, and socioeconomic backgrounds, sexual orientations, gender identities, and to persons with disabilities. Um, some recent initiatives and funding activities at NSF that I'd like to highlight. Um, just last year, NSF, along with IES at the Department of Education, funded a $20 million National Artificial Intelligence Institute focused on speech and language therapies. That's at the University of Buffalo. This AI institute focuses on transforming education for children with speech and language processing challenges. The team aims to address these challenges using an AI-enabled screener and an AI orchestrator, they call it. The goals are to use AI to more rapidly and effectively screen young children for speech and language difficulties, and then deploy the AI-enabled orchestrator to deliver evidence-based and customized speech language interventions to students in need in pre-K-12 classrooms. If you know anything about the speech language area, you know that there's a severe shortage of therapists who are able to meet the needs that exist in U.S. classrooms. and so. The idea here is to leverage advances in AI, large language models, um, natural language processing to um, hopefully um, screen more kids and deliver stronger interventions. Um, in addition, NSF has recently funded six what we call convergence accelerator projects focused on individuals with disabilities. Within these projects, NSF is investing in research solutions to address challenges faced by persons with disabilities, including the development of assistive and rehabilitative technologies to enhance their quality of life and provide greater opportunities to gain full employment. With this $30 million investment, NSF has selected six multidisciplinary research teams to advance a convergence approach between researchers, innovators, and persons with disabilities, spanning organizations and communities across multiple sectors. This work is crucial to ensure uh, these NSF uh, funded solutions address barriers to employment, freedom of movement, and quality of life for persons with disabilities. Um, related to the IACC, NSF projects continue to be represented in the IACC Autism Research Database. Just in the last several years, NSF has funded hundreds of research projects focused on STEM learning, workforce development issues, and broadening participation research for individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, next slide, please. And I'll just conclude here. So. These are some of the um, 
prominent areas in which NSF funds autism related research. So you can see um, my area mostly in K-12 STEM education, but also a lot of work we support in undergraduate STEM education, individuals with autism on college campuses. How are we uh, helping universities, faculty um, to be supportive of individuals on the spectrum who are pursuing STEM education degrees? Um, informal STEM education, which refers to sort of outside of school opportunities. So think about museums, science centers, um, uh, podcasts, children's television. Um, we fund quite a bit in that space that has an autism focus. Accessibility and accommodation, um, technology and small business innovation. I was, I don't work in these areas, but NSF funds a lot in small business innovation. Think about wearable tech small business startups interested in wearable technologies to assist people on the spectrum, um, STEM workforce development issues. We fund cognitive and behavioral research, looking at um, opportunities, challenges related uh, to STEM learning um, for individuals on the spectrum. And then we also support a variety of convenings and workshops um, on this topic as well. So thank you, happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Oxenoglu. So we heard from a selection of our uh, people members, and really appreciate bringing them out. And you were very closely involved in the regular basis, but I see. So we mentioned the ICC meetings that you see um, online. We also are working with the ICC to implement autism related programs across the state. So now we have a few minutes. We have about 10 minutes to take some questions from the committee. And then we'll have some. And we'll find out here for our uh, bio and network members. So I'm going to ask Dr. Oxenoglu to come forward. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to ask Dr. Oxenoglu to come forward. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank everyone who presented today across um, the multiple yeah. agencies. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, let me take the mask off. Okay. So um, thank you for everyone who presented um, and for all your hard work. Really excited um, about the work group. I do have a question that is concerning as I think about how this work is being translated out into the larger autism community. So there are a lot of great initiatives that I heard about today, some of which I already knew about, some that I'm learning about, right? Um, but how, like, what is the the sustainability plan of these various initiatives. How is it reaching the larger autism community? That is, is what I'm concerned about. We are privileged here to be at this table, right? And having these conversations and, and learning about what's happening. But there, I'm thinking about autistic individuals, their family members, right? Caregivers who do not have access to this information. And so how is it, like what is being done to ensure that this is getting out to the larger masses. Like that is just, this is something that just keeps coming up for me, right? Um, and so I would love, I don't think we have time to hear from everyone. Um, what I would invite you all to do is if you, we do not have the time to maybe write something up to share with the committee, because I think it's really important to, to highlight how this work is translating out in the community. What is the dissemination plan? How are, we, how are we sustaining this? I think that's a great question, and I wonder if there are any members who would like to take just a moment to address that. I'm thinking in particular of the CDC. The mentioned two million people have downloaded that app as maybe one example of using a successful dissemination. But if there are others who would like to think about how they try to ensure that. Really quickly, if I can just jump in and say I am one of those Act Early Ambassadors. Um, I am the DC's Act Early Ambassador, and it takes a lot of hard work for us to get information out to the community, right? There are, um, you know, a lot of, I'm just going to speak for DC for a moment and say, there's been a lot of turnover, right? We've, we've heard a lot about workforce across all these different agencies and how we're really trying to reach folks, but there are a group of us, there are 60 of us, we're all across the country and we're doing this work. So maybe that is something that needs to be taken into consideration as you are funding these various initiatives. So I just wanted to, to throw that out and say that this is something that's like 
we're constantly working on. So I don't necessarily think that everyone's going to have the answer right now, right? But I think we really need to be thinking about this because the numbers are the numbers are going up, right? Which is amazing because now people are getting the help that they need if we can access it. If there is individuals who have the skills to support the community. I was Yes, good morning. Uh, Marina K uh, in the comments section. Uh, Marina K in the comments said uh, they fully agree with what Yetta has stated regarding dissemination. Thanks. Scott? Yeah, and I, by the way, I'm sorry that I forgot to mention that I'm a senior policy advisor uh, at, at, at ODEP, so I forgot to mention my title earlier, so sorry about that. But, yeah, we take uh, sustainability uh, fully in mind with our Reyes project and our other activities, and it's helping inform our longer-term work to empower neurodivergent people, including autistic people, and, and drive greater support for neurodiversity at work through long-term policies and practices. Sustainability is always a part of our work on employment. It occurs partly because we take the long uh, game, if you will, because policy development takes many years off into shape um, and, and enhance. Um, but I'm glad that that was emphasized, and it's something that if other of our sister agencies, for instance, have other ideas for supporting our sustainability and scalability, we're always open to suggestions for um, enhancing that focus in our work on increasing access to employment and careers. Thank you so much, Scott. I also want to say something as National Autism Coordinator and as Exec Center of the IACC that we do see IACC often to amplify what agencies are doing. Every agency that is planning their program has some plans for their own dissemination and they have their own audiences through their social media and other means. But we also amplify that by having this presented in a public meeting. And as you know, our website is pretty extensive and we have information there. We have a newsletter, et cetera. But if members of the committee have suggestions on specific kinds of uh, dissemination that might be able to be accomplished through the IACC, you're welcome to just talk with me about it and we can look into that. But we do try to amplify the work of our agencies as well. The next, um, Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, this is a very relevant conversation. I've been talking with some care providers and others through a, a big project we're working on with Madison House. And one of the big questions is dissemination and being able to get information. And we're wondering if there would be a possibility of a public private situation so that things from various agencies could have an identification perhaps on a website and also private things that are being done. There would be a need for cur uh, curatorial work on certain things that are on there or sound, but there is a huge need and people who want to get information. People may turn to IF for wonderful things, uh, but there are some other innovations, different types of things that are happening across the country that others would like to hear about because we see a lot of good things happening in one area that should be shared in other areas, and there's not really a mechanism and taking the knowledge base that somebody in one location has found that may be helpful across the country. Thank you. Thanks. I think what we'll do now, Gene, is it quick? No. <laughs> I think we'll take our break now. Um, there will be other opportunities for this question. have several reps here. Break. So we're going to pray now uh, until uh, 11 50. Yes, my question then. <laughs> you can ask it now if you want. <laughs> Continued good morning to everyone. The next uh, section of our agenda today is for us to address outstanding IACC committee business. I'm going to turn things over to Susan. Uh, to introduce our discussion for this morning. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Josh. I am going to start by giving Camille Proctor a chance to introduce herself. 
and I know that you just sat down, Camille, but we would love to hear from you as one of our newest IACC members. Um, hello, everyone. My name. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, hello. Close to the mic. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Camille Proctor. I'm the founder and executive director of the Color of Autism Foundation. Um, the Color of Autism Foundation, we support families and individuals in underserved communities throughout the United States. Our focus is building efficacy within the families, as well as supporting autistic individuals on their pathways to their voices and choices. Fantastic. And do you want to say anything about your lived experience as well? Well, certainly. I forgot that part. Um, I am a mother of a soon-to-be 18-year-old autistic young man. Um, and I founded the Color of Autism Foundation uh, because there was no organizations that looked like me. And there were no organizations, and when I say look like me, that it could address the unique issues that were very prevalent within my community. And um, I really got the best way for me to say this is that I got tired of them taking the one minority that was in their organizations and using them as a trope or a prop to kind of glaze over some of the issues that we do have in urban communities. So um, effectively, that's how and why the Color of Autism Foundation was um, founded, because there's a definite need. There will continue to be a need. There's not enough um, minorities at the table and so I just decided, excuse my expression, to bring my own damn seat. Thank you so much, Camille. So we appreciate having you on the committee. And also we've had you as a speaker a couple of times on some of our panels and you'll be contributing today as well. And we appreciate that perspective. So we're going to move into committee business. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Sorry. The it doesn't like me, I don't think. So we have. I'm going to tell you some ONAC staff updates and talk about some of the documents that we've had that we've worked on recently and our upcoming activities as well as the summary of advances. Oh, there's a question from Marenike. Uh, Marenike um, and just uh, added a comment as Shirley Chisholm says, bring a folding chair. Thank you, Marenike. So next slide. So the ONAC staff updates are, we have a new person on board on our team, Ana Capuccio, who is also um, by training an attorney, has joined the ONAC as our new operations coordinator and will be assisting with administrative duties in the office, um, along with Angelis Matrakis, who most of you know, who is our management analyst, and they're going to be working on our administrative issues. So you will be, I'm sure, in communication with Ana. And also, I wanted to announce that Stephen Isaacson, who has been on our team for a while now, recently got his master's degree in social work. And which is a wonderful accomplishment. And congratulations, Stephen. And he's taken on a new role in the ONAC as our first neurodiversity liaison. He will be assisting ONAC with community outreach and projects that are related to issues related to neurodiversity, such as neurodiversity at work. And we really appreciated Stephen's contributions to the IACC and our office's work and wanted to really prioritize that outreach and connection with the community. So thank you, Stephen, for serving in that role. Next, I want to share with you that the 2022 IACC Summary of Advances was published recently, and this was required by the Autism Cares Act of 2019. It provides lay-friendly summaries of the 20 most significant advances in ASD um, autism biomedical and services research that were selected by the IACC and includes articles addressing all seven areas of the strategic plan. The full report can be found at the link that is provided on the slide, and it's up on our website. It's in the carousel when you first log on to the website. And also there's an easy read version of the report found on the link below. And we did receive a public comment that um, mentioned that they didn't feel that the easy read was easy enough to read. 
we did boil each research paper down to one sentence and tried to use words that um, are readable by at least one sixth grader. I know my sixth grader could read it and understand it. Um, we did not have a way to condense it into pictures. That was requested that it be depicted in pictures, but I think most research papers are very difficult to summarize in a photo or a picture. So that's the best we feel that we can do on taking a scientific publication down to a more condensed version, but we hope that it will be helpful. And I know I've received a lot of public comments as well that have been very positive and supportive of that. So thank you so much. Next, we have um, our upcoming activities, which we talked about at the last meeting. So in October, 2023, the IACC voted to focus on co-occurring physical and mental health conditions and their impacts on health outcomes for the 2024 IACC strategic plan update, because we are required by law to provide some type of update. And we're going to do a deep dive into this particular area. And the draft report on co-occurring conditions was actually initiated by the previous committee and will be used as the foundation for this report. As decided in 2023 by the current IACC, ONAC is going to work with the working group chair, Dr. Julie Taylor, to update the draft before it comes back to the IACC for review. And in addition, ONAC has published a formal request for public comments on co-occurring conditions on behalf of the IACC per your request. And the results of that request for information will be shared at the next IACC meeting. And the IACC will have an opportunity to review the comments. And the final report, our goal is to get it out in 2024. Next slide. So this is a slide on the request for public comments, and it is open until February 14th, and there is a web form where you can submit your comments. To date, we have received 678 completed submissions, and we also have 247 incomplete submissions where someone may not have pressed submit at the end, or maybe they're still thinking or working on this. We will reach out to those individuals to try to get them to complete their comments. Uh, we have already captured the information in our database, but we don't want to count it as complete until the person has indicated that they're wanting to submit it. So we will reach back out to them. You can still submit comments. If you're having any kind of technical issues or difficulty with submissions, please write to our office and we can get you a personal assistance to help you submit your comment. Um, and this is also in the Federal Register. And please feel free to share this with your networks widely. If you need any kind of materials like the, the email that we sent out, you need a copy of that so you can forward it by email. Or if you need a social media graphic, let us know. We can help you out with that. But we would love to get as much input as possible so we can get the most timely update to this issue in our next strategic plan update. So steps forward with this include that ONAC is going to categorize the feedback that was provided from this request for public comments and get it back to you in April. We will also work on updating the draft report and incorporating feedback from the request for public comments. And ICC members will be receiving the opportunity to review the draft and review the public comments. And we will work toward this to finalize the report during this year. So that's the end of committee business, which is pretty short. We did finish our big strategic plan update last fall, and that has gone out already. We've completed the 2022 summary of advances. We are working toward 2023, which is the next item of business. But maybe I'll take a pause here before we move into the summary of advances to ask if there are any questions. Sorry, I have another yes. question. <laughs> um, when you all look at the public comments, are you keeping track of what states and territories are actually submitting comments from? We have um, some voluntary information that we were provided. We didn't ask them their states or That's right. Yeah. We ask for 
whether they might be uh, an individual with autism, a parent, an advocate, a researcher, et cetera. So we'll have that information. They can voluntarily provide their name and organization if they wish, but I doubt that we'll probably have states and territories. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about the form, I'm like, no, you wouldn't have it. So sorry about it's, that question. It's also, I'm just curious to know, you know. Where... In terms of privacy for us to collect too much demographic information on the person. So if the person voluntarily gives us at least their name and their affiliation, many people we found in the autism community like to have their name shared with their public comment. So we want to give that opportunity for acknowledgement. Privacy is not always the desire of the presenter of the comment, yeah. but we also do want to protect the privacy of individuals that don't want their information shared. So we, we will have that demographic breakdown for you okay. in terms of how many autistic individuals may have submitted, et cetera, based on whoever voluntarily fills that part out. Thank you, Susan. Anything else? All right. Well, we wanted to reserve a good amount of time for the 2023 Summary of Advances because last time we weren't able to do that. Next slide. And I'm just going to go over the process before we move on, and I will hand it over to Josh. So the IACC members have been in the process of nominating articles that represent January 2023 to January, 20, well, December 2023. And today you're going to discuss those nominations. And after this meeting is over, um, once you've discussed the nominations and decided if you're eliminating anything, adding anything, or have any comments on it, after this meeting, we'll give you the opportunity to vote on the top 20 articles to be presented in the publication, and all the remaining nominations will be listed in the back of the publication. Our office, the ONAC, will work on preparing summaries of the articles and the draft publication. And IECC members will have a chance to preview it before it's published. And we look forward to helping you get this publish out, publication out in spring to summer 2024. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to Josh. Thanks, Susan. And thank all of you for your nominations. We have a grand total of 76 nominations, so 76 contributions to the scientific literature on advances relevant to autism. And I think um, virtually all of them are uh, represent um, absolutely wonderful contributions to that literature. And our task here is to try to identify 20 that we will collectively put forth as is our uh, responsibility under the Autism uh, Cares Act to, uh, to Congress and to the public as being representative of the kinds of advances that will change uh, change things on the ground for individuals, families, and communities with autism, the um, uh, process that we perceive that we've uh, that we've are, are tasked with today is not to go through each and every one of them. We we can't make it through seventy six if we want to discuss each of them. But what we're going to do is in each of the seven categories is give you an opportunity to do one of three things for any of the nominations in that category that you feel it's necessary to bring up to this group. So we're going to assume at baseline that, you've, uh, that you can read and get a sense of the, uh, the topic and the importance and the quality of the work from the abstract. So uh, I, I would like to say let's, let's hear about three different types of categories. One, if there's an article that based upon our criteria, which is that, you know, it should be a, an advancement that's worthy of public, uh, um, uh, that we're worthy of, of expressing the public, it should be well-powered with a, a, a well-done, rigorous study, and it should be primary research not uh, reviews of other literature. These are the criteria that we've agreed on, although we have made exceptions in the past. Um, if based on those criteria you feel it doesn't belong on this list, we should not be voting for it, um, please raise that with us today. If there's uh, a, an exceptional study in here, they're all exceptional studies, but that for whatever reason the abstract doesn't convey that and you really think it's important to make a brief comment in support of that article, please do. And similarly, a brief comment uh, against inclusion in uh, in the final 20 on any of them that you feel, again, isn't expressed well in the abstract and you really want, need to make that comment. So let me open it up for comments on the body of 
uh, of nominations that are in the first category, screening and diagnosis, uh, which is uh, uh, nominations one through eight on pages two to five of the document. Um, let me just open it up if there are any individuals on the committee who'd like to make a comment in one of those three areas. Dina. Um, I just have a question for Dr. Frazier about his... Um, a little closer to the mic, please. Dr. Frazier's nomination for um, the eye tracking study. Do you have any idea what the sample size was for that? It was well-powered. Um, I don't have it up. Microphone, there. sorry. Yeah, it was it was well powered. This is the the JAMA publication, I think. I don't have Jones, it. Climate, yeah, et cetera, yeah. Social uh, Visual Engagement. That's Ami Klin's work. Um, you know, they've been doing this for a long time. It's very well powered. It was it's a it was a pre registered study. I mean, they really did everything right <laughs> in this work. Yeah, go ahead, Alicia. Oh, sorry. I'll add to say that um, there was a, a original study and there was a replication study and the replication study that was the validation study that went to the FDA was across, I believe, at least four sites and almost 500 people. My problem is I don't know how many people are in a site. That's it, why I'm asking. Yeah, looks I'm like happy there were to send 199 you. enrolled children. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, ju just in case others aren't aware, the PMIDs are clickable, I think, on all of these, so it goes through to the articles. Um, so the answers to, to Dina's question and many others might be able to be found that way. I just want to make the point that, that there are two articles here from Jones, Clayman, Richardson, and, and uh, last author, Clint. Uh, the one that Tom nominated is number three, and that is the more recent, more mature, if you will, representation of the project. So. I would certainly favor number three over number four, which is earlier work from the same group. I feel comfortable actually then withdrawing number four, uh, given that NIMH nominated it and that number three you're saying is the, is the more comprehensive example of that work. Okay, so we will withdraw number four. We won't vote on that one. Any others? I would like to just make a very quick comment about Sam uh, at all, number seven on the list. Um, this is obviously a really uh, important area for coverage in the sense that it's about uh, equity and uh, inclusion of underrepresented groups in care models. And the Get Set Early program is an evidence-based approach uh, to the screen, evaluate, and treat um, model that we heard about a little bit earlier today as something that we think can really change the course uh, for uh, treatment in early autism. So I, I just wanted to highlight that to make sure we understood this, this study addresses many issues that have been raised before this body in the past. Okay, so we'll move on then to the next set of application, oh, sorry, applications of nominations uh, in the biology section. Uh, which goes from page 5 to page 11, uh, nominations number 9 through, wow, uh, 9 through 21. So about 12 nominations in that area. Any comments, highlights, uh, any, any that you suggest might need to be withdrawn? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to the next section. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Sorry to be slow on the draw. A, a number of the articles nominated in this section represent work in animal models or in other kinds of experimental models, not in people. I, I wonder if you, Dr. Gordon, have any comments on the suitability of, of those papers uh, for, for our voting? Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, a point. There are a few in there, like number 18, that are done in humans. Um, but when we're talking about biology, what we're looking for here from my perspective in this group and in appealing to the public, it's one thing. We're not trying to appeal to other scientists here saying, oh, this is a hot area of, of advancement or cool technology. What I'm trying to look at as I read these nominations is which ones are the ones that we should know about because they have really the potential for translation. 
And sometimes that's going to be in an animal model because we can get at the mechanisms better. We can get down to t potential targets for treatment. So again, not to bias you in any way, but if I'm looking at one of the human studies uh, by Schwartz et al. Uh, on auditory evoked potentials in adolescents with autism, uh, this is a step forward in terms of being able to potentially develop biomarkers, but it doesn't have the ability to then go in and ask, well, what are the molecular or uh, cellular elements that we could target with a therapy, be it a drug or a stimulation paradigm? So th there are different, different advantages to the different cut types. So I would be looking at those abstracts and trying to say, um, you know, which ones have the potential to, to develop into something uh, that would be a, a, of use. And that, that's how I would try to evaluate it. And I think that could happen from animal or human work. That's my own bias. Others, happy to comment. Marenica, please. Good, af <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, Marenica says in the comments, excellent question regarding the animal models. Thank you for asking, as this is something that has been discussed in the community with varying opinions. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments on the biology section. Yes, go ahead, Susan. So I actually just want to follow up on this, um, and I'm glad Paul raised it. I, I think we need to look really carefully at the animal studies. I think there's at least uh, one that I'm looking at, which is number 10, which is um, really using an, an animal knockout model of autism and looking at behaviors in the mice that mimic or mirror behaviors we see in children um, or individuals who are autistic. And I think that we, we need to take a, a, that's not that that work isn't important, but is it one of the findings that's really moving the field in a different direction? And I think I would argue that if you're looking at behaviors that you're trying to find in rodent models that we know are present in autistic individuals, that may not be um, one of the ones that we want to uh, highlight on our list for the IF. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. So this is uh, the Chen et al. article on, um, on aversive responses to touch in mice. And I agree with you that it's very important to not read, to, to understand that a behavior in a mouse is very, very different from in a human and that you need some evidence of translatability at different levels other than behavior to be able to interpret much from the studies. I think a strength of that particular study is the use of, in this case, a bona fide uh, mutation, which we know in humans does lead to increased risk for autism. That's the fragile X mutation. Um, but as you point out, the reliance on a behavioral readout, which can be challenging to translate from uh, rodents to humans, social touch means something potentially very, very different in a mouse than it does in a human being. And I think we have to re remember that. Thank you for that discussion. So as you go through those nominations, you can keep these ideas in mind, uh, whether you wish to endorse any of those uh, studies. We'll move on to the next set of nominations in the area of genetic and environmental risk factors for, I should say, factors, because it's not just risk, it's risk and resilience, um, in, which is on pages 11 to 14, comprising numbers 22 through 28. Any comments along the line or questions uh, on any of those nominations? Go ahead, Elaine. Yes, I just... Um... Unfortunately, I haven't had time to, to go through these thoroughly, but I, I do notice, I do have some concern that um, some of these probably should not be promoted as, um, uh, you know, in, in, in this package, be, you know, so even just the, um, the number 22, the PFAS1 um, excellent research group and their findings, you know, are, are sort of, they very clearly say they're a bit equivocal. So I'm not, it, I, I sort of, um, in this area, especially when we're talking about some of the environmental exposures and chemical ones in particular and the PM and things, um, since I'm not sure how it, it, it forms people's decisions or policies, um, especially when the findings are, 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 
are not, you know, so clear. Um, I, I, I guess I just want to sort of have that in the front of people's minds as they're looking at these. Um, and, I'll, right. and, and I'll look more closely. Thank you. I mean, I'm looking at the abstract right now um, as, as quoted in here, not the abstract, the description of it. Um, and it, it is, does sound equivocal. Blood levels were not strongly linked to any changes in SRS score. Um, ex, the, the sex differences in exposure was not robust. Um, and the conclusion, the need for further investigation could suggest that it's not ready for prime time. Yes, uh, exactly. Alicia, did you want to comment on this particular article or did you want to raise a different one? Well, it has to do with this particular article. Please, go ahead. The article and the question that was raised. So I think, um, number one, you know, we get caught up. I, I want to warn us against um, voting down negative findings, right? So uh, th besides this, so this can stand on its own, but it does have to do with equivocal findings, right? So they didn't find an effect. Does that make it non-important because it wasn't a positive effect? It was a lack of an effect. So I think we need to, uh, you know, kind of think about that. And then I did if and I didn't know if her concerns were more because the outcome was autistic traits, not necessarily an autism diagnosis per se. So I, you know, maybe you can provide some guidance about is there a line or do we yeah. use our own judgment about the line between autistic traits and an autism diagnosis? Well, I think. It's a great question. We're trying to determine whether, you know, we want to reject this outright or just now you've heard some things about a week into the paper and maybe, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a recommendation that you not could vote, but you can make your own mind up. And I think we're trying to figure that out just now. Uh, let me just say that I think there is, I agree with you 100% on negative findings, right? There are some really important negative findings in this field, right, that, that can help reassure people uh, and that can guide policy decision making. I think the uh, the comment and question here is whether this is a negative finding or what we would call an equivocal finding, meaning a finding that we cannot make conclusions from. And while those findings are important in the sense that it does say we need more research, do we want to put one of those equivocal findings, one that we can't make conclusions from, forward as an advance? as opposed to recognize that it's important contribution, we're not ready yet. Aisha, were you raising your hand? Yes, yes. Right ahead. Yep, thanks. So um, as somebody who works with the ECHO group, I can say that they're, they were purposeful in using autism traits instead of an autism diagnosis because they listened to autism advocates and saying that they don't want people to look at risk factors for autism, but instead look at autism symptomology. So they purposely looked at autism traits in an effort to, to work collaboratively with the autism community. So I wanna say that, that it's not a, we're avoiding looking at autism so much as we're trying to look at symptomology instead because that's what has been requested from the community. Um, I saw another hand over here, I missed it. Uh, was it Jenny? Did you have a comment or a question? Okay, we'll get you next. Uh, let me just ask. Um, I, I'm not hearing a very strong uh, 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 consensus that we should remove this, um, right? Okay, but you've all heard some concerns about this. Take that into account, of course, when you make your decisions as to which to vote for. I do want to just ask if the, since NICHD nominated it, whether Alice Cow, the representative for NICHD today, has anything to say about the uh, uh, article aims at all number 22. Is there another alternate for NICHD on the phone? Hi, Dr. Dr. Gordon. Um, yes. This is Alice. Yeah. Hi, Alice. Uh, no, we just thought it's it's uh, it's it's a uh, a well powered study and it was uh, bringing it up for IACC committee's consideration. But Thank I definitely you. under understand the um, the issues raised and discussed just now. Okay, Kathleen, Kathleen, do you have anything to add to it? No, nothing to add. Okay, good. Okay, we'll move on then to the next session section.
Oh, sorry, Marenica, you did have a question or a comment. Yes, hello, Marenica has two comments. Uh, they say, we are not mice. And they also say, I appreciate the term, uh, the use of the term traits and the intentional efforts to be respectful and worded. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and I agree with both of those comments as well. Uh, we will move on then to the next section, which is on uh, interventions, which is uh, located on page 14 through 17 of the document that you received. Uh, nominations 29 through, I can't find page 17, there it is, through 36. Any comments or questions? Jenny, go ahead and start us off. Hi, um, for number 30, uh, first author, Che, the intervention study doesn't look like it's specifically to autism, but neurodevelopmental disabilities in general, although autism was mentioned, but it, I'm wondering if the committee feels that this study is just too broad and not specifically autism. Uh, there's number 30, Che, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Any comments or responses to Jenny's point? Are you suggesting that we might want to withdraw it or just making the case? Okay. So there's a, there's a suggestion that we should withdraw this because it's not specific to autism. Are there objections to withdrawing it? Go ahead, Susan. I don't have a specific objection to withdrawing it, and I think that's a very good point that Jenny brings up. Let me try this. Is it better? Okay, sorry. Uh, I don't have a specific um, objection to withdrawing it. I, I'm really glad that Jenny brought this up because I think it's more of a sort of a policy issue for us to consider. Um, I do want to just point out that the, the, the focus of the article is one that is potentially very practical advice for, for the public um, regarding diet and, and its, its effect um, on on neurodivergent populations, but but if we have a policy of choosing articles to you know for for this briefing that are only going to be about autism, and I think we should state that policy and sort of keep that in mind when we are um, recommending them. If we don't have that policy, then I think you know that's a different question. I don't think we have expressed that policy explicitly in the past. So in past discussions, we have talked about trying to stick with autism just because if we started considering all different neurodevelopmental disabilities, it would potentially open it up to something very broad and would not be specific to autism. So we have had those discussions, maybe not in this iteration of the committee, but it's happened before. I might suggest, Jenny, that we go ahead and leave this one in with the recognition that uh, and the point that you've made that it is not specific to autism and includes in particular ADHD, as well as other developmental disabilities, which might make the conclusions less broad. And if you're considering voting for it, you might actually look and see whether there was evidence that the subset of individuals with, with this, the, the risk of autism was lowered by the diet uh, or not. And I, I'm guessing we probably can't make that conclusion from the paper, but I haven't read it myself to know. I, I did look at, I looked at the paper and they do parse out the results by autism and ADHD and other neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, so the, the details- A little, sorry, a little closer sorry, to- sorry, The details in the paper, they are stratified by specific neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, including autism. So the details are in the paper. They're not in this description or in the abstract, but it's in the paper, just in my glance and now. And do you recall whether the effect was uh, similar, stronger, weaker in the autism subgroup? Uh, let's see. I can scroll down and look and tell you. Okay. Um, it looks like the results were overall null, so no association. But null associations are still important. Okay. Um, and sorry. And sorry, I'm not sure who nominated this one, but if the group that nominated it would like to speak up, Hersa. Nothing to add, but I, I think in general, um, it's great this group's gotten more and more thoughtful about the articles that are 
being submitted and we're submitting more and more articles, which is, I think, making it harder probably to cull down to 20. And so if there are more common things that we should consider as we're nominating, that could be helpful going forward too. So whether it's the sample size, whether it's the specificity to autism, I think there's a range of things that um, as nominators could be helpful for us to consider. That's a good suggestion. We'll work on some of that. Um, I want to know if it's on this because otherwise I have Julie in front of you, but uh, Dina, is it on this one? With Julie. Okay, Julie, you're next, and then Dina. Um, in my comment is not on this one, so if Dina has a comment on this article per se, we can do that one first. No, they're new comments. Go ahead, Julie. Okay, so I uh, had a comment on number 33, the Hatfield study, um, which is super cool. It's like looking at sort of exercise gaming to increase physical health, but it is a very small sample study, preliminary study. It looks like the N is five. Um, so although I am really excited to see where this goes, I'm not sure that this one, this study is definitive enough to be on the list. Wanted to know what everybody else thought. So this is number 33, Hatfield, um, Gamer Fit ASD beta test. Any comments on that? Sorry, is your mic on? I can't quite hear you. I would have to say that it might be helpful for us to create a criteria of the information that we need in this document to review these, because the vast majority of us are either not researchers or we are at tiny, cheap universities that won't give us access to a meaningful library. And so I think I'd love to help you guys come up with, like, what is a sample size? We need to know what the breakdown was by gender, if we have it, by, you know, whatever those small criteria are. In this one, what's missing is the outcome. So that's probably in the article, but it's not here. And for those of us who don't have library access, that's a barrier. So, um, but that was my concern, uh, along with Julie's, about the sample size. You know, they didn't really put in this, at least here, what the outcome was. Was there improvement? It just said we did this. So, all right. Yeah, Dina, um, your concern is is spot on. the The outcome is not in the paper. They're merely saying that they adapted it to an age group. So, I, I agree with Julie's concern. I agree too. It was a feasibility study essentially. So, um, echoing Dean, I think we need to be very mindful when we are uh, nominating these articles, and and a list of criteria that we are made to stick to would be helpful to all of us. I think. Absolutely. In the past, we have emphasized the need to include sample size, but perhaps we haven't done that enough. Um, uh, would Hersa like to make a comment? No, it's, it's fine to withdraw. Okay, so I think we're going to withdraw Hatfield based on the small sample size and the fact that it is a feasibility study as opposed to reporting out a result. We don't have a rule against feasibility studies, just to let you know, but those two combinations, I agree with the, the consensus around the room that that one be reserved, withdrawn. Uh, Paul, is it on this one or no? So, Dean, I'm going to go to you, and then we'll go to Paul. Okay, Paul. Uh, a comment on 35 and a question on 36. Um, 35 is a report of a study comparing two different uh, intervention approaches, uh, discrete trial therapy and, and JASPER. I think it's uh, really unusual and but good to see direct comparisons of different therapeutic approaches, and it's something that's just extremely rare. The, these studies don't get proposed, they don't get done, and it's great to see this this published. Uh, as, as people can see in the abstract based on, I think, the primary outcomes, they didn't really see a difference between the two, which is a null result but interesting. Uh, but potentially one of, one of the therapies or the other was better for certain subpopulations. So I, I think this is actually a impo very important uh, study from the perspective of sort of the sociology of science, let alone the results. Um, and I just before you move on to your second one, I want to emphasize that, again, this is a topic which has come up in the past. I don't remember is this IACC or the previous incarnation, but the notion that we need to be able to compare across available treatments to know which ones work better or equivalently or et cetera. So thanks, Paul, for bringing that up. You had another one? My question about number 36 is whether it belongs in the next category, service and supports, rather than here. It, it does not report on uh, the, the benefits or lack of benefit of an intervention, but it really seems to be talking about who gets behavioral therapies. 
um, you know, like sort of like uh, the delivery of, of, of that particular kind of intervention. I think that's a good point. It can be easily moved. Any other comments or questions from this section? Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on. Quick one, sorry, Josh. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. 34 uh, um, is an example, in my opinion, of a study that has a modest sample size, but you really need to dig into the details and realize that this is a very unique subgroup with a really particular challenge. And so having 70 kids with 6,000 plus aggressive behaviors observed is, I just, when people think about these things, I don't want them to just think about them very simplistically about what the number of people are necessarily, because this is a really important study that can't be done in thousands of people. Um, yeah. So this is a study for those who uh, are just looking at this for now, where they studied individuals with uh, uh, extreme out, uh, aggressive behaviors and found that they were able to predict three minutes before the aggressive behavior was found based on biosensors those individuals wear when it would occur. And I think, that, you know, we can all decide for ourselves whether we think that's a major advance, but of course, studying individuals with aggressive behaviors is another priority that was identified. We had a whole panel on it in, 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 at the IACC, um, very compelling. I just want to add that, yes, 70, but again, this was a study that was, those 70 were basically pulled from multiple sites. So this was a study where they really tried, they really tried to get, and also people that would, there was, you know, one thing that doesn't pop out but should be addressed is that there was a percentage of people that started the study that weren't able to wear the sensor. That doesn't mean this is a bad study. It doesn't mean that it won't help anybody. And actually, I think this is one of the first to show that it was, in fact, effective rather than just being a preliminary, what can happen. Okay, thank you very much. We will move on to services and supports, which is on page 17 to 28, a lot of nominations here. And uh, it covers nominations number 37 to, huh, yeah, I don't see the split here. 23, sorry, to page 23, uh, 37, to 47. Dina, go ahead. I already apologize if I didn't read it thoroughly enough, but uh, item number 38, um, it's looking at the disruption, the pandemic disruption that people experienced in getting treatment and care. And um, my question is, um, they found that autistic children were more likely to have unmet needs. I guess my question is, did they compare that to non-disabled kids? I mean, didn't most of us defer medical care or dental care during COVID because of the risk factor? So as a standalone without that comparativeness, I'm, I'm not sure what we're gonna be able to get from it. Uh, would anyone from NIMH or SSA to respond? It's article 38. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my read of it is that uh, it says that they, uh, they compared two non-autistic children but it, it's in the NIMH description. I'm not sure it's in the SSA one, but I haven't. I haven't they, did, they did compare to non-autistic children from the article. Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, Alice. Thank you, Alice. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Sorry, Marenike? Uh, uh, no comments on this section, on the last section. Uh, Marina Kay, on, on Dina's point, said, uh, thank you for that point. Some of us are limited by paywalls at times. Okay. I'd just like to point out the PMID is a hyperlink there that goes straight to the abstract on PubMed, which is a public website. So you can at least get the abstract from there. But anytime you want the papers, when we send it out for voting, we actually do send you the papers themselves. But we can send it to you anytime you want. If you just write to the office, we have all of those but we don't want to flood your inbox with lots and lots of stuff. But um, the abstract is there. Next time, instead of putting PMID with a bunch of numbers, we're just going to write abstract here and make that the hyperlink to make it more obvious. But also, a lot of the papers that are funded by NIH have a PMC ID where you can get access to the paper for free. Okay. 
Okay, if there are no other comments, I just wanted to, uh, again, highlight one that is, uh, in my mind, responsive to the IACC input, and that's number 40, the Feinberg et al. paper. In fact, it came up today, <laughs> uh, the importance of family navigators. Uh, so family navigators are often uh, desired and often advocated for, um, and NIMH and other uh, of the NIH institutes are trying to develop the evidence base to support that. Uh, and this is one paper that attempts to do that with uh, a decent sample size of 339 families. Paul, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I just have to educate myself on this paper because I liked very much our 2021 summary advances winner from the same authors, and it seems like it's the same project. So I, I would just want to read very carefully what's new in this one. Thanks. If you could let us know, we can promulgate that too. Okay, then we'll move on to the next section, uh, which is on lifespan, and it goes from page 23 to 32, uh, and articles number 48 to 48 to 69. Any comments, questions, or points on any of those articles on lifespan? It's wonderful to see so many of them. Go ahead. Um, well, it may seem a little self-serving. I want to give a shout out to our colleagues, Hughes and all um, at CDC, as Adam Mayner, or, uh, Matt Mayner said, Today, um, sorry, which number is it? Sorry, 53, mm -hmm. 53, which um, this year has really been our, our first, uh, the first time we've been able to look forward in the Adam network at youth and young adults. And this one specifically looks at education transition planning uh, for youth and young adults using the Adam network. So we think it's a really helpful contribution. Thank you. Scott? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, question and a, and a couple comments about um, ones that I nominated. Um, where's the boundary also between supports and services and lifespan? Because I, I put mine for employment into the lifespan. I wasn't sure in terms of sometimes where the dividing um, lines are, are on that. Um, and I also just wanted to uh, just highlight a couple of the ones that I um, nominated. One was on one of my five was on um, masking, which I think has come up a lot recently in terms of uh, committees focuses and discussions on things related to socialization and communication and, and other aspects of life uh, experiences. And this was quite groundbreaking in terms of looking at masking in the employment context. It's the only study that's, ever done that and has a pretty significant um, sample size and looked at masking not Scott, only for the person. Tell us what, what number you're talking about? Oh, I'm sorry. That's number 60, I believe it's 61. Um, it's the article by, I'm bad with names, but Greek, uh, what is it? Preek. Uh, Preek Hobbs. Uh, Preek Hobbs. Um, the Workplace Masking Experiences of Autistic, uh, Non-Autistic, Neurodivergent, and Neurotypical Adults in the UK. Um, and the, the sample size was 472 folks, so it's pretty significant, um, including of that group, 285 autistic people, and the rest were other neurodivergent folks and, and non-autistic people. And that was very eye-opening from the qualitative research perspective in that study. And the findings are really helpful in terms of us learning about barriers uh, that stem from masking and how it impacts folks' mental and physical health and well-being. And the other article that I wanted to uh, highlight, too, was the um, unrelated kind of social kind of aspect of things, the number 66 on uh, Setsy, I think, S-C-E-C-H-Y. I don't know is how you pronounce it. Is that Setsy? Um, that talks about the double empathy problem and uh, perceptions in the workplace. And... This was especially meaningful, not only because that there's a growing literature on the double empathy problem in terms of that communication and social issues stem not just from autistic people's difficulties, but 
differences in perception and processing among autistic people and non-autistic people, and that uh, that creates a lot of the barriers uh, experience. But the the fact also that it highlighted how um, autistic people are often better sometimes at reading into certain situations and the the storyline, the vignette that they had, that's actually the result that was found in the study that autistic people actually understood the perspective better um, of the uh, autistic person um, in the in the workplace than non-autistic people. Um, and that shows it in terms of differences, in terms of perception, empathy, in terms of processing um, that situation uh, comparatively. And it's good uh, evidence base for uh, advancing that double empathy problem in regard to the workplace and just overall. Thanks, Scott. And in answer to your first question, these are these categories are meant to, to um, be applied to our the categories in our uh, strategic plan. Yes. Process. So it yeah. uh, for autism research and services. So uh, you know, I think this one, for example, the empathy one is you know one that is uh, particular in in this case to adults with autism. Although there may be similar effects in in children, so I think it's appropriate for the lifespan. But that's what I would look if you are trying to figure out which nominate which area to nominate in. Does it apply to issues raised in uh, which chapter, if you will, of our strategic plan? Um, Julie. Hi again, everybody. I have uh, two papers that I just wanted to say a really quick word about. Uh, the first is number 52, the Hong paper. And in full disclosure, I was uh, involved in this paper, although sort of as, as a minor role. But I think it's really important that I just want to sort of make clear. So this is looking at sort of development and change over time among adolescents and adults using data collected over 22 years, a longitudinal study of 22 years, um, the youngest people were 10 at the start of the study, and the oldest people were 69 at the end of the study. So we used an accelerated longitudinal design to characterize trajectories over, what is that, 40, 50 years of the lives of um, autistic adults in the sample. And what we found is that um, there are some um, worsening of some developmental trajectories across some areas when we get into midlife and, and early old age. Um, so most of what we know about um, development in autistic adults is um, from early adults and early adulthood. And so starting to understand how things may change when people move into older adulthood and what the needs of older adults who are autistic may, 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 may what needs they may have, I think, is something that we don't know much about that this starts to tell us a little bit. So I just wanted to mention that. And then 68 is a study that I nominated, but I was not involved in. Um, and this is looking at employment outcomes for um, autistic college graduates. And the reason why I thought this was important is because I hear people throwing around statistics all the time about the rates of employment for autistic college graduates. And I don't know of a single study before this one that actually has looked at that in a rigorous way. In fact, when I tried to trace it back recently, I traced it back to a blog post that somebody had that now people are kind of citing oftentimes the same 80 percent of autistic college graduates are unemployed. Um, so this study actually has some pretty rigorous data, population-based data on the employment rate of autistic college graduates. It finds that unemployment is high. Um, it's not 80%, um, but I think it starts to give us a feel for what this transition from college into employment looks like for this group and where the needs might be. Um, and maybe there's another study that's looked at this, but I haven't come across it, so I thought it was important. Thank you, Julie. Jenny. May I make a suggestion when organizing the papers for us to decide on? Can we organize it by um, maybe age group, starting with adolescents, then transitions, and then adults, and then maybe the like the study that Julie mentioned, where it includes the entire lifespan almost? Um, because that will really help with deciding, you know, selecting the twenty articles to be included. Thank you. Thanks. That's a good suggestion. Dina. I, I want to go back to Julie's study uh, that she was just talking about, 52, um, about the, the changes over the lifespan. And, and I just want to say from a policy standpoint, from a policy standpoint, we really need to hold on to this kind of an article because it reflects that while a person in early adulthood may have had some cognitive capacity leaning toward more self-sufficiency, 
that can be held against them in seeking community-based interventions later on when we hit that deep uh, well in the bottom. Uh, I'm not one of those people hitting that deep well. I'm 65 and just finished my PhD. But, um, but I, I've had reporting from a lot of autistic adults who find that, that between burnout and then this constant onslaught of demand for self-sufficiency and independent living skills, they really, really struggle to sustain that. So I think from a policy standpoint, we need to figure out how can we increase services or provide services to people who may not previously have needed them. I think this research article will support us asking for better and enhanced outcomes there. Thank you. Marenica? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Marenica says they wholeheartedly agree with Jenny's remark. Uh, additionally, what Dina stated is very true of many individuals in the community. Thank you. One more quickie. On uh, 56, the article about self-harm, I, I just want to really point out the inordinate rates of self-harm around autistic females in this study. I don't think it's rare. I think it's the rule rather than the exception. And I think delineating this kind of self-harm separate from self-injurious behavior is probably not helpful. Um, if you're hurting yourself, you're hurting yourself. Um, and those categories of separating and delineating it out don't seem to be particularly helpful. But I appreciate this. I want to champion this article because I think that number is really life-altering. 86% is inordinate. Sorry, it's just so you know, it's 83% increased likelihood, not an 83% overall likelihood. That's still tremendous. It's nearly a doubling, and it is a doubling of suicide deaths for, for females. So these are big numbers. Um, Paul. Just looking for guidance from you again, uh, Dr. Gordon and, and Dr. Daniels. A, a number of these studies are from outside of the United States. Uh, Sweden, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia. Do we need to take that into account as at all as we think about this? Or, or, or no, we can simply ignore that fact. So in terms of our charge from Congress, it's really to identify scientific advances. So it doesn't say only from the United States or funded by U.S. funders. So I believe that you can nominate anything that you think is a really important advance you think Congress and the public need to know about. In addition to that, we have to recognize the difference in the educational systems internationally, Folk rehab doesn't exist in most many of these countries. Um, not going to college is very common, for example, in the UK among the regular population as compared to the US where it's almost expected. So as we weigh international studies to include, I think we need to weigh all those extra factors. Yeah, I, I, and if I could just generalize from those particulars to the, to the what, what we would not want to do is vote for or put forth applications that we don't think are generally applicable, whether we're talking about that generality being on a global scale or in the United States. Alicia. Uh, I want to put in a plug for number 52 and for a different reason, though, because if we want to kind of like promote to the higher ups, so to speak, the type of research that we need to do, and this isn't the short, it isn't the short game, this is the long game. This is longitudinal studies. This is tracking individuals over time for an extended period of time, which is hard to do. It's expensive, but it's incredibly valuable. And it's not that it's not, you know, it, it's not that other studies shouldn't be done. It's that this is the sort of study that we need to continue to invest in um, the longitudinal design. So for that reason, I would I check. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on. Scott. I, I, we're a little bit worried about time, so please keep your marks brief. But go ahead, Scott. Yeah, just very briefly, I just wanted to note that the um, I suggest that we keep the focus allowing for international research because um, I think if we had to restrict only the American, like U.S. funded uh, research, then it would really hinder a lot. For instance, on the lifespan area, a lot of the research on um, employment, community living focuses does come out of the UK and Australia and other countries. And uh, we have a gap sometimes in some, some of that research here in the US. So I think it would really hinder us a lot if we weren't able to have those studies uh, from Thank outside you, the US. Thanks. Thank you. Aisha. 
green did it turn red there we go okay so i also wanted to point out that a lot of studies outside the united states are still funded by nih my studies are in denmark they're funded by nih so i don't think that we should discount studies just because they're outside of the united states also i want to put in a plug for the biological studies this year because last year y'all just kind of tossed those out and they're important to me so if y'all would just consider the biological studies this year i would really appreciate it thank you Thank you, Aisha. All right, uh, we are on to the last section, which is the infrastructure and prevalence, uh, pages 32 through the end, uh, numbers 70 through number 76. Any comments, uh, points uh, to bring up in the, that collection? Dina. I wanna talk about article number 72, um, and I just wanna point out one specific point um, I'm sorry, there's no paragraphs for me to help refer, but it says the largest increase in, in Medicaid uptake uh, over the nine years they studied was in the 25 to 34 year old range. And um, I think that's significant because that's the age as somebody who helps people get on social security disability, that's when parents say this isn't working. We tried college, didn't work. We tried employment, it hasn't worked. And that's the age around 25 is the point where a lot of people have to defer to systems. And so I think that that's a significant statistical piece of evidence there for us to weigh in regard to policy and accessibility. Thank you. I, oops, you know, I, I wanna point out one thing, you know, this is the increase in the prevalence of autism amongst Medicaid enrolled adults. So I, I think it, I don't wanna be too Pollyanna-ish, but it does suggest that whatever we're doing is working if more of them are getting into Medicaid. It may not be working enough, but it's working. And particularly, perhaps, although I don't see a state-by-state -state analysis here, we have other research that NIMH has done that showed where Medicaid has been expanded in those states, we see better uh, accessibility of mental health care. And I don't know if those sub-analyses are in this paper, but that's something to think about. Jay Lynn. Thank you. Uh, number 70. Uh, is rather important, I think, at least these steps, because it goes into what you're talking about, longitudinal studies, because the terminology of profound autism right now is becoming much in the, in, in the conversation, but we don't, don't have any idea about what happens with children, and for a lack of a better term, do people mature or grow out of particular types of behaviors and is that because of physical or emotional or brain brain functions? We don't know. And it's hard to treat something and to provide resources unless we understand more about it. So I think things like this and then going into longitudinal areas so we can understand what the implications are for the individual through lifespan. Thank you. Thank you. Marana Kay, did you have another comment? I see a hand up. Uh, Marana Kay uh, thanked Aisha Dickerson for their insights. Uh, also concurred with uh, Dina's past comment about self-injury. Um, and they also clarified the, their name. It's Marana Kay. Thank you, Marana Kay. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you very, very much for your considered discussion of these nominations. And as Susan mentioned, our next task will be to vote on them. So please, if you've been taking notes or listening carefully, jot things down now so you can take these comments into consideration. I know I've been doing it. Uh, and uh, when you do file your votes in the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna turn it back over to Susan to close out the committee business section and tell us about lunch. Thank you so much for a great discussion on the nominations. And we were carefully listening to feedback. We will do our best to try to incorporate feedback where it's possible and of course, to try to make things as accessible as they can be. So next we have lunch, which is everyone's favorite session. Um, we have the Pike and Rose across the street where there are restaurants for those who don't have a lunch. There are some people who ordered your lunch and that's being delivered here. So if you're waiting for that, um, you can probably go up to one of the staff or out to the front and they will be able to help you with that. And I've been told we're allowed to eat in here. We're also allowed to eat in some of the rooms in this corridor, if you would like to use that. Anything else that I need to mention? 
Well, I would just say that at 1.45, please be back promptly because we have uh, three oral comments as well as a review of the written comments, and we want to leave plenty of time for discussion of those comments. Uh, and I uh, look forward to seeing you back here at 1.45. Thank you, everybody. 1.45. If people can come take their seats, we would appreciate it to make sure we have a full time for oral comments. Again, if people could please uh, take their seats. All right, so we are now going to proceed into our oral public our public comment session we will have three oral commenters uh, as well as a summary of the written comments and committee discussions i want to welcome our oral commenters i think we're going to have them come up to the podium or they're all virtual they're all online okay um we're going to ask each of you to uh to make your comments and please hold your comments to three minutes to make sure that each of our commenters have uh, time to speak, and then we hear our written comments and we have time for the IACC to discuss. Again, uh, the, the, the three commenters we have are Nicole Corrado, Anthony Tucci, and Jordan Jensen, and I hope I'm pronouncing those correctly. And we're gonna start with uh, Ms. Corrado. Hi. Hello, go right ahead. Hi, I'm Nicole Corrado and I am based in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I am autistic and have personal lift experience with elopement behavior and the missing person system. I was so frustrated with the system when I lived back in Toronto that I joined the Toronto Police Services Missing and Missed Implementation Team as a civilian advisor and I am now working on a study regarding elopement behavior with the University of Waterloo. I hope to keep in touch with the IACC on information regarding autism, justice, and major case management situations like missing person cases. Most research on autism and missing persons regards hyperactive children wandering off and does not interview autistic persons on their perspectives. As a result, data is little to non-existent regarding missing persons and the neurodiversity. I am researching this very subject and would like to keep in touch with you on this data. My main frustration with how my missing persons file and bulletin were handled in 2016 was in regards to mental age theory. Mental age theory must be avoided at all costs and it can be replaced with more respectful terms like support needs and Ivanova Smith has a great YouTube video on that very subject. It is essential that a person's privacy be respected when reporting a missing person. No one wants to have their entire personal profile Googled after 10 or 20 years associated with the worst day of their life. Toronto has a first names, no gender model, which is very useful for people who only have first names, like some indigenous people only have first names by their own cultural choice. The first name, no gender model started after missing transgender persons were being misidentified as the wrong gender. I am happy that Toronto is moving forward on this. And I said before, the far too many police programs talk agencies, but not autistic people. Please contact autistic persons whenever possible when developing police and public safety policies. And people go missing for many, many reasons. Some people go missing because of abuse at home. And one of the things I should point out is that women's shelters must be made sensory friendly and allow animals. Many women do not want to leave an abusive situation because they're concerned about their animals' safety. So there's a project in Chad and Kent called Purple Leash Project that's in, in Canada. And, but they have similar things in the United States. And I'll also mention that Many parts of Canada and the United States have vulnerable persons registries. There are different views on such registries. I choose to be on them, but some people don't want to be. 
Not being on a registry should not cause a missing person to be deprioritized. Vulnerable person registries must be fully voluntary whenever possible, free, have easy self-registration for people with a lot of autonomy and be separate from incident report software. So they need to be written in plain language. And uh, Corrado, can I ask you to wrap up your comments? Thank you so much. But can thank I ask you. you to wrap up? Yes, uh, I, I would love to discuss more with you guys on this topic. Thank you. And we very much appreciate your input. You're welcome. Next, I will ask Anthony Tucci to unmute. Thank you very much. Please well, thank go you ahead for the proceed. opportunity to present oral comments today. I'm the parent of a 20 year old son who has autism and is a non speaker. My comments today will focus on the appropriate interplay between communication science advocacy and the advocacy for the protection of communication rights. This topic has become highly relevant due to the fact that disagreements among some members of the scientific community have given rise to an unbounded form of scientific advocacy that attacks individuals with autism who use communication methods that advocates claim to lack scientific validation. To protect the human and civil rights of individuals, speech and language professionals are compelled to master how science can properly enlighten the field of autism without compromising communication rights. In exploring this challenge, I will begin by highlighting the essential role that scientific research plays in helping to promote and advance effective communication interventions. Communication is a fundamental feature of humanity. Scientific research continues to develop effective approaches and technologies to help individuals with severe communication challenges. However, research process is slow. Many research gaps continue to exist. To meaningfully address these shortcomings, the communication science industry should collaborate and engage in cross-disciplinary research with a broad array of medical disciplines to, re to replace research gaps with genuine wisdom that will stem from this required integrative approach. The recent NIDCD conference that focused on exploring research directions for the promotion of speech and language represents a great step in this direction. Next, I wanna showcase how unbounded scientific advocacy has compromised and impaired the human and civil rights of individuals with autism. Conventional wisdom allows us to reasonably conclude that the application of science and the great potential for scientific progress will lead to improvements of the human condition. However, unbounded scientific advocacy limits communication rights, deprives individuals of their dignity and autonomy, and represents a form of science and its greatest discontents. A select group of so-called scientific advocates blazingly interfere in the lives of certain minimally verbal and non-speakers that have merely selected a prefer preferred mode of communication that opponents do not support, such as spelling to communicate, and claim that these methods do not qualify to be protected as human rights because one, they lack sufficient validation, and two, are prompt dependent and will not result in independent communication. However, these requirements are not supported by the Human Rights Convention, are discriminatory, and violate the American with Dis Disabilities Act. Simply stated, the scientific community is not the appropriate gatekeeper of human and civil rights. They do not possess the knowledge or the legal authority to define or redefine the parameters that individuals with autism must satisfy to be permitted to exercise their communication rights. A world leading expert on disability law and policy has opined that every provision under the UN Convention on the rights of person with disability, quote, is aimed at expanding person with disabilities available options, not circumscribing them, and at demanding respect for their choices, not overriding them. In the same spirit, the Thank ADA you. serves to ensure that disabled individuals enjoy an effective mode of communication that is equal to that enjoyed by non-disabled individuals, and specifically requires that primary consideration be given to a disabled individual's 
communication, communication choices and preferences. I, I offer the following recommendation. Thank you. If you could just quickly, excuse the community me. Community uh, work together. Yeah, Mr. Tucci, if you could wrap up, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will. Um, uh, the formation of workshops and committees to foster legal and scientific communities to work together. I proposed a, a, a additional regulatory guidance by the Justice Department that would compel the scientific community, including speech and language professionals, to properly and fully disclose all communication rights. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak, and I appreciate all your advocacy on, on behalf of individuals with autism. Thank you very much for your comments. Finally, I'll ask Jordan Jensen to unmute and to present your comments. Um, all right. Um, hi, my name is Jordan Jensen. Um, I'm the executive director of the Center for Racial and Disability Justice at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. Um, our center is entirely disability-led. Um, so in response to the IACC's um, 2021 to 2023 strategic plan and the scope of this meeting, we submitted a public comment letter regarding interactions of autistic individuals with law enforcement. Um, we'd like to share evidence-based research to inform a responsible and equitable approach to addressing the committee's priorities at the intersection of race and disability moving forward. Disabled people, especially autistic people, face high rates of victimization, which increases the likelihood that they will interact with law enforcement and the criminal justice system. In interactions with law enforcement, autistic people may demonstrate non-normative behaviors, which can be interpreted as resistance or non-compliance. This can cause police to perceive the situation as threatening or dangerous, leading to the use of excessive force. In quoting our founding faculty director, um, Jamelia Morgan, um, and particularly her paper on disabilities Fourth Amendment. Disability-related behaviors create pathways to excessive force by police. This is true when, for instance, disability is coded as threatening and potentially dangerous, not because of any actual threat or danger, but rather because officers interpret disabled people as exhibiting behaviors that do not align with dominant social norms. It's crucial to recognize racial disparities in policing. Um, Black Americans are five times as likely to report being unfairly stopped by police than white people, and police disproportionately threaten or use force against communities of color. Um, it's also important to take into consideration the social and historical context within which this discussion is taking place. Police have a long and complicated history when it comes to interactions based on race and disability respectively, and especially where they intersect. Throughout history, police have been used as a form of race-based social control, and we see this element of social control exhibited today. Um, concerns regarding autistic tendencies, such as wandering and elopement, are responded to with policing and surveillance. Yet inadequate consideration is made to the relational power dynamics inherent in these interactions. Um, so going back to interactions between police and disabled people, 50% of people killed by police officers are disabled. And when people of color, autistic people, and those at the intersection are killed at the hands of police, jurisdictions tend to respond by pushing for more police training. Um, similarly, in conversations around autism and safety, autism-specific training for law enforcement is seen as the key solution. But despite police departments increasing disability and unconscious bias trainings, autistic people, especially autistic people of color, continue to be met by police with force, coercion, and even death. So we need to shift away from advocating for more police training and toward investing in communities and amplifying the voices of autistic people of color. Um, additionally, law enforcement training can actually serve to reinforce stereotypes and inadvertently heighten biases. Um, encounters with police can be traumatizing for anyone, but autistic people in particular, especially autistic people of color. So instead of relying on and encouraging more police training, we urge the IACC to prioritize the perspectives and voices of disabled people of color and involve them more in these meetings and discussions. Um, for any conversation happening about autistic people, they should be recognized as the experts on issues that are directly impacting them. 
We also recognize that concerns for autistic people's safety are real and important, but believe that other solutions should be prioritized given the extension of extensive literature and conversations around police training causing more harm than good. It Thank is essential you. to recognize Ms. Johnson, that can I, can I ask you to wrap up, please? Thank you. Um, it is essential to recognize the history of these systems and instead invest resources into communities and organizations led by disabled people of color. We recommend reading our whole letter, which is um, was submitted. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Jensen, and to all three of our oral commenters. And I'm going to turn it over to Susan for a presentation of the written comments, which you each have received uh, in the file sent in advance and uh, to you. Yes, and I'm going to have Dr. Oni Celestin from ONAC uh, share the written public comments with you. Good afternoon, everyone. We received 13 written public comments for this meeting on the following topics. We received three comments on justice and law enforcement, two comments on research services and supports for adults with autism, two comments on research and service needs, resources and policy implications, two comments on addressing the needs of autistic individuals with high support needs, one comment on mental health research, services, and treatment. One comment on concerns about medical practices. One comment about increasing autism accept acceptance and reducing stigma. And one comment on the needs of the direct support professional workforce. And again, all the comments can be found on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, in the materials section, you can find the full text of the comments for anyone who wants to look at them. Okay, we're now going to open it up to the committee to discuss the uh, comments made. You may discuss any of the written or oral comments. Um, and um, please uh, raise your hand or, yes, go ahead, Yetta. Okay, it's on now. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who has provided both oral and written comments. Want to highlight um, for the group Rose Bauman's comment, the written comment, um, where they expressed that our family has needed to call 911 more than once for help in keeping everyone and everything in the home safe during an aggressive episode. Unfortunately, law enforcement is often ill equipped to handle individual disabilities, ca causing them to be dysregulated. Um, so I just want to highlight that comment because this is something that is being talked about um, in the community, in my local community, in the community at large. Um, and so I really just want to say that it's going to take everyone working together. And I'm really excited about the presentation later. Um, Lori Reyes, I, I know about your work in Montgomery County, so I'm really excited to hear what you have to say specifically. But yeah, it, it it's going to take all of us to work together um, to get this together, right? Because we can't have folks dying um, because they have behaviors and it, it, it just, it sickens me, right? And so, um, yeah, I'm just really excited that we're having this conversation today. Thanks. Thank you, Yetta. Tina. I just wanted to bring up or emphasize Nicole LeBlanc's uh, crisp, explicit comment we need support for HCBS adults who do not have nursing level of care. Um, autism is a dynamic condition. The Sorry, support... Dina, can I just ask you to spell out that acronym? Um, home and community-based services. Thank you. Um, yay. Uh, um, uh, again, uh, autism is a dynamic condition, and the needs for support services ebb and flow. Um, uh, uh, I have a colleague who recently relocated for the dream job of her lifetime and the process of simply relocating and unpacking and trying to move some of those services to a new state is on the edge of costing her her job. And so the, we need to switch our ideas about nursing level of care to episodic and intermittent needs. I think from a policy standpoint, we're going to be getting many, many people off the rolls of unemployment and out of social services if we can switch to the idea of episodic support. Um, 
you know, I'm about to relocate. I'm going to hire people to do that. It's going to put me in debt to do that. And I'm living on $900 a month, right? We, we can't continue to keep people out of the workplace and out of opportunities because we just assume that their needs are constant. Thank you. Other comments, people online, uh, people on the Zoom can raise your hands and I can see you. Go ahead, Alicia. I'll let someone on the Zoom jump in first. All right, Sam, but I've got you next. Okay. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, the commenter who was discussing communication supports, because this is something that I have seen in practice. Um, and it really can cause um, issues on an individual level. Uh, so I, <clears throat> there are um, researchers who, without you know, evaluating or interacting with individual people who use typing to communicate, um, engage in sort of public denunciations and like harassment of individual people who use typing to communicate. Um, I think that's really inappropriate. And I think that it, um, it blurs the distinction between what I would say is sort of the research focus, which is, you know, replicability, um, can, you know, ensuring that we see things happening at scale, um, predictable, you know, getting, getting, <clears throat> um, understanding things at a population level <clears throat> versus individuals who I think are, are more, um, when, when you want to look at whether an individual has um, valid form of communication where in fact they are communicating, the questions end up being different. And I think it would be really useful for um, in the communication sphere, um, getting a coalition of, of researchers and stakeholders together to, um, to determine best practices for addressing whether an individual is communicating in a um, in a way that is authentic. Um, I've seen people communicating in ways that are completely idiosyncratic and special only to them. And so if we had um, a, a norm where, you know, we're only recognizing communication that looks exactly like a form of communication that's in a peer reviewed study, um, we are going to have negative outcomes and we're going to be ignoring communication from individuals who are communicating. So, um, you know, getting a, a more nuanced um, uh, look into, into individual communication and developing guidelines for determining um, whether an individual is showing authentic communication would be a really important um, topic, I think. Thank you, Sam. I like the way you put that. I think there is a challenge here, and it's a challenge which affects even the work that we do at the IACC. The challenge is that we want to advocate for investments in services for individuals with autism that work for them, for their families, for their communities. Yet we recognize, of course, that there's not unlimited resources to provide those services. In fact, we need lots more resources even for the services that we know absolutely work for everybody or at least a lot of people. And so there is, if you will, a competition, a, a de facto competition, unfortunately, for scarce resources in this area. And I think what you therefore rely on is some evidence that things work in order for the public to invest in those services. At the same time, Sam, you're 100% correct in that, and this is, this is something that's faced across medicine for individualized precision medicine, is we need ways to understand whether things that work for a small group of individuals can actually work for that small group of individuals and can even more importantly, as you pointed out, be tailored to specific 
uh, things for specific individuals. And I think this is a tension that we face. It may be something we need to come back to as an IECC, although I also appreciate the recognition that uh, institutions like NIDCD, the National Institute for Deafness and Communicative Disorders, which is very interested in communicative assistance devices for individuals with autism and funds research in that area. I think it, it, for them to, to hold meetings like, like the one that was lauded um, are, are steps in that right direction. So I really appreciate that comment, Sam. Um, I want to, uh, I, yes, Alicia, I want to go back to you. Sorry, so for, is Mr. Tucci still on the line? I don't or was know that a pre-recorded message? Oh, well, the, his comment and then also his statement referred to something called scientific advocacy. So I wanted to get maybe a clear sense of what he was talking about. In the spirit of open communication, I wanted to get kind of more of a clear definition. What does he mean by scientific advocacy and what, why is, it, he, he, there seems to be something I'm missing. Mr. Tucci, can you unmute and, and respond? No, he's not on anymore. Let me make an if, attempt, or unless someone else around the table would like to sort of suggest what, what, what might be meant by that term. If or he's not answer. still on the line, I, I'm pretty sure I know what he's talking about. Go ahead, Sam. Um, yeah, there's, there's, you know, it's, it's a specific, um, I don't want to, um, I, I, I don't want to, you know, call anyone out, um, but there are specific people um, who, you know, do research in this field, who, um, who, who also sort of in, then go into policy advocacy. So um, not, and I, I really appreciated the way that Dr. Gordon was um, phrasing the distinction between, you know, deciding what we want to invest in with limited dollars um, to support supports versus making, you know, let's say clinical or rights decisions about an individual person who's found something that works for them. And um, I have definitely seen individual researchers who go beyond advocacy around what needs to be supported and into like specifically, um, you know, if a person was trying to um, gain a reasonable accommodation at school or at work or even in a court case, um, they will insert themselves into that controversy and advocate against access to that form of communication based on their understanding of whether the form of communication is research-based. Um, and I, I do have concerns about that. So I don't want to belabor this conversation, but I would argue that the term scientific advocacy is inappropriate. So we have scientific evidence and then, but, and, and, ev and evidence that's used for advocacy, but I'm, I'm a little confused about the term scientific advocacy. So I just want to put that on the record. Thank you very much, Alicia. Scott, you have your hand up. Yeah, no. Oh, sorry, M Mr. T Mr. Tucci, did you want a, a, a yeah, to sure. make it brief, my, my very pleasure. brief, please? Yes, yes, it'd be my pleasure. Yeah, basically the term scientific advocacy that I'm referring to is a concept that individuals who are um, taking the position that they are uh, adhering to the scientific model, the evidence-based practice model, that they're going to say that we're promoting um, interventions that meet the best evidence rule. And my, my position is that individuals that are going to um, advance that claim are going to ultimately go beyond the scope of just being limited to, well, you have, um, you have a technique that we believe doesn't meet our interpretation of best evidence. And as a result of that, we're going one step further in saying that if you don't meet what we consider to be best, uh, best evidence, um, you don't qualify for certain communication rights. So what, 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 what I'm suggesting is that these individuals that are uh, with their scientific hat are basically failing to see 
the, the distinction between, well, what does it mean if our argument is there's no scientific support for this intervention, whereby the individuals that are using, for example, in this case, a method of communication that has worked for them. Um, and they have, there's disagreements amongst uh, uh, experts. Some experts say there is science supporting this intervention. Other experts say that there aren't any. Then it becomes Thank you, a Mr. question. Tucci. Well, I we have a lot of public you. comments, so I'm not going to belabor this. Thank but you very much. Appreciate it. To use that we can come up with a different term than scientific advocacy. Thank you very okay. much. Really okay. appreciate Thank the you. input and the discussion. Um, one last uh, comment, uh, and then we should move on. I'm done, Dan. Uh, is Scott Robertson? Yeah. Um, Thanks, Dr. Gordon. Um, I just wanted to comment on the, um, the last of the written comments in the, um, the Nicole's comment, um, public written comment on the, the needs of the direct support uh, professional workforce, um, how it highlighted a program in Canada to um, employ neurodivergent people, including autistic people as patients in medical simulations to help educate medical students. Um, I wondered if NIH and some of your sister agencies could maybe help with supporting practices like this for medical schools here in the U.S., given that a lot of medical students don't receive a lot of education about uh, neurodivergent people, including autistic people. This has come up previously at prior ISCC meetings, so I'm glad this was highlighted in the, in the comment. Thank you, Scott. All right, we're going to now move into the main event for the afternoon. Uh, which is the uh, Justice and Law Enforcement Presentations and Panel Discussion. Um, this afternoon's uh, uh, topic is one that has come up oh, innumerable times in this body, as well as in many other discussions that we've had, and we meaning collectively all of us, uh, in the autism community. Uh, we've in the past held discussions that have been focused, for example, on wandering, and that has um, also brought in the role of law enforcement in ensuring the safety of individuals on the autism spectrum in those specific situations. But today, we're going to have the opportunity to hear about a broader range of justice-related issues, including the interactions of autistic individuals with law enforcement and the judicial system and programs that are merging in this space to develop best practices that will increase safety and protect the rights of people with autism and other intellectual and developmental disabilities. Today's presentations will highlight the important work that governments and other organizations are doing to address some of these issues and raise, I'm sure, many interesting areas for discussion. We have two separate parts to this afternoon's, uh, uh, to this afternoon's events. First, we're going to hear a series of presentations on current programs to address justice and law enforcement issues for individuals on the spectrum. Then we're going to hear a panel that includes several people sharing their lived and professional experiences in this area. I'm going to go ahead first now and introduce our first speaker, Mr. Steve Gordon, an assistant U.S. attorney and civil rights enforcement coordinator for the U.S. Department of Justice, who will present a brief overview and discuss his work in the Department of Justice. Steve? Thank you, Dr. Gordon. I appreciate that. There you are. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, start off here. A little introduction. Um, are folks able to hear me okay? Is, is this better? Okay, perfect. So as we've already heard from uh, some of the folks here, individuals with autism, like any other person in society, are likely to encounter law enforcement officers at some point. Sometimes it's as a crime victim, a suspect, or a witness. And unfortunately, because of the lack of understanding of autism in the law enforcement community, sometimes these interactions end badly. And without proper training, Criminal justice personnel may misinterpret the conduct of individuals with autism as intentional disrespect or disobedience, which may escalate encounters and lead to unnecessary criminal justice involvement. 
An important tool for addressing lack of knowledge is providing law enforcement with training to increase cultural competency and cultural humility for people with autism. And this afternoon, you will hear from people who have worked with law enforcement agencies to increase cultural competency and cultural humility for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, including autism. So my presentation on the Americans with Disabilities Act is an appetizer. It's hard to do justice to one of the most important civil rights statutes in the amount of time that I have and would probably take a full day, if not a full semester, to cover how the Americans with Disabilities Act intersects with law enforcement. So the Americans with Disabilities Act is a civil rights statute that prohibits discrimination based on disability. It affords similar protections against discrimination to people with disabilities as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibited discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. Really important resource for everyone is ADA.gov. It's the Department of Justice's website, and it is a huge resource of information. You can find the statutory language, regulations, technical assistance, and settlement agreements, as well as briefs and complaints that the department has filed. Many people are familiar with the archive version. I myself enjoy using that version um, over the new version. Um, and you can find that at archive.ada.gov. There are two technical assistance publications that are really important. And when you see the blue hypertext link, when you get this presentation later, you can click on that and it'll go right to the DOJ technical assistance publication. One is commonly asked questions about the ADA and law enforcement, and the other is examples and resources to support criminal justice entities in compliance with Title II of the ADA. So the ADA covers all state and local entities, including those in the criminal justice system. We're going to talk a lot about law enforcement agencies today, but it also covers courts, jails, community corrections, public defender services, prosecutors, state and local service agencies, social service agencies that um, assist um, the criminal justice system. In Virginia, we call those community service boards. And everything that law enforcement or entities in the criminal justice system engage in is covered by the ADA. It includes the operation of 911 and now 988 emergency centers, law enforcement on the street interactions, including in taking responding to complaints, interviews and questioning witnesses, victims or suspects, assessing individuals for diversion programs, arresting, booking, holding suspects, and setting conditions for probation or parole, providing emergency medical services, and enforcing the law. So all aspects of the criminal justice system are covered. So what are examples of what the ADA requires? Okay, so if a law enforcement agency fails to make reasonable modifications in policies, practices, or procedures, when necessary to avoid disability discrimination, that is a possible violation of the ADA. Failing to conduct individualized assessments to determine how to ensure equal access. Failing to communicate in a way that an individual with a disability can understand. Effective communication is a core principle of the ADA. Screening out people with disabilities from programs. So a correctional facility that says you have autism, you can't participate in um, a early release program, that's a potential violation. Really important under the ADA, one size solutions do not fit all. And as you can see from this illustration, not everyone is gonna fit on the same size bicycle. So it's really important that we aim not for equality, the same size bicycle, but equity. And this is a core principle under the ADA. As you can see in the first panel, we have equality. No curb cut, no audio for what the traffic signals are announcing. And that is not equity. And if you look at the second panel, you will see equity. 
Okay, equity gets, uh, everyone gets what they need, understanding the barriers, circumstances, and conditions. And it's the same thing when we're talking about autism or other intellectual and developmental disabilities. You have to aim for equity, not just equality. And the ADA prohibits discrimination, not just based on affirmative animus, but also based on thoughtlessness, apathy, and stereotypes about people with disabilities. So examples of failure to modify policies, practices, or procedures, really important. Failing to deploy alternate responses for behavioral health calls and failing to coordinate with community mental health agencies. And if you look at the Department of Justice's letter of finding in the investigation of Louisville, Kentucky, which involved Brianna Taylor, you will see there's a nine page discussion of the Americans with Disabilities Act um, and the whole issue of failing uh, to modify their practices. Denying a request for a support person to assist an individual with intellectual or developmental disabilities during an interrogation. Very important. We know that people with autism are more likely just to be very agreeable. And that can get them into a lot of trouble, including false confessions. A prison GED program that fails to modify the curriculum for people with intellectual disabilities. Very important in corrections. Everything needs to be modified to ensure that people with disabilities get equity. So in the Department of Justice's letter of finding, it explained that the Louisville Metro um, could modify their policies and procedures and training program and deploy community-based provider-operated mobile crisis teams to behavioral health calls, both initial calls for service and encounters when an officer determines that a police response is not necessary. And DOJ pointed out that when someone was in cardiac arrest, EMS and a trained medical professional would come. But what Louisville was doing when someone was having a behavioral health crisis was they were sending out police with tasers and guns, as opposed to people who were trained um, in a medical response. A behavioral health focused response should be available to people experience behavioral health issues instead of traditional law enforcement response when appropriate. Again, this is from the department's letter of finding. Systemic considerations are really important in this area. And that's the plan ahead stuff, the proactive stuff. And that means doing things like training criminal justice personnel, conducting reviews of policies and procedures. Very important for law enforcement to look at their policies and procedures. And IACP is going to be on this panel and talk about some model policies that they have collaborating with mental health and disability service providers. And that's a topic that's discussed in the Louisville program. And you're gonna also see what the ARC of Northern Virginia and the ARC of Loudoun are doing. And Leanne is gonna talk about the ARC's program generally as well. So what are examples of how to ensure accessibility? Train law enforcement officers that when responding to a person in mental health crisis who does not pose a significant safety threat that they should consider providing time and space to calm the situation, de-escalation. In a court, requiring court staff to explore reasonable modifications to allow qualified individuals with autism to participate in diversion and probation programs and specialty courts. In corrections, implement policies that encourage correction staff to seek assistance from crisis intervention teams and mental health professionals when interacting with in inmates that exhibit negative or disruptive behaviors. Train correctional staff in the use of de-escalation techniques and to forego discipline and provide treatment where it is apparent that a prisoner's behavior was related to a disability. Collaboration. Okay, so increase collaboration and improve resource allocation between criminal justice agencies and disability service systems can also help reduce disparities with people who have disabilities. Actions required by the ADA are not special privileges. This is a myth that a lot of people believe, but instead measures to ensure equity and accessibility. Another thing I wanna point out, it's important to recognize that people with disability are, disabilities are more likely to be the victims of serious crime like rape and sexual assault, three times more likely. 
So it's very important that law enforcement take seriously the complaints of people uh, with IDD, including autism. Those with cognitive disabilities had the highest rate of total violent victimization among disability types measured. 21% of unreported violence against persons with disabilities was not reported because the victim did not think the police would help. So there is a, a thought process out there that would be helpful if we all could work on. Okay, community engagement has been really important for my office. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Virginia. And we have worked with the ARC of Loudoun's um, Disability and Justice Coalition. And you can see here a photograph um, of a meeting that we held. And the, the previous U.S. Attorney is in the photo. And you'll see the Sheriff's Department is there. Folks from the Public Defender's Office were there. Um, the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, which is the local prosecutor, is now on this as well. And many staff members from the ARC of Loudoun. Right? I gave a presentation to the Disability and Justice Coalition on the ADA requirements, the long form version of this presentation, which was about two hours. And you can see this was at the Community Service Board Mental Health Agency. I've also given presentations to the Virginia Department of Corrections. They have an annual ADA uh, coordinators training. And I've done it also for the Public Defenders um, Conference um, in Virginia. And this past um, October at the International Association of Chiefs of Police, I again gave my long form presentation on the ADA and law enforcement. Why is this important? We're out in the community discussing these issues. So it's not just an academic discussion or a discussion for this particular agency. It's important for the people where the rubber meets the road to hear this stuff. It's important for us all to find ways to collaborate. And it's amazing the relationships that we can build and that I've seen Leanne and the Ark of the United States build in communities. So it's really important. I've also spoken, by the way, the Virginia Sheriff's Association. 86 of the 136 Sheriff's Departments in Virginia do on the street law enforcement. And all of them have some interaction with corrections. They either operate it or their partners. So really important. All right, I also want to show you, this is a um, flyer that the Ark of Northern Virginia put out for one of their programs where they do mac, uh, mock um, traffic stops. Um, and the police get together with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And sometimes this is the first opportunity for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to be in a non-threatening situation with police departments. It's also an opportunity for the police departments to get to know people in the community. And it's really important, and it's a great program. And I know Montgomery County, Lori is going to talk, I think, about what they do in, in a similar vein. Um, I welcome hearing um, from folks. Uh, please feel free to contact me. This is a very important topic for me. I'll reveal that I have a sister with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and um, this has been a lifelong uh, concern, and I've been a lifelong um, advocate in this area. Uh, thank you, and I know we have some other speakers as well. Thank you very much. We're going to uh, move al along and we'll take questions at the end, I think. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Susan, did you want to make a comment first? Yes, we were um, just wanted to make a comment that we are talking about police law enforcement situations. And if anyone feels very sensitive about that, we do have a sensory room. You can step away or you can feel free to step away from the meeting if you need a break. Um, but we will be talking potentially about some sensitive issues. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Ms. Carleen Ponder. I hope getting Carleen, yeah. Carleen, mm -hmm. thank you for that. Ms. Carleen Ponder from the Autism Society of America, and she'll be speaking about the Autism Center for Empowerment, Advocacy, and Justice, of which she is the director. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Yep, Carleen Ponder again. And uh, the, the Autism Justice Center is a brand new initiative for the Autism Society, and it's funny because we've actually changed our name, Dr. Gordon, to the Autism Justice Center because people felt that was directly to the point of what we're doing. Um, 
just a little bit about my background. I'm an attorney. I did crop disability work from a regulatory perspective for many years with the Social Security Administration. I've done federal policy work um, with my, my good colleague and friend, Leanne. And um, I've done a lot of work around the intersection of disability, particularly mental health disabilities and policing in the local community. Um, the topic of crisis response and how we respond to people in mental health crises is, is near and dear. So just a little bit. The Autism Justice Center, which is uh, again, a brand new initiative for the Autism Society, serves as a resource for autistic people, uh, family members and advocates who are impacted by all forms of discrimination, uh, criminal, Justice is one form. We're hoping to also move into other areas around housing and healthcare and employment as we go along in the education system. But we're starting with uh, the criminal legal system because of its impact on people and the severity. So who we are. The Autism Justice Center uh, has a fantastic task force. On that task force, we have directly impacted individuals so that means individuals who have had some experience uh, with the criminal legal system where um, their autism did in fact interact with uh, particular situations. Uh, we have lawyers, we have professional advocates. Um, what we've been able to do in a very short amount of time is actually come together and provide expertise to people and their families who are encountering some aspect of the criminal legal system at this particular moment. For example, I got a call from a family yesterday whose son was in a car accident. Uh, there were some criminal charges attached to that car accident, and they were very concerned about the legal representation that their son was getting because they didn't feel that the attorney understood autism and the impact that autism may have had on their son's uh, reaction to the car accident. And I was able to, to share some resources with them. So just briefly, what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about the about autism in the justice system. I'm gonna talk a little bit about race and autism from what we have seen and are currently seeing. Some of the issues that we're covering at the Autism Justice Center and some of our rec recommendations to, to make improvements. So autism in the Justice Center, here, here are some of the statistics that are out there. Autistic people, seven times more likely to interact with the criminal system than people who are not autistic. Uh, this comes from being victimized more often, and it also comes from just interactions with police officers uh, more often. It also comes from having mental health uh, issues, for example, I think the figure is 70% of autistic people experience anxiety. Uh, there are, you know, other forms of um, mental health, behavioral health needs that uh, could increase an autistic person's likelihood of coming in contact with the law enforcement. Steve Gordon covered some of that and over-reliance on having to call 911 and having an armed law enforcement response to what's really a mental health need is one way that that happens. Autistic children uh, experience disproportionate levels of school discipline. I think most of us have seen reports of restraints and seclusion uh, being used far too often in our schools to deal with our kids who have behavioral health needs. Uh, sometimes schools also have an over-reliance upon police officers to intervene in those situations, even with children as, as young as five or seven. We've seen that happen as well. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we see um, law enforcement encounters because there is a need for some assistance, either from a, a caregiver, a parent, um, a, you know, teacher who really does need some support and assistance when there is physical aggression um, happening or, or possible. So that also increases the likelihood of coming into contact with the criminal legal system. Uh, there are some statistics showing that places such as group homes and day, day programs are actually frequent callers um, to 911. So, at the Autism Justice Center, another issue that we're seeing 
um, happens to relate to conduct around sexual behavior. Uh, that could either be in person or it could be online behavior and it is leading to increased contact with the criminal legal system. So race and autism. We know that fewer black and Latino children are diagnosed as autistic, although you know, that is changing now, which is a, which is a good thing due to, to access and awareness that wasn't there um, previously. Asian children happen to have the highest diagnosis rate and we're not, I think the studies are saying they're not quite sure if that's accurate or if that's an overdiagnosis or what's going on there. Um, black autistic individuals are more likely to be hurt or killed during police encounters and that just tracks what we know about black people in general during police encounters. So black autistic individuals disproportionately held in jails and sentenced to longer prison terms. And again, that is really a reflection of what we know about black people in the criminal justice system. And so when you add on autism or another disability, um, you get the, the same disproportionate rates there. Couple of examples. Uh, at the Autism Justice Center, we're proud to have Neely Latson serve as our ambassador. You may know him. Uh, Neely was 19 years old in Virginia when he was sitting outside of a library. Someone made a phone call saying that they saw a suspicious person. I think they identified him as a suspicious black person. Um, I think they also said that there was a gun present. When the police officer arrived, uh, Neely and the police officer had a difficult interaction. Neely um, experienced a um, reaction, you know, fight or flight reaction, which is also common. And he asked to be left alone. That didn't happen. There was a physical altercation. Neely was arrested, uh, charged with several different crimes, and had a terrible experience of um, being incarcerated, I think for more than 10 years or around 10 years. Long periods of that were spent in solitary confinement or other forms of confinement um, that were quite frankly just torturous. And so um, due to a lot of advocacy from the disability rights community and uh, just the social justice community at large, he was finally released um, and he got a conditional pardon from the prior governor of Virginia. And we work with him because he is a wonderful advocate and tells his story so well. And that's part of what he's giving back to society now. Another incident that struck me was um, Matthew Russian, a young black man also in Virginia who had been in a car accident. He injured people um, and he himself was injured. But what struck me about that particular case was that he was taken to jail immediately. So not to a hospital or somewhere where he could get medical care, but to jail. And he was questioned for hours without an advocate, without a parent, without an attorney. When I saw the video, he was bleeding and it was clear to me that this young man was disoriented. And so, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of questions about how well our ADA enforcements are being, um, our ADA protections are being enforced. So that's a large part of the work that we wanna do why we, why we started the Justice Center. So some of the issues that we're seeing in particular um, at, the, at the Justice Center, a lot of it has to do with difficulties in the judicial system when it comes to distinguishing mental illness from autism. Um, we're seeing difficulties where autistic people do not have uh, intellectual deficits that are, or that are noticeable when they are coming in contact with the judicial system. There's some some bias issues there. We're also seeing lots of problems around strict liability laws. Um, and it, it prevents, I said, a, a legal conundrum for the developmental de developmentally disabled because with strict liability laws, if you did the thing, you're guilty. <laughs> and it's very hard to add in a mitigating defense or to add in a reason that might explain that behavior. So autism in the courts, distinguishing mental illness. 
We know that autism is, is a neurologically based developmental disability. It's a spectrum, lots of different symptoms. People could be absolutely anywhere um, on the spectrum, but it mostly impairs social learning, communication, that kind of thing. That can be very difficult to explain to somebody who is not familiar with disability, who's not familiar with autism. You know, if you are a defendant in a case, if you did something, there's a, a criminal, you know, charge attached and you go before a court, it's very, and if you present, you know, if you present as if you understand perfectly, you know, what's happening and you're um, not somebody who has an obvious disability, well, there may be some bias there. Uh, the court, you know, may think that disability isn't present or that it's just not that relevant to whatever the issues were that led to the criminal charge. And so that's a hurdle that we're facing. Um, intellectual versus social limitations. That's um, another one because it, it, you know, when you're being charged with a crime and you are um, having to defend yourself and your actions and you want to talk about, you know, maybe a stimuli, stimulus that, that occurred that was disability related that led to that action, if you're able to do that well, that actually might be a bias. Because again, you know, the court sort of looks at it and the prosecutor sort of looks at it as you're conveniently using disability, right? Like as an excuse in this case where, you know, if you're able to come here and if you're able to talk to me and if you're able to explain <laughs> What happened? I don't see how disability um, is a fact is a factor. So, you know, conveying compromise, adaptive functioning, conveying that somebody may be perfect, you, you, you know, may be perfectly capable of um, functioning in one era, area, but have significant limitations in another, is hard. It is difficult, and I think we have a long ways to go in terms of making sure that our judicial system has a grasp or a firm understanding of autism in that sense. Strict liability laws. So with a strict liability law, the prosecution doesn't need to prove that a defendant intended to do something that's illegal, or, or nor that the defendant was reckless or negligent. It's enough for a conviction to just prove that the act was committed and that the defendant did it, um, which is difficult when we're trying to say, yes, but here's the background that led to that person getting there. There was some information missing, some education that they never received, um, and I'll give you I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of like where that comes in. At the at the Autism Justice Center, we see this most in criminal cases involving sexual interactions either online or in person. So, for people who have trouble communicating or forming social bonds, um, you know, just outside in the community, online activity can be attractive. People can spend excessive amount of time online if you're in chat rooms or whatever. And, you know, one feature of autism can be the tendency to sort of collect things. So if you happen to be downloading images and some of them involve underage people, whether you saw that, didn't see it, whether you knew it or you didn't know it, if you have it, if you possess it, you are liable for breaking uh, strict liability laws around sex offense and exploitation. And so we have lots of examples of this coming to us. Um, and in a lot of the cases, I've heard people say, I had no idea, you know, that one or two images out of, I don't know, 100, 200, 500 images that this person downloaded happened to contain this information. They just, they didn't know or they had difficulty distinguishing ages or faces because that's not what they were looking at. They were focused on a particular feature. Uh, what we're seeing is people are being prosecuted and they're being prosecuted quite heavily. 
Uh, we're seeing people get uh, plea deals, sometimes for five years, sometimes for more. A lot of these particular strict liability statutes come with, you know, 30 years in prison, maybe even a lifetime in prison. Significant. Um, in one particular case that we're helping with, uh, this young person had just turned 18 over the summer and had friends who were younger, they were girls, they engaged in a uh, you know, sexual relationship. They did what is common for a lot of young people today with disability or no disability and did a recording you know, on their phones, took pictures on their phones, uploaded it. Images got spread around the community. Parents were upset, charges were pressed. Uh, this young autistic person is still in jail um, facing significant charges as, as a result of that. Um, the prosecutor has said that life imprisonment is on the table. Okay, I'm running out of time thing I'm learning. But um, so just to give you an idea, part of what we want to do is some training and education for our judicial system around these issues because when you have something like these strict liability laws and you have social, social communication deficits and very, very lonely people who might be more prone to excessive online behavior, it's just a perfect conundrum, right, to lead to very significant legal criminal um, entanglement. And we've got to do more. And what we recommend is diversion. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> Next, we have Leigh Ann McKingsley, the Senior Director of Criminal Justice Initiatives at the ARC of the United States. All right, hello, everyone. Let's see if I can, here we go. Um, I just wanna make sure everyone can hear me okay. Uh, and before I get started, just say thank you so much to Susan for inviting us here uh, to have this important discussion around justice issues. It's incredibly important. And oftentimes uh, being in this field for a few years now, I've noticed that sometimes it doesn't make the cut in terms of priority issues until there's a crisis. And then people wanna talk about it. So the goal that I think we're bringing here today as a panel too is to say, we need to get in front of that. And we all are working together to do that. So we're just so excited to have this opportunity to talk to you today about it. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I started with the ARC of the United States 27 years ago. It was really because of the Americans with Disabilities Act that was passed only four years prior to me joining the ARC that uh, we got a grant through the Department of Justice to create materials for law enforcement, courts, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities on this very topic. And I learned that how many people with intellectual disability were being executed. Um, I could not believe what I found out. I had met with advocates that, and not very many, I, I would say, throughout the country doing this work. And I thought, nobody knows this. How can we not know this? And then you cannot unsee that. And so, I never looked back after that. I started discovering through other data, which we didn't have until later on, just how often people were victimized as well. And I, and I realized that there's so much people don't understand about this population. And so whether it's autism, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, um, all these different types of developmental disabilities, we have to um, make sure we don't choose to unsee what we know today and that we make decisions differently moving forward. And that is uh, a little bit about why we, whoops, I went the wrong way, why we started the center um, and why we can't stop advocating. So I have two pictures on the screen here. One is of Ethan Saylor. That was one of the cases we worked on early on in the center when the center started 10 years ago. Um, and he was a person with Down syndrome who died when he wanted to see a second showing of a movie. Um, he went, to uh, without a ticket, he went back into the movie theater 
and um, there was off-duty police there. And so they were called over, long story short, they ended up taking him down and he died due to asphyxiation. And that happened in Maryland. And his mother then began a crusade to make sure that everyone understood what happened to her son, Ethan, and that it did not happen again. And we started working just about the same time. So uh, we worked together on this issue. We worked in Maryland uh, to provide police training. But that, the reason I bring up his story is because just in 2020, another similar situation happened. And this one was with Eric Parsa, who you see on the screen, and his mother with him. And this one was particularly heartbreaking because Eric died with his mother holding his hand with police there. And also he died for the same reasons when he was held too long. And um, the, there was a lawsuit. And so now that the lawsuit is done, they're able to speak out about this. And this family is an amazing family that I got to meet just um, last, uh, well, at our last convention in New Orleans and speak with them at length about what their experience has been, how they try to do everything right, and how just a few months before this situation, they had an encounter with police that went great. Everything went great. So what is the issue here? Why can't it be consistent? What's going on? What do we need to learn from Eric's story? And they are bound and determined to make sure that we learn from this, that Eric is honored through the situation. And so I know she's listening today, so I wanna say thank you so much to Darren and Donna for sharing your story with us. Uh, you've heard some of the statistics. I always wanna start with the actual stories because that's what really matters. But the statistics is what gets us the attention for the grants <laughs> and for the money to support this issue. And you've heard some of those today, but I do want to bring to your attention that we do have data from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And that is the data. Actually, money from the um, BJA uh, is what allowed us to create these infographics. And um, this shows you that two in 10 prisoners and three in 10 jail inmates reported having a cognitive disability. That is the most commonly reported type of disability because they looked at different types of disabilities and they saw that cognitive was the most commonly reported. So I wanted to bring that out, but then if you look at, um, if you look at crime victims, we know the same thing is true. So uh, again, the Bureau of Justice Statistics looked at how often people with cognitive disabilities are, are victimized, and they found, for example, that they were seven times more likely to experience sexual violence. So whether you look at it on the suspect defendant side or the victim side, cognitive disabilities, they are most likely to be overrepresented in the system. And so we can't just say, okay, we're gonna look at it from this angle, or we're gonna look at it from this angle. And unfortunately, that's how the funding streams work. And we're not able to bring the two together and say, how are these things interacting? So it's very important that we think about that um, when we're looking at solutions, policies, and that kind of thing. Um, so because uh, there's so many different diverse issues around this, the ARC started the National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability, as I said, 10 years ago. And thank you so much to the Bureau of Justice um, assistance, BJA, for helping create the seed money so that we could start the center and we could also provide training, but not training that just does a one-off training, but actually creates community-based solutions. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. But this is what we've been working on in the past 10 years, is to provide training and technical assistance, um, information referral. Uh, we provide nationwide information referral. So if it's a person who's a attorney, a person with a disability, family members, whoever is needing, look, looking for support or assistance, we provide that. Um, and I will just mention that many of our calls as well, like Carlene was talking about, does deal with sexual offense. That's been true ever since I've been at the ARC. Uh, we get so many calls around that. There's many, many issues that I like to unpack with you. 
that will take too long to go into that discussion, but please, please know that that is a huge need out there in the community that we continue to try to um, address. And then resource collection and of course, education. I did wanna to mention too, that race and disability has to be key at every um, conversation around this issue. We do have some data showing that um, young people with disabilities are 13% more likely to be arrested than their peers without disability. But if you look at black youth, that figure jumps to 17%. And then people with disabilities overall have an, over, um, an overall 43% chance of arrest, but a disproportionate amount of that does fall on young black men. And so we cannot have this conversation without making sure that we're centering these issues and every single thing we're thinking about, whether it's policy training, um, whatever it is, that has to be key. Uh, and then I had mentioned the data from BJ. Oh, I'm going the wrong way again, sorry about that. From BJS. I wanted to mention also the story of James Metters, who's a survivor of sexual violence. He's probably had, he's, he told me seven different incidents of sexual um, related violence throughout his life. That's not uncommon. Uncom we know from some of the research studies that it's um, highly common for people with intellectual developmental disabilities, including autism, to have some type of sexual um, violence in their lives. I actually met James when uh, I started at the ARC when I was 24. He was on the board of directors and we uh, found out that we both had um, sexual assault in our background. We started talking about how, how in the world is the ARC not talking about this? Are other people not talking about this if we know this is common? But you know, actually we didn't have the data yet. It wasn't until later that we got the category of disability added to the National Crime Victim Survey. Before that, we just heard about it and we saw the data from Canada. So we knew this was an issue. As a survivor, I knew it was an issue because I knew the numbers in the general population. Well, oh my gosh, if it's happening in the disability community, we have to raise awareness around this. And so James and I started talking about how do we do it? And uh, his story is just an amazing one in that he's uh, gone through so many different seasons in his life, but knowing that one of the things he really wanted to do is talk about this issue. And he has raised awareness throughout the country about crime victims with disabilities and what he wants to see happen and what changes he wants to see happen. And so I applaud him. And I always wanna mention uh, just his story. He now is with the President's Committee on Intellectual Developmental Disabilities, really trying to bring this issue at that level. So these are just some of the uh, projects and initiatives that the center has been working on. We currently have a grant uh, that we were just awarded through the COPS office. That's the Community Oriented Policing Services um, um, Office. And they focus on community policing within, the, within law enforcement. We'll be um, creating what's called Just Policing. It'll be online as well as um, in-person training for law enforcement. We're focusing on intersectionality issues in this curriculum, as well as uh, making sure that we're not missing youth with IDD and autism. Another one is language access barriers to justice among victims with IDD, working with the University, um, with the University of Cincinnati, as well as the University of South Florida. And we're looking at how can we increase the, um, uh, uh, how can we increase access to victims specifically looking at all types of victimization? And I won't go through all of those, but if you do have any questions about these other projects that we're working on, I know I've got some um, Kelly with IACP. She'll be telling you more about some of these projects that we're working on together. I will mention uh, earlier, we, you all were talking about the need for look, uh, looking at international research and I would applaud that effort. We've been doing more work internationally, uh, working through Open Society Foundation, provided some money, and over the past seven years, we've been looking at other countries to see what they're doing in this area and how we can learn from each other. So I think that's really important, especially when you're finding a lack of research and solidarity around these issues in your own country. So we've been building, um, uh, building ways to learn from each other in that way. 
this is uh, when I wanted to mention that when we started the National Center, this was the key training that we created called Pathways to Justice. And uh, this is a one day training that involves law enforcement, attorneys, victim service providers, people with disabilities and disability advocates. But what's different in this training is that we um, basically have set out a way to ensure that the entire community that is involved in this will help co-train as well as create a plan moving forward. So we've heard today that it's more it's important to not just think about this as training, but how do we build that long-term approach? So we create what's called disability response teams, number one, and we work with that community to say, you have to have at least these folks on your team, and we have to think beyond the training day. What is it in your community that is most needed? Uh, what do you have access to? What data do you have? Where is it that uh, you know that you can maybe make a difference here, but then think about long-term how to plan for that. And so the, our principles are nothing about us without us. It must be community-based, multidisciplinary um, teams, and then relationship-oriented. And what I'm excited about is that we're talking to different universities now to really start doing a more thorough investigation and evaluation, not just of the training, but of these teams to say, if we put teams in place, how can they really make a difference long-term in these communities? We also use what's called the Pathways to Justice model. And if, you ever, okay, if you've ever heard of the SIM map, which is sequential intercept mapping, we basically took that and overlaid um, intellectual developmental disability. But this is a great tool when you're thinking about as a community or when we're thinking about policy development, it goes through the entire criminal justice system. And we're looking at each step along the way, are we identifying disability? Are we providing accommodations? Which ones? And then how are we pro providing long-term su long support at each stage of the system? We can't just look at one and think we've solved it. Uh, and we can't just involve law enforcement and think that's it. We've got to involve everyone who comes in contact with someone with autism or developmental disabilities. This is uh, where we've had pathways so far. Uh, we've been talking to, um, actually when we, we went to um, South Korea, where they're looking at wanting to develop their own national center on criminal justice and bringing more training in their countries. So we really see the desire for this, um, not just in our country, but other countries as well. Here's some of the resources that um, we'll provide through this uh, to Susan for you to take a look at later on. Um, some of the things that I mentioned today, plus we just had a video come out through Comcast Newsmakers on disability rights and criminal justice. It's a short video, so you can take a look at it and share it with others who might be interested. And then uh, that I wanted to mention too, we have staff that aren't here today, but Josh Branch is an attorney, as well as Jessica Oppenheim, who work at our National Center. And we've got a link to the Pathways to Justice as well. So thank you so much. And I'll pass it on to Kelly. Thank you. So next we have Brooke Mount and Kelly Burke. Uh, Brooke is the Senior Policy Advisor at the Bureau of Justice Assistance at the U.S. Department of Justice, and Kelly is the Senior Program Manager at the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Brooke Mount. Um, I am a very proud mom of a 13-year-old son who has autism, and I also work at the United States Department of Justice within the Bureau of Justice Assistance as a senior policy advisor. My portfolio includes um, grants that provide funding to criminal justice and behavioral health to develop programming, um, including programs like the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, Connect and Protect, which provides funding for law enforcement and behavioral health cross-collaboration, including the 988 Lifeline, and the Collaborative Crisis Response Intervention Training Program, which you're going to be hearing more about shortly. BJA is located within the Office of Justice Programs and is one of three grant-making components with DOJ. 
The Bureau of Justice Assistance was created in 1984, um, and the goal is really to reduce crime, create safer communities, and reform our nation's uh, criminal justice system. Our work really focuses on providing funding um, through programs, transferring knowledge, through training and technical assistance, developing guidance and resources, and engaging in, with partners and stakeholders all across the country. Today, you're gonna to hear more about some of the incredible work that BJA has been supporting along with our partners at the International Association of Chiefs of Police, specifically including the development of training and resources to raise awareness in the law enforcement community, such as the use of evidence-based best practices in police responses for people with behavioral health conditions and intellectual and developmental disabilities. I'm gonna turn this over to Kelly Burke so she can really get into the details regarding these programs, but thank you so much. Thank you, Burke. Good afternoon, my name is Kelly Burke. I'm with the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar with us, we are a um, international nonprofit membership organization um, made up of uh, police professionals of all ranks um, from around the world. We have about uh, 33,000 members um, and we uh, uh, focus on um, education and training and advocacy and engagement. Um, one of the aspects um, of our work is um, we have uh, grant funded initiatives uh, to develop uh, training and resources for law enforcement and their multidisciplinary partners on a number of issues. And um, <clears throat> let's see, the first one I'm gonna talk about is uh, a, the Academic Training to Inform Police Responses Initiative that is a BJA funded initiative. Um, led by the University of Cincinnati uh, in partnership with IECP, the ARC of the United States, uh, Policy Research Associates, and the National Policing Institute. Um, the Academic Training Initiative was started in 2020 um, to provide training and technical assistance to developed evidence-informed and best practices in crisis response and police engagement with individuals with mental health um, substance use just, or mental health conditions, substance use disorders, um, as, um, as well as individuals with intellectual or uh, developmental disabilities. Um, and uh, this initiative led the development of a 40 hour training curriculum, um, the crisis response and intervention training. Um, and we call it CRIT, it's a, a, a toolkit um, I'll get into in a moment. Um, it was designed to prepare officers to respond effectively to people in crisis. Um, the overall philosophy for this curriculum is um, officer safety, public safety, and diversion from the criminal justice system whenever possible. The goals of uh, the crisis response and intervention training uh, curriculum and toolkit um, are to expand knowledge of mental health conditions, substance use disorders, and intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, as well as to create connections with people with lived experience, enhance awareness of uh, community services, and emphasize the de-escalation of crisis situations um, while supporting officer safety and wellness. Um, the uh, curriculum is based on um, the Memphis model of crisis intervention training. You may have heard of CIT training um, that was developed over 30 years ago across the country. Um, this uh, curriculum is, was based on that 40-hour curriculum, um, but is significantly um, modified and enhanced to include um, uh, content uh, throughout the whole um, 40 hours on uh, individuals with um, intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, I think it's important that, to note that the curriculum focuses on uh, behavior and not diagnoses, um, specifically the behavior that officers encounter in the field. Um, there's a heavy practical component um, of role-playing and de-escalation. <clears throat> The training and the tools that accompany the training um, curriculum are 
um, designed to complement the development and implementation of local crisis response um, programs uh, development at the local level. Um, it prepares officers to um, recognize individuals experiencing crisis related to behavioral health conditions or intellectual or developmental disabilities, employ tactics to eff effectively manage crisis situations, including de-escalation techniques, and um, assess local resource or access local resources um, to divert individuals away from the criminal justice system. Um, and uh, it prepares officers to enhance the safety of uh, the individuals in crisis, the officers as well as community members. Um, and this is, um, this resource is, uh, was developed with, uh, because typically crisis intervention training um, did not include any content um, or only limited content on um, intellectual or developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so this um, curriculum is unique because of that aspect to provide con uh, the content and the skills and strategies throughout the entire um, curriculum for effective police response. Um, it explores perceptions and attitudes on disabilities disability culture and community. Um, it uh, provides content on identifying characteristics of uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities, identification tips for officers and strategies for responding more effectively um, as a police officer. It, um, the curriculum encourages the inclusion of people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities in the family and peer perspectives panel. Oops. Sorry. Oops, I skipped ahead once. It uh, provides recommendations and guidance on integrating site visits to local places that deliver um, services to individuals with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities and provides opportunities for uh, participants to interact with uh, individuals with um, IDD. Um, it includes content on laws and policies specific to the disability uh, rights for um, as it applies to law enforcement officer um, interactions. Uh, it encourages inclusion of representatives from the IDD service system to describe their services to the local officers and what is available. And it provides uh, participants with uh, specific de-escalation skills and includes role-playing scenarios um, for responding uh, to, uh, to people with um, IDD. In addition to this training curriculum, which is fully downloadable and it's um, customizable um, to the local uh, community, it can also be used for various different types of crisis response programming at the local level. Um, <clears throat> in addition, the academic training to improve police responses also developed a number of resources specific to, uh, to law enforcement. Um, <clears throat> there, um, uh, two I'll highlight here are um, we have a resource on mental health conditions and developmental disabilities and knowing the difference that is specifically targeted to law enforcement, um, as well as uh, uh, a, another resource uh, on developmental disabilities, um, what officers need to know. Um, and this resource um, specifically discusses how understanding more about disabilities leads to safe and effective interactions and provides examples of possible behaviors of people with developmental disabilities and recommended responses. <clears throat> I'd really like to highlight this um, resource that was developed um, with uh, all the partners um, in, uh, on the academic training. Uh, it's the law enforcement response to people with developmental disabilities, steps for deflection and pre-arrest diversion. Um, this is a multi-page guide um, and it offers uh, insights into the developmental disability community, offers suggestions for su uh, successful interactions, and outlines options for safe um, and effective deflection and pre-arrest diversion when people 
uh, with IDD encounter law enforcement and may be experiencing a crisis um, or are otherwise in need of services. Um, it, uh, it describes the four uh, key steps officers can take to, uh, to support deflection and pre-arrest diversion, um, identification, communication, accommodation, and support. And this was all adapted um, from the stages of the ARCS Pathways to Justice model. Also, I really want to highlight that this has um, uh, includes a lot of examples of accommodations for individuals with IDD uh, to assist in communication efforts and seek supporters and other resources. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I want to also um, let you know that this effort's continuing. Um, we have the ICP now leads a new um, uh, BJA funded effort uh, to uh, expand on this uh, CRIT training and technical assistance that uh, was awarded um, just in 2023. And this includes enhancing interactions between law enforcement, but it also includes um, correctional officers and people with um, IDD. Um, this is uh, in partnership with uh, the ARC of the United States, Policy Research Associates, um, the National Policing Institute, and the American Correctional Association to further develop resources um, to, uh, and training and technical assistance to specifically 39 communities that are funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance around the country um, and receive grant funding directly from uh, BJA. <clears throat> I do wanna briefly mention that the IECP is also working with BJA uh, who is um, provided funding and support to develop resources uh, around um, reducing injuries and deaths of individuals um, who go missing due to their uh, either um, developmental disability or uh, dementia, such as Alzheimer's um, and such. Um, we've developed a number of resources with the ARC and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, as well as um, the Autism Society of America. Um, and I will just describe a few of them um, here. We've uh, just developed guides specifically, um, and you can click on the link to see um, those resources um, as well. And an easy, we created a, a QR code. So if you just point your phone there in the presentation, um, you can go directly to download all those resources. So, and uh, thank you for inviting me to share uh, these resources with you today. Thank you very much, Brooke and Kelly, both. Our final presenter for this session is Officer Lori Reyes from the Montgomery County Police Department here in, in Maryland, in this very county we're in right now. Officer Reyes will be discussing the Montgomery County Police Autism IDD unit. Hello, everyone. I um, am very excited to be here. As, as so it's more than just exciting, right? I see familiar faces in this audience that I've known for 20 years working here, right? And we love each other and we're a family. And I've called upon many people in this room and said, holy moly, I need some help with something. And they've all been here. So I wanna share that, that this is more than just Officer Reyes or Lori presenting. I really have, I have to say thank you, right? Cause I've called upon a lot of you guys to help me out on this journey when someone says, well, why does Lori Reyes, what does she know about autism? What does she know? So it's because of all of you that that's why I get the chance to stand up here and be a voice. So thank you so much. All right, Officer Lori Reyes. It's very hard for me to sit here at a podium. As my fellow officer in the back knows, I walk around a lot. So I basically have to attach myself to the podium so that I'm not walking around. I've been a police officer for 26 years. I have run the Montgomery County Police Autism IDD unit for 20 years. It started in 2004. It started when officers, you would teach them and they'd say, autism, what, what's that, right? And that was 20 years ago. So the name of the program 
It's the longest title program in Montgomery County, but I don't give a flip. You know why? Because when you do a Google search and you're a parent of a child who has autism and you're looking for resources in the police community, it's going to pull up. It's going to say, okay, you know what? I may live in Nevada, but Officer Lori Reyes in Montgomery County might be able to help me out. So the name of the program is the Montgomery County Police Autism IDD. I also do the Alzheimer's and dementia side too. Outreach unit. Again, it started in 2004. We provide training and education to all of our officers since about 2010. We started teaching officers. Again, people would say, what does Lori Reyes know? How, where'd you get your education? You know where I got my education? From the parents that are sitting here and looking like right back at me, from Stuart, you know, from Jalen, from all these people that have given me their own journeys and said, Lori, this is what our officers need to know. So training and education, outreach, empowerment, right? Awarding a family that maybe we've searched for their son three times, but they're willing to get on the news and say, call 911. They'll help you. That's empowerment. Follow up what my fellow officer of also 26 years who's sitting back there that would just about die if I told her to come up here right now. Um, follow up. So also, and then most important, the most important response. You cannot tell a family to call 911 if you're in need and then not provide a great response, right? You can't do that. So the unit, that's kind of it in a nutshell as far as what we provide. Now I know even making up a slide like this, I'm preaching to the choir. You all know these statistics. We know that. I share this with you because this is what we also teach our officers too. Just today, myself and Amy taught our CIT officers. That's the officers that are receiving a week-long class on mental health. And we made sure that autism IDD was included in that. So we teach that. But why the statistics matter, right? When you're teaching officers before lunch, and they're like, oh my gosh, a whole slide on statistics. She's, she's got to amp it up a little bit. Why do I share this with all of you? Because this is what we're seeing in law enforcement. 2004, I started this unit. It was one in 150 births. And right now, where are we at? One in 39 in Maryland, one in 44. So why does that matter? Because when I started the unit in 2004, most of the calls we were handling were for our little peanuts. They were little guys on the autism spectrum. So when you teach officers and you say, why does it matter? Because who's responding to a call for a five-year-old in the middle of Mid-County Highway? Who's responding? All of you are responding. My mom, I always laugh, my mom and her Ford Focus, she's stopping her car at 83 years old to help the five-year-old in the middle of Mid-County Highway. Now fast forward, and we have a 25-year-old in the middle of Mid-County Highway. Who are they calling? Amy and I can raise our hands. They're calling the police because they don't know. So why do these stats matter to police officers? It matters because there's an increase in age and prevalency, that is what we're facing in law enforcement. So that's why the stats matter and that's why we share them with police officers. And here's the thing, as we talk about training police officers, it is not just about training. What we have created in Montgomery County is a culture of what we once said was awareness. Forget about awareness, I don't care about awareness, it's action. It's a culture of action. That's what we've created by educating our officers. What started as just a simple class of, hey, here's some behaviors, or here's what you might encounter with wandering, or here's what you, might, what you encounter with someone in crisis. It's gone on to officers not leaving that call without trying to provide individuals with other resources. And being an officer that's looking out beyond that first call, beyond that first call. So again, the stats matter. Um, all right, so, and many of you know this young man on this slide right here, um, and maybe his mom is on this, right? Maybe Stuart, maybe his mom might be on this, um, on this call. So what we're seeing in law enforcement, we are seeing, so in Montgomery County, we average three to eight fines a week 
three to eight finds a week where we locate an individual who has autism usually that has wandered, that we locate before caregivers have contacted us, three to eight a week. We also handle about two calls a day for individuals who are on the autism spectrum. In one week, in just one calculation for my sergeant, we had 27 calls for service for individuals on the autism spectrum. So what we're seeing, and I know I say this challenge, it's a challenge in law enforcement because we're seeing calls of a more serious nature, not beyond wandering and elopement. For individuals who are in crisis, true crisis, parents, caregivers who are in crisis that need services and resources. And oftentimes it is me, it is Amy, it's the patrol officers who are providing them these resources. We're also seeing an increase. And as I stand here at NIH and say, we are seeing an increase in co-occurring conditions. Not only that, co-occurring conditions in our young guys, right? Where we're seeing autism and significant mental health crisis. So as I say, and I categorize it as a challenge for law enforcement, that's what it is. Couple that with increase in age, increase in prevalency, increase in co-incurring conditions. These are all things that we need to like scream from the rooftops that we're gonna need more services. When we have an individual with autism that's in crisis, the only place we can go is to a hospital on an emergency petition where they're released 30 minutes later. Well, that's what we gotta do because maybe that Maybe that's what the parent needed at that time. That's not okay. We need better services. So I will say that we, Montgomery County, what are we doing in response to that? So again, poor Amy sitting in the back of the room, she's gonna be put on the spot. We started to do follow-ups with the families. So after a call for either wandering and elopement or somebody in crisis, we, if we can't respond, we call the family. Hey, not only did officers, um, are we asking, did officers do everything right? Could we have done something better, done something different? What would you have wanted? But we also say, hey, are you aware of this organization? Um, are you on the autism waiver yet? Are you reaching out to DDA? And we can tell you sometimes families aren't there. They're not there. So last year, it was 600 follow-ups. 600 follow-ups from Amy and I, calling families and saying, what, what do you need? What do you need from us? But also in this era where we understand that law enforcement does not always get it right, when you create a culture of action and awareness, it begins to be more than just training. Right, and that happens through a process, and I believe that's what you know. That's what we've done here, but it has to be all involved. It can't just be the law enforcement. So, what are we doing? Um, hold on, I want to want to skip forward. Um, what are we doing? One initiative that I'm probably most proud of is the work that we do in schools. The work we do with individuals who are navigating autism and their way to independence, whatever that may be. Amy and I presenting to individuals. This is how you're creating the whole community understanding what needs to happen. We're in the schools. We're talking to individuals and saying, how can you have a positive interaction with law enforcement? And I get the controversy of that. Police should know. But we need, this has to be a total approach. And I know everyone has said that too. It has to be a total approach. So we are in the schools. It's the, be it's the best part of our job. It truly is from elementary all the way up to high school. And I invite anyone who would ever want to see us. We'll be at Damascus High School. That's always fun. So please, if you're ever interested in, hey, what are, what are, what's the program doing? Please come out and see. All right, I'll go back real quick. So just some of our resources. Some other things that we're doing, we do the traffic stop class where it's a two part, a webinar, and then an in-person traffic stop for passengers and for drivers. We also, I know there's another picture of the schools. I had a young lady, 
I have the pictures too small. I had a young lady with autism who wandered from her home and she stole a horse. You can't make up some of the stories that we have here. As God is my witness, my girl, she was like Pippi Longstocking. She stole a horse, took it down Beach Drive, swear. Officers did a fantastic job. But here's where the other part comes in. We're not upset with her. We're not upset with her mom. Swear to you, she also, I have a picture of this. Not only did she steal the horse the second time, the first time she brought the horse to her front yard. God is my witness. So what do you do with that? You empower her and you say, hey, park police mounted unit. This young lady loves her some horses. So maybe she needs to see horses and learn about, you know, what, not stealing them, but, you know, <laughs> learn that we're not mad at her. She's navigating her journey and we're not mad at her. And we're not mad at her mom because, you know, how can you possibly keep your eye on someone all the time? So, um, okay, so more of our um, actions and interactions. And let's see here. Oh, there you go. So Amy and I, one other thing that I'm proud of, I know, I know I'm short on time, but I got to tell you, the school presentations. We go into the schools and we do a presentation for the general population of students all students in the school and have a whole school assembly on why Montgomery County Police has an autism IDD unit. And I do call it looking out for the underdog, not because in, not because of the negative connotation of being an underdog, but daggone it, you yourself could be the underdog. I could be the underdog. So maybe look out for those, be kind, don't be the bully. So that's one of our presentation that kind of couples with us having the presentation for individuals who have disabilities and um, making sure that everyone knows that they're not alone on this journey. And there's more of our uh, traffic stop classes. This is a young man, Harrison Porter. Harrison Porter is a young man who has autism and he is also navigating this world and has worked uh, with me as a self-advocate, but he's applying to colleges now. So, that's pretty awesome, and we'll be helping him on that route, too. And more importantly, um, we work a lot with self-disclosure, kind of describing why self-disclosure can be important, a personal journey. That is a personal choice, but we do let officers know that people may um, self-disclose their disability to them, why it's important when you're driving, or why it's important when you have an interaction with law enforcement. We cover that. And we let our officers know that you could have an individual that approaches you in the, in the community. And, okay, so quick, I told you it was quick. So you know what's funny? I think I stood up here just to um, show off and say how much I love my job and how proud I am of the officers in um, Montgomery County. So that's all I have. I love seeing all these faces. And there's my email. You could email me today, and myself and Amy will get back to you. Okay? Mwah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I want to thank you, Officer Reyes, and all of the presenters. We are running behind, so in an effort to make that up, we're going to take a short break. Um, let's see how far behind. We're going to take, uh, we'll, we'll start up at 10 of, so we'll take a 10-minute break. We'll be five minutes late after that point, and we will hold the discussion until after the afternoon's panel. So if you've got questions or comments you want to make, jot them down so you don't forget, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Thank you all for uh, for coming back so quickly after our short break, but we want to make sure that we have plenty of time to hear from our next panel and to also get a chance to discuss amongst ourselves uh, the implications of what we've heard today. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, who's going to be conducting, uh, orchestrating the next group. Thank you so much. Well, we're really looking forward to this community panel that will complement our earlier panel that was formal presentations. We're going to be doing this in a Q&A fashion, and we have some wonderful presenter panelists on this panel. So our first panelist is Dr. Maria Mercedes Avila, who's a member of the IACC and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Vermont and director of the Vermont LEND program. And she's also the mother of a son on the autism spectrum and will be on virtually with us today. 
Our next panelist is Ms. Lindsay Nader, the Vice President of Services and Supports and Community Impact for Autism Speaks, and she's the sibling of an autistic person. Our third panelist is Ms. Camille Proctor, who's a member of the IACC, as well as the founder of the Color of Autism Foundation, and as you heard earlier today, is also a mother of a son on the autism spectrum. Next is Ms. Amanda Roten, the Director of Safety on the Spectrum for Autism Society, and is also neurodivergent. And our final panelist is Mr. Greg Robinson, the Deputy Director of Public Policy for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, and he's an autistic self-advocate. And you can also feel free to share additional details that you'd like. I just wanted to give that quick uh, overview of who's on the panel. And I'm going to conduct this by asking a series of three questions and I'll just call on each person. And our panelists are over here and on the screen. So we will start with the questions. So my first question for the panelists, and I'm going to, um, the order I'm going in is Maria Mercedes Sevilla, Lindsay Nader, Camille Proctor, Amanda Roten, and Greg Robinson. And I'll just keep it the same the whole time. So to Maria Mercedes Sevilla, hi, I see you on the screen. What are the most important law enforcement and criminal justice issues that you feel affect the autism community? And thank you, Dr. Daniel and the committee for uh, including the work that we're doing here in Vermont. So for the first question of uh, most important issues or pressing issues, I think here in the previous panel, they talked a lot about training. And I think that's one of the key areas that we need to continue looking at. So I would say the lack of law enforcement training, but meaningful training connected to child development, ASD, looking at racial disparities, but also the intersection of health and mental health disparities when they connect with um, other systems of oppression. The other um, lack of um, training connects to lack of knowledge of social and historical context in our society. So looking at the history of systemic racism and other isms and how these interact with um, issues impacting our communities. I live in Vermont, so this is one of the whitest states in the country, and it's a small state, so we all know each other when we work uh, with law enforcement like I do. And sometimes I hear people in Vermont say, for example, well, what happened in this state doesn't happen here. And this is an important comment that we need to keep in mind because it doesn't matter whether we are in Vermont or in a more diverse or larger state in the country. Everybody has to have knowledge about issues that took place in our country that are impacting the community. So that's something that is important to highlight related to education. And most importantly, uh, working with families, with children, with ASD and other um, IDD, we hear constantly that families are eager to share their stories and experiences interacting with law enforcement. And I think that's something that we need to continue doing, hearing the voices of the communities in a meaningful way and affect change and improve systems connected to those experiences. So thank you for this first question. Thank you so much, Mercedes. Uh, next, I will go to Lindsay Nader. The same question, and if you need me to repeat the question, just ask. Thank you, Susan and committee. Um, you know, we, we know the highest profile. Oops. There we go. <laughs> Again, thank you, Susan and committee. Um, we know for sure the highest profile cases meet. Mm. How's that? All right, we're in there now. Everyone's got me? Okay. Uh, thank you again, Susan and committee. Um, we, we know for sure the, the highest profile cases make the news, um, but at Autism Speaks, our autism response team, which is our information and referral resource, um, receives and fields thousands of requests seeking uh, safety resources every single year. The top needs that we see with those requests very, very frequently involve the need for first responder training resources. The most common requests that we're getting are from parents and caregivers actually asking the question, in my zip code, are the first responders trained? Do they know about autism? It's a very, very difficult question to answer. We can do our best, and if they're lucky, they live in a county like Montgomery County and have Officer Reyes at their disposal, um, but very, very often they do not have those resources. Progress absolutely has been made. 
Um, we're seeing, you know, promising practices and best practices popping up in communities, but it's very often led by advocates, individuals that are passionately committed, parents themselves, community organizations, uh, my colleagues here doing really great work, um, but we haven't seen it scaled so that I can report that my team is answering a question from every single zip code saying that um, there are standards and that there are trained officers in, in the community. Thank you. Camille Proctor. So for me, um, the most pressing issue, honestly, is the killing of black people by the hands of the police. Um, Officer Reyes, no offense, you're a gem. Um, if I could get you wet and feed you after midnight, you'd be a gremlin and multiply. But unfortunately, you are just one person. And until we address the systemic racism that's rampant in this country, we cannot protect these vulnerable people, people who are at risk daily because of the color of their skin. And then it's compounded because they are autistic, they have sensory issues, and a myriad of other things. And we keep saying train the police, and I do respect the police, but I think that some of this money that you're throwing at training the police, you should be throwing at these grassroots organizations who are in these communities working with these families. We need to be training these young black people how to interact, black and brown people, how to interact with the police. No one's talked about that. We keep talking about training the police. They have that available to them. It's been available to them forever. Whether or not they're using it or utilizing it, that's on them. All I know is that Avarius Thompson in Chicago in November, he was walking home from the store. He fit the description of a perp. He got tased in his own backyard. Stephen Watts got killed in his own house. And um, the other important issue to me is that we stop that, that the people who are listening to this who and the people in this room, you all need to come together and fight to have crisis intervention units in all of your communities because the police aren't crisis, crisis interventionalists. So that's my statement. Thank you so much, Camille. Amanda Roten. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I think when I look at this question on behalf of the Autism Society of America, I really think about this quote from Sir Edmund Hillary, where he said, it's not the mountain you trip over, it's the pebbles. It's those little things. And it's not one thing. It's not law enforcement training. It's not 988. It's all of the things working in unison together because a rising tide lifts all boats. And for me, it's looking at those things and understanding that Individuals with autism are seven times more likely to be a victim of a crime, 12 times more likely to be involved with the criminal justice system without intent. And that's before we add a racial component to Camille's point. So, yes, it is the training, but it's also that culture that goes around it. You know, for, for me, I'll, I'll share my story just briefly because I know we're short on time. Uh, I stand squarely in the center of this, if anybody is wondering. My husband is a career police officer. My job before this was the executive director of a police foundation in Virginia. And I'm on the spectrum. When I started having meltdowns as a masked female, I thought the most prepared person in the world stood in front of me, and he was completely helpless, despite Virginia's one-hour requirement on autism training. But I can tell you firsthand, when we started doing autism-informed approaches to it, to de-escalating, just a simple meltdown in our house that didn't involve law enforcement, it changed. And the perspective changed, too. And that information and that culture that was built around it was so powerful for us as a family. And I know that's just one experience with autism, but it can't be just one answer with just one training or just one number or just one thing we're looking at. It's got to be Camille's point about bringing in racial disparities. It's got to be training. It's got to be 988. It's got to be all of the things to get us there. Thank you so much, Amanda. Greg Robinson. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I do want to echo um, a lot of what my fellow panelists have said. Um, I do want to also say that I think um, when we approach this, one thing we have to recognize is that many times the uh, real safety risk is posed by police interaction for many people on the spectrum and that we do need to one way that we can minimize the impact of police violence is by minimizing interaction with the police in many cases. So when there are putting in place alternatives to police for uh, behavioral health crises can be a, a very critical, play a very critical role in this conversation. I think 
Um, there are, um, we also have um, some very outstanding questions about the of CIT and co-response models, whether those models actually do reduce the use of force um, in police interactions. Greg, right. sorry, can you just move the mic closer yeah. to you? Even move sorry. it closer to you. Yeah, we have a lot of questions about whether um, CIT and co-response models do actually reduce the incidence of use of force. Um, we basically have great concerns where police are present that one of the fundamental rules of police, um, again, Officer Reyes, you, you do seem amazing. I do respect the work you do. I also want to note you are here armed because you are on duty. And that is part of police presence is when you are present on a scene, the possibility of use of force is present with you. And that is something that I think we do need to engage with when we approach these and talk about how we can find alternatives to policing. Um, another thing I want to raise here is another issue that has been raised to us by the community um, around Policing and safety is the use of ID uh, markers and databases to, um, as a form of disclosure, that goes as a safety um, tool. Um, but I think there are very profound privacy um, concerns that our community has raised around um, both how those databases are maintained and, and used um, by state agencies, um, in addition to the fact that when it's an ID marker, it is an automatic disclosure every time. Um, somebody does present themselves in the community in a case where they would show ID. Um, given that many of our communities are also um, on the LGBTQ spectrum, there is also concerns that this information can be used to deny um, medical care and other circumstances um, or otherwise deny agency and rights. So this is something that has been raised to, um, to our organization through many venues and is something that we're actively uh, looking at related to law enforcement as well. Thank you so much. So my second question for the panel is, what is your organization doing to help address some of these issues? And I'll start with Maria Mercedes Avila. Thank you for that second question. And um, I can share briefly that we were able to adapt a training model that was created for health and mental health providers into what is today the fair and impartial policing training in the state of Vermont. And the, the model includes um, the history of systemic racism, looking at intersecting um, issues of having a disability and being from a racially diverse background, looking at child development. Some of the issues that we identify working with uh, law enforcement was that there was a lack of knowledge related to some of the federal laws related to accessibility and also a, a lack of knowledge of Executive Order 13166, which is the language access um, legislation related to providing interpretation and translation services for limited English proficient population. That was one of the key findings that we had through our work, and we incorporate that training into our work. Through this training model, we were able to train all law enforcement agencies in the state of Vermont, and we collected pre and post test data related to um, the training that we offer. Seven years ago, we also created a cultural brokering program, which are community leaders who work with law enforcement and our programs to be able to bridge that cultural divide that exists between organizations and the communities that we're trying to reach. And through these programs, we were able to uh, reduce and prevent arrests in many of the communities that we work with. And finally, we also interviewed more than 100 community members related to their experience with law enforcement and the criminal justice system, including the community justice centers in our state. And we were able to identify recommendations. What we found was that there is um, a lack of knowledge from the community around the role of law enforcement and the limitations of law enforcement, including um, not understanding juvenile law, for example, for many of the communities. And then from law enforcement, there was also a lack of knowledge related to the communities, their cultural uh, perspectives of um, the community that we serve and also that disconnect created a bigger um, um, disconnect between communities and law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Lindsay. Yes, thank you. Um, at Autism Speaks, we have two main um, approaches to promoting our safety work. Uh, the first is broadly to increase access to safety resources, services, funding streams at the state level, 
federal level um, so that individual unique needs can be met. There is no two people with autism that have the same safety needs. We're talking about many trends today, but there's a lot of individualized needs that must be met um, at the family level, through the school system, and through other uh, services. Part and parcel would be then to talk about increasing first responder training, but also broadening our concept and definition of who first responders are. We're talking a lot today about law enforcement agencies and officers, and that is absolutely something that we need to make sure that we're addressing, um, whether it's through crisis interactions. Um, we saw the statistics today, whether it's five times or seven times more likely to interact with law enforcement. Um, but we're, we also need to think about school resource officers, emergency room personnel, EMTs, 911 telecom operators, all of these folks and, and so many others. I'm sure every single person has another sector that's popping into their mind right now that have to operate for our community as first responders. So we're really making sure that we have resources and tools that can increase overall understanding and, and knowledge around autism, but also putting that through the lens of safety needs. You. Camille. So one of the things that we at our organization and um, we encourage those who are in law enforcement to participate in our programming, to be volunteers. And we had a program and we'll probably start it again where we had uh, law enforcement and some of our youth work on projects together. And we had them do this for six weeks. The reason we put them together in this manner is because we wanted to humanize our boys and girls. We wanted them to be people to these officers. We didn't want them to be a list of may not make eye contact, may not do this. We wanted them to get to know those individuals so that when they were out um, working, if they saw someone that reminded them of Jeff or Cindy or whomever, they would understand and respond differently. And what we got in regards to the feedback is that's exactly what is happening. They don't look at this list of maybe this, maybe that. They look at the individual, what they're doing, their body language. And I, I hope that what we're doing will work long term and give law enforcement a better ideal that autism isn't linear. And it's not a one size fits all, but we want them just to, again, stop being reactionary. Thank you. Amanda. You're gonna hear a theme from me. Earlier I said, it's it's not one thing, right? It's, it's all of the things. So what we're doing at the Autism Society of America is trying to build that culture of practice. And to that end, if you are a caregiver and you're in law enforcement, please call our helpline at 1-800-3-AUTISM and connect with me because our ideal trainer for something like this is a caregiver that has autism that can bridge that space in both communities. So we're building that culture of practice. It's, it's not a quick build, I'll tell you, and we need everybody in this room to help us. We wanna be a part of your efforts and we want you to help with ours, but uplifting those voices of individuals, caregivers, parents, and again, as I mentioned, those who are involved in law enforcement that have a connection to autism. Our saying here is the connection is you, and, and we really mean that. Uh, in addition to that, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak to what we're doing with the Kevin Avante grant. Leanne from the ARC and IACP are our subrecipients on that grant. We're lead TTA providers. And I've got to tell you, that's an interesting experience because we work with about 60 sites across the country, and many of them are law enforcement agencies. And they experience the difference in community where they have trouble getting tracking devices out because of the mistrust. So we're trying to bridge that gap and really build a true community of practice. But if you ask me for a one sentence about what we're doing, we're, we're trying to make sure everyone goes home safe at night, whether it's Officer Reyes, whether it's Camille's son, whether it's me, whether it's my husband, we're trying to make sure that everybody goes home safe at night because that's what community means and that's what we wanna be a part of. Thank you. Greg. Um, so we are, um, we engage in a lot of work related to this um, through many of the coalitions that we participate in, um, civil rights coalitions, both with um, the disability community through con consortium of constituents with disabilities, as well as the uh, leadership conference. Um, a lot of our work really is aimed at bridging um, the uh, disability rights and disability justice communities and the, and the broader civil rights communities to make sure that we are 
really rowing in the same direction on um, issues of police violence and making sure that um, the disability community is well represented, that we are addressing these issues and that um, we um, are making sure that response systems like 988 are fully accepted, accessible to our communities, um, um, including those who use text to speech or um, may need other alternative uh, routes to contact. Um, in addition, we produce resources for community members around around pr the criminal legal system and police violence. We uh, have resources on the criminal legal system broadly, police violence, the school to prison pipeline, autism and safety, and um, and sexual violence. So this is an area where we're also we also put priority in producing resources that can educate our community both about the issues broadly and ways to advocate for what um, can best serve their needs. So. Thank you. And my third question for the panel, and we'll start with Mercedes, is what are some ways that you feel the federal government or state and local agencies and organizations can help address these issues? Thank you. And um, I want to start by saying that um, language matters. And in our interactions with law enforcement and in our work, we have found that uh, even manuals and uh, training procedures include language to describe disability, mental health conditions, immigration status that are very oppressive for the communities that we serve. So language is one of the key areas that needs to be addressed and updated to be inclusive. I have gone with families who have uh, uh, children with, with special needs and with ASD and hearing a, a police officer or the criminal justice ask a question using a word that is very oppressive for the child, that breaks the connection between the community and law enforcement. We talk about training. I would say I advocate for best practice training models that build upon knowledge every year. I've seen in many law enforcement agencies that they use training models that are the same training every single year. So nothing is being learned new with these models. Um, advocating for funding that encourages partnerships with communities to be able to hear, hear the voices of the communities. And finally, I would say we need leadership buy-in, not in words, but in actions. We need actions from leadership to advocate for change. And we also need funding allocated to advance um, this work in our communities. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, at Autism Speaks, you know, we, we supported Kevin and Avante's law to be passed initially and continue to lobby for continued funding, obviously, to make sure that this, this program can continue and, and hopefully in the future expand. Um, we'd like to see similar efforts include commu more community partners and more of the promising practices that the uh, recipients of those funding streams are receiving. We do see a really great opportunity for some of this intersectional work, whether it's with mental health partners, um, through the racial lens, through other disabilities that um, can come together. And when you're, you're convening a stakeholder group, um, you can identify universal practices that can be applied to the crisis intervention training model that could then be applied um, and scaled nationally. Uh, we also have seen really great success in either supporting existing community-based models, something as simple as, as a safety fair, where you're gathering those stakeholders on the ground in communities, where you can have autistic people, their families, their caregivers, bring their safety plans. You know, we've got great resources you can download to create crisis plans, to create safety plans that will grow along with you throughout the lifespan. We know a child's needs are not going to be the same as an adult's needs. You don't necessarily outgrow your autism. And even if your child has been raised in a community and you feel comfortable that local law enforcement knows who they are, as they grow and change, maybe they're going to drive. Maybe they're going to be living independently. Um, maybe they're just going to have a tough time in a grocery store promoting and funding opportunities that highlight those community-centered programs will really sort out some of the opportunities that we need to see in leveraging these um, intersectional uh, programs. Thank you. Camille. So um, I'm just going to reiterate some of the things my colleagues said. I do think that it's very important that we work with community organizations. Um, but 
I also would like to gently remind people that the disability movement was birthed from the civil rights movement. And for some reason, we've forgotten all about that. And so you have this section of people, they're black, and they're not being served, and they keep, and we keep forgetting about them. And, and I'm not trying to change the subject, but I think it's very important that we take a look at ourselves and we go back to where did we come from. Again, we came from the civil rights movement, and there's no reason why a black child is being born right now and his father or mother will be talking to him as an infant telling him what he cannot do in this United States. So I think that it's important that we do take a look at these underserved communities and work towards creating better programs because they are the ones who are the most adversely affected. Yes, I care about everyone's life, but when I tell you statistically, people with disabilities who are dead because of a misunderstanding are people of color. Very rarely, do you, and when you do hear about someone that is not a person of color, it is magnified. It is magnified. And that makes me angry often because I, for that one child, there's probably 10 black or brown children that experience something similar or worse. Thank you, Camille. Uh, Amanda. Thank you. I, I'll say Dr. Daniels. This chair is a nice start. That if you ask me what the federal government can do, it's nice to be included in these conversations. Uh, you know, we greatly value it at the Autism Society of America, but I think, you know, my subrecipients at the ARC or IACP would also love to participate in these conversations more. It's a great platform, so thank you. Uh, you know, there's a couple of areas, and I think we've heard them throughout the day. Uh, one is just a general lack of data. Uh, I come from a PR background, so I'm prepping talking points and looking for data, and it, it doesn't exist. So I asked my husband, who's a police officer, and he said, well, it's not listed on the uniform crime reporting. When we look at a 1 in 36 diagnosis rate and we look at racial information that's tracked on uniform crime reporting, we should be getting disability and autism-related information. But if it's not on uniform crime reporting, we're not going to see it because that's the FBI gold standard. So there's a lack of just data about how deep that problem is. And until there's support to collect that data at a federal level that departments follow, we will not have that data. You know, beyond that, funding state developed mobile high crisis units, we've talked about that like cahoots. But I, I want to echo that also with we have to continue that community of practice. The Police Foundation I ran in Newport News had a call for service over the holidays that resulted in a fatal shooting. It was not autism related, but it was a mental health phone call. And at the time, the chief listed in the paper, he called for the Marcus Act, all the things through the Community Service Board, and they didn't come to help because they didn't feel qualified. So that kicks the ball back in their court. And that's what I mean by it's, it's not one thing, it's all of the things. So if we only did a mobile health crisis unit, and we don't train officers, what happens when that falls apart? Uh, and then, like everybody else, we need more money. <laughs> it, you know, everything is underfunded. We need not just money to provide training and autism-specific training and meaningful training, but to work with departments that don't have an officer, Reyes, to implement a program there and actually pilot it and give families an opportunity to know what they're supposed to do in a traffic stop, which is a very stressful situation for anybody, regardless of autism. And supporting things like the Safe Interactions Act, requiring officers to receive meaningful training that includes autism-specific de-escalation practices. And then the last thing for me is 988, but it, it's, it's a two-way street, not just knowing that 988 exists, but having the support on 988 to know what to do next so that training goes both ways. Thank you. Greg. Um, so first off, I want to thank my fellow panels for raising the issues of all, all, all parties involved, all sectors involved when it comes to training. I do think uh, at the dispatch level is when, when where a lot of decisions are made in terms of who responds and how they respond that really impact how people experience emergencies. And that can range from whether police are appropriate for a dispatch, but also whether lights and sirens are appropriate. So I think that is a critical piece. Um, I also... Um, want to sort of back up a bit and talk about, um, again, police violence, I think, impacts people's ability to live in the community, both 
very directly in their ability to move about their community to interact with their community and feel safe. Um, I, we've talked about other cases. I also want to mention um, um, the case of Charles Kinsey, a support worker, and Arnold Rio, uh, Soto, Rio Soto, um, where um, this was a case where um, he, um, Mr. Soto was in a group home, uh, left the group home, and uh, the support worker found him. But in the meantime, there was a police report that the metal training he had in his hand was uh, reported as a gun. Um, there was a police response, and while while uh, Mr. Soto was not harmed. It wasn't for lack of trying. The police shot the care worker in the leg um, accidentally. So um, I think understanding, understanding, um, I, I think, um, understand, under, again, this speaks to who's, who's part of the response team and what they are, what they know and how they, um, and the, the competency both in dispatch and in response. I think um, addressing Wandering also makes me want to really back up and talk about community living more broadly. I think we need more robust, uh, more robust support system, to, um, including much more robust funding for home and community baby services to ensure that people have the direct support they need if they need one-on-one -on -one support, that they have that support, and that itself can prevent some of this wandering. Um, I think we need to it, ensure that people have the resources they need across system-wide, and I, this is a place where another place where we need more funding. Um, but we also need more data about where that need currently exists. And I think that's a place where we have significant gaps. And I think uh, the other thing we have not talked on this panel as much about access to justice, but I do think um, one critical piece when we're talking about justice systems is making sure that people have the resources they need to for assessment and accommodation if there are justice involved. That um, while we did go over the statistics around people in prison and jail, um, there's also an underdiagnosis problem in those systems and that we have a public defense system that is radically underfunded, under resourced, and they often don't have times to get people assessed and accommodated appropriately. And that really does impede people's ability to defend themselves in court if they are justice involved. And I think that for us is, is a huge issue. Uh, I would also like to say, uh, as my time wraps up here, um, that I also think um, one thing, one fear that we have around segregated legal systems, but also around even within um, 988 and crisis response is making sure that those don't track into institutionalization. That um, if people are getting emergency crisis response, so that does not become indefinite hospitalization. Um, one last incident I'll, I'll raise here. Um, uh, this, I am a gamer, so this is something that came on my radar through video games, but there was somebody who, in the UK, who hacked and released um, uh, development footage of an upcoming video game that is a very big deal, and um, he was sentenced to um, indefinite secure um, hospital um, confinement, um, and the reason given was um, his profound autism. Um, this is this denies him a great deal of due process, um, and this is a case where this is somebody who did something I wouldn't even know, begin to know how to do, and he clearly is able to communicate because he has said that he absolutely would do it again. And um, that, to me, I read the Lancet article. I don't understand how that meets the definition of, of profound autism, and it makes me very worried about how some of those definitions are used if they are used to track people into institutional responses. That is also a cause of concern that I have. So. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to our panelists for answering some of these thought-provoking questions. And we look forward to interacting with you in the Q&A and also uh, with previous panelists as well, since we didn't have time for Q&A earlier. So thank you so much. And I will turn it over to Dr. Gordon to help moderate it, but I will also assist. So uh, thank you. Um, we're gonna open it up now for comments or questions from members of the committee. and. Uh, Go ahead, yes. Thanks to everyone um, who presented today. Um, it was really a rich conversation, gave me a lot to think about, as I'm sure many other members of the committee. Um, I love this idea of a proactive approach versus a reactive approach, right, um, in terms of um, the criminal justice system. I'm going to quote you and say, it's not one thing, it's all the things, right, Amanda? And so in thinking about that, right, there was a lot of conversation about um, 
there's a lot of conversation about training officers, which is great, right? We, we Everybody has said that's a great thing, but how do we, like, what are the other steps that we need to take, right? You heard a lot of things that were shared here. So my question to, I would love to hear from everyone. I don't know if there's time, but what is the key takeaway that you want individuals and their families to know as they learn more about navigating the criminal justice system? Like if someone is, 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 just starting to, okay, I'm thinking about my son who's now 20, right? Like one of the things that I did for him was I had an IEP goal that was set up that literally he learned how to take his ID out of his wallet, right? And literally say, you know, before he touches it, you know, I have my ID, can I show you, right? Like this is something that we did individually. And so I'm really thinking about, yes, we need to, we need to approach all over, but I'm thinking about individual families right now that need help right now in this moment, individuals that need help right now in this moment. So thinking about what you shared today and all the amazing resources and, and the thoughts, what is one key takeaway that, that individuals and families can utilize right now? Thanks for that question, Yana. I'm going to use the chair's prerogative to ask specific people to answer that. And if I could, Lori, can I get you up there? And can you answer it in like two sentences? If not, that's fine. You... So to answer your question quickly, I, everyone knows I'm long-winded, so this is really challenging for me. Just want to let you know. Um, that's already my two sentences. All right, so, so what we do is, and I'm with you, I think more needs to be done in the area of um, interactions with individuals on having inter uh, that 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 interaction with law enforcement we we talk about um self-disclosure um uh, uh if you have an interaction with law enforcement what should you do um calm hands and again um, um the, here's the thing though i get pushback on why are you teaching individuals you should be teaching officers and i say no 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 it has to be everybody it has to be the caregiver that has that conversation the police officer the everybody has to be a part of it so yeah i i mean i'm game whatever whatever you want to do let's let's do it <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to invite you to hear me speak to um one of our groups come as a come as a big group and and come watch us when we present to individuals about having interactions with law enforcement i'm going to ask also maria i don't know if you're doing that in vermont do you have do you have something to add Briefly, I would say that what we generally tell um, communities and families is to um, be able to connect immediately with an advocate. I think many times when there are stressful situations, it's very hard for families to even be able to make a decision at that moment. So be able to reach out to one of us, to one of the cultural brokers, to somebody who is in the community working with law enforcement to make that bridge so we can advocate on their behalf because stressful situations are very hard for, for families. So we get calls all the time and I, I will keep advocating for having a advocates with them. Anyone else who has a, a strong one sentence answer? Come on up to the table. It's Leanne uh, with the ARC US. And one of the things we've been talking about is creating um, a certification program for justice advocates that would be part of our network. Um, there, there are things like this in other countries, like the appropriate adult in the UK, where they have something in place so that there can be someone there that um, you were just talking about uh, to provide that advocacy right at the front. And so that's something we've never had in this country. And um, it's about time we get more organized on that front. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. In the interest, I'm going to move on for now, and we can come back to that if there's if there's some time at the end. I've I've got you down, Jalen. Um, I'm going to turn to Ivanova now on the virtual. Ivanova, do you have a question or comment? Hi, this is Ivanova Smith, and my uh, comment for a question is uh, for officers: Is has you had any positive interactions? with autistic people and are there ways that officers could help autistic people solve the problems that, that and one example is um, I actually had a police interaction. I've had several, I had one that was very negative where a police officer was kind of dragging me around <laughs> and yelling at me and that was really scary. 
Uh, but I had different interactions that was very positive. And I was able, they actually was able to help me get to my next bus stop. I had a meltdown because I missed my bus. And that officer, instead of like trying to arrest me or anything, was very, was like, I can help you get to your next bus stop. I'll just drive you to your next bus stop. And that was really helpful. And so I'm wondering if there's more ways that officers um, could like uh, troubleshoot with that autistic individual and help them when they're in that meltdown and say, hey, maybe there's a solution. Like, let me, uh, you know, talk slowly to the person and say, hey, I want to help you. And, you know, what's the problem here? And, you know, kind of thing like that, like kind of think about positive ways that you can help the person. And I've had an officer do that and it's been very positive. And so I'm wondering if there's more ways that we can do that. Also to train officers in non-speaking communication and behavior communication, because I think that is where training is lacking. If when you have individuals that are non-speaking, and cannot uh, tell you what their name is or it, things like that. Like we should be able to train officers and being able to uh, know if a person is not speaking and uh, get a hold of their caregiver. Thank you. Thank you, Ivanova. Would anyone care to respond to that? Please go ahead and then. So thank you so much for sharing that. And here's the thing, I'll be, I'll be quick. Thank you so much. I know it's hard to share the good and the bad, right? And I'll tell you that just this morning, we taught about 35 officers about how to have positive interactions with those who are speaking and non-speaking and gave them a great overview. And we've trained, I guess, over, I don't know, 5,000 5, officers over the course of, you know, 20 years. But I, um, I invite you that if you ever have an interaction and you want to reach out to me and you want to ask, you know, why did this happen? I'm here for you. You know, we're here for you. You can reach out to me. My email is right there. If you wanted to talk about what happened, the good and the bad, I'll take what you share and I'll pass it on. Promise. Okay. Thank you, love. Thank you. Amanda and then Greg, and then we'll take another question. Sure. Thank you for sharing that. I, I really value you sharing both sides of that story with us so that we can make the world a little bit better. Uh, I just want to let people know from the non-speaking perspective, if you go to the resources that are on the IAC website for this meeting, the Autism Society of America has our first responder communication boards up in English and in Spanish. They are free. Make copies. If you are a law enforcement officer on this phone call, if you know another law enforcement officer in another jurisdiction, if you're a chief, if you have a friend that's a cop, send them the link to the file because it's a great tool to pull out and it supports many needs. So it could be somebody with Alzheimer's. It could be somebody with dementia. It could be somebody with just a language barrier in general. But specifically for autism, it has photos related to what law enforcement might need to ask or information they might need. And I know it's a lot to carry around all of our different things. I have three pairs of headphones in that bag over there, but you can also print it out for yourself. Um, I, I have verbal shutdown during a meltdown and having that at your disposal, if the officer doesn't have it, that you can pull out and point to can start bridge that gap of communication. So it's on the IAC website with all the resources that we send in in English and Spanish. You can also call us at 1-800-3-AUTISM and I will send it to you. It's a free resource. It's our first responder communication board in English and Spanish. Oh, great. Um, I'm gonna be super duper quick, quick, but I did wanna say I really appreciated Officer Reyes in your presentation uh, that you uh, featured ID bracelets because I think uh, when we talk about I mentioned earlier sort of ID flags and things that have been proposed. I think that's one alternative that um, works for people who don't speak, who don't need to reach for their wallet, which can be potentially perceived as threatening, um, and allows them to communicate information um, without speaking. So I think that is, I was really gratified to see that as an example in your presentation, because that was something that is also something that has come up for us that we've discussed and, and recommended in the past. So, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Gordon. Um, so I had a question um, with regard to federal law enforcement, the federal justice system. Um, 
I wondered if any of the panelists might have any suggestions, ideas, recommendations for how we could apply lessons learned from local and state law enforcement perspectives to the federal system. And I ask partly because we do not have any universal requirements for the federal justice system for improving accessibility, including access for autistic people um, and supporting programs and practices. And the federal court system actually is not required under any statute to provide accommodations for people with disabilities other than communication supports like sign language interpretation, CART systems and FM systems. So there's a large gap with regard to the federal law enforcement system and state and local system. And I, so I wondered if there's anything that could transfer over from what we're learning from the state local system. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Any of the panelists uh, care to respond? Well, that's telling. I can jump oh, in. Oh, go ahead, Lindsay. Uh, this is just very specific, but um, you know, I, I have clocked a couple hundred hours of um, in partnership with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children delivering first responder training um, that is autism specific. And some of the feedback that we got at the local and state level um, was including command level um, leadership in the training and developing training that is a train the trainer module so that you're not just targeting um, an increasing knowledge base with you know, patrol or people that are fresh out of the academy, but that you're building it within the institution. That's a community. You're, up, you're leveling up the autism knowledge of that structure. And we know the challenge. Is it one million law enforcement officers in, in the United States, something like that? Um, the structure within that is so complicated. There's hundreds of different branches at the state level. Uh, but I would say that making sure that you're in, including command level um, leadership in the training will also incentivize those positive interactions. You can create opportunities to not only think through when things go wrong, how could we do better, but to celebrate and to really make space for making sure that, that those positive examples are becoming policy and procedure and not just one-offs. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn to a comment from Marina Kay. Yes, hello. Uh, Marina Kay has this comment to share. It is extremely frightening that people are trying to weaponize profound autism as a reason for regressive and problematic policies and practices under the guise of choice. Things like institutionalization and segregated housing being falsely labeled as safe disability equipped alternatives or so-called communities of choice when they know the term community of choice means something can, uh, completely different. Things, for example, like subminimum wage and restraints. Uh, they say those aren't specialized innovations. They are inhumane and unjust ways to throw people away. Who is going to be hurt by the most by these things? People who look like me and my kids. They say they shudder at the cluelessness and privilege of those who claim these things are necessary. As a person with a graduate degree in special education and a black disabled mom whose intellectually disabled son has experienced institutionalization and polypharmacy, they say they're not just talking semantics. Um, the things being pushed by certain groups and similarly minded individuals are the things that get my people killed. Black and brown people with level three autism live in the real world and that world is hella ableist and hella racist. Thank you, Marina Kay. Um, I'm going to put you down on the list, unless it's a direct response to what Marina can say. Okay. Uh, Dina? Thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to reiterate uh, what Greg had to say about underdiagnosis. Uh, in, in my work as a social worker, every single individual that I have had dealings with law enforcement got their diagnosis after the dealings with law enforcement. You know, so getting people properly diagnosed so that they can get a medic alert bracelet or whatever is just critically important. Um, I have the same concerns Greg discussed about the ID card. It's not the card. It's the reaching for the wallet that terrifies me. So my son wears a medic alert dog tag, and we taught him to say, I need my mom. I'm autistic, and to just tap that dog tag because then all the hands are visible, right? And so you, you, I totally agree with you, um, officer, that we absolutely have to start teaching our people how to interact, how to show their hands, how to do those things. Sadly, most people of color get that talk way early on, but, our, but they're still 
disproportionately represented in these interactions. Um, our, our kids who are not kids of color don't get any of this training, and parents are so afraid they're going to be scared of police that they don't teach them anything. Well, and that doesn't work either. So um, thanks for listening to that. Um, I did want to just bring up one really, really – I love your traffic stop idea. We think that if you can drive a car, you can drive a car, but if you can't deal with the law enforcement officer who wasn't trained when they stop you, you're not ready to drive. Um, the last thing I want to say is I'm unfortunately going to have to tell you that the Ohio State Senate just overrode the governor's veto to deny transgender access to health care for our people who are transgender. We haven't talked about transgender. We kind of talked about LGBTQ and intersectionality, but the highest risk factor for law enforcement interaction is being a black male transgender person transitioning to female they have the highest exposure risk of all. So I, I really do hope that all we've talked about today in terms of training law enforcement people, we're also emphasizing the massively higher percentage of neurodivergent people who are part of the transgender community because they're dying rampantly all through the country. And I hope we can do better on that. Um, so I'm sorry, I didn't have a question. I had to preach for a minute. It's okay. I, I see that Greg wanted to respond to that and also um, I just wanted to follow up because I did mention when I talked about one of the concerns we have around IDs, that is a concern that the trans members of our community have raised is that if there's a database that possibly a parent, possibly a guardian, possibly some third party put you in years ago, um, that that can be used to deny you care too. And we've seen a number of states that have targeted disability status, specifically autism, um, to say that autistic people are not capable of making of knowing who they are, making these decisions, um, I, and um, seeking uh, trans-affirming care. So that's a very active concern for our community that um, we have, and I think that intersects very closely with some of the concerns we have around how um, I, um, disability ID flags in, in whether 911 databases or a DMV databases, how that, that information is used, because that is a place where that is a real, really, really serious concern. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a, uh, just tell a short story, which is this. Um, my son, who is autistic, his special interest is travel. So last year we were in Paris um, at New Year's, and they blocked off all the streets. And our route back to our hotel, he's a creature, I mean, a creature habit, the route back to the hotel, the streets were blocked off. And right in front of our hotel, the, they had it blocked. And we were trying to talk to the officers to let them know that we're staying in a hotel right there. And my son decided that he was just going to break the blockade. And he took off running. And I said, my, like, you know, like you see in the movies where it's like, no. And, and, I, and, I, and I screamed. I'm like, he's autistic. And the cops looked at each other. And then the one cop grabbed him by the shoulder like this. He said, "Miss, sure you can't run off like that because you made your mother upset. Now, I'm thinking to myself, that never would have happened. That never would have happened at America because all they would have seen was a black man running down the street and disobeying what they were being told. But when I said, he's autistic. Well, I don't even know what I said, really. I'm just making it what I thought maybe I said because I was in just, like, such a panic. I was in such a panic. And then when that officer, and then he, I guess he told the other officer, and he's walking back with him, and he goes, now, we don't want to do that. We have to listen to our mother. And he's just lecturing him on listen to his mother, and you have to, you can't do this. And I'm just like, where am I? And I go, oh, yeah, I'm not in America. So I just I wanted to leave you all with that because that it 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 it, it it's frightening and I don't want you to say well she keeps talking about racial stuff but you know they said that's who I am you know and that's my identity and um, everything that's been said here I think is going to take a collective on all fronts in order to change the way that we protect our individuals who are part of our community. You know, autistic people are part of our community, so we need to protect our community members. And that's just first and foremost for me. We need to protect our community members. We all need to do better, right? We need to do better. We need to speak up. Parents need to be able to go to the lawmakers and say, 
here's what I need for my child. You can't sit at home on your couch and be a couch cheerleader or an internet cheerleader if you're not going to get off that couch and go to your state capitol and say you need this change and why you need this change and why your child matter matters and it doesn't matter what color they are. You're useless to me. So I'm going to need everybody to get up, put pen to paper, and do what you got to do. Jalen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of other levels if we're going to be looking at this comprehensively. Uh, and uh, Scott, you brought up a couple of issues. One is we had encountered a situation where there was an attorney that was representing an autistic man, but his specialty in disability law happened to be surgical malpractice and causing disabilities. So he really did not know anything about autism, but yet he was defending somebody with autism, which takes it to the next level of a friend of ours who uh, is a federal court judge. And I said, what would you change in the system if you could? And he said, education of judges on all levels to understand autism and disabilities. And that's something that we have not covered here yet, but it is an important thing because a judge may have the discretion of making a longer sentence or a shorter sentence or modifying things. So that is an element that even if there are excellent people in law enforcement. And Lori, I wanted to mention some things uh, here. It has been amazing to see her team in action. The last one, uh, last situation was that uh, our son was at a shopping center not too far from here with a black man who has been a, an absolutely amazing caregiver. He went to get a pizza, got out of the car to get the pizza at the door that was being delivered by curbside. Our son escaped from the back of the car because he was mischievous and disappeared. And this fellow was panicked. He has been with Madison for years. And he started looking for him, couldn't find him, called us. We called Montgomery County Police and said, no sirens, and this is what the situation is. I was concerned for two reasons. One, that we had a black man at 1030 at night, possibly going through houses near there or through parking lots where cars were parked, searching for our son. Meanwhile, it took five officers and about 15 minutes to locate our son who had gone up to the movie theater because he wanted popcorn. And we had not looked there. We'd looked every place else. But they were so cool that they said, Madison, you seem to like us. Would you like a picture taken with us? And so Madison has that on his counter that he has had a positive encounter with officers. Thank they you, Jaylen. I'm going to have to cut you off. I'm sorry, because there's three more people and we got five minutes. All right. They have done wonderful things that she has Thank not you. been able to tell you that there's a long list that people can do in their community, including first responders Thank you, and autism. Night I'm going to ask Steve if you would want to make a brief comment about uh, judges since that, since Jalen brought that up. State court judges are covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. I have done training um, for state court judges in Virginia. And um, I'll tell you right now, the Justice Department is suing the Pennsylvania judicial system because there are judges that are refusing to allow um, people who are um, have opioid use disorder from taking methadone and Suboxone. Um, so the Department of Justice has done things in this space, and I've done training and education the Virginia judicial system also has a, a very good ADA coordinator, and we have a settlement agreement um, with the Virginia system for failing to provide sign language interpreters to people who um, are deaf. So they, as a part of that, set up a good ADA coordinator system. And they're required to have ADA coordinators as well, which are in-house people who understand how the ADA works. So Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Jenny, I have you next. Thank you, panelists, and thank you to all the speakers for sharing um, this really important resource for our broader community. I have a question if anyone who's spoken today have interfaced with schools or educators or school administrators to share the resources and trainings that you've done in the broader community. 
because our kids spend hours in school and that would be a perfect setting for this education and then to invite parents and caregivers to participate in this education. Anyone? Go ahead, Lori. Uh, so, yes, I started about 10 years ago presenting to paraeducators, principals, uh, all school staff, and then that kind of led into the general assemblies to the general population on having them have an understanding of autism and other disabilities. And of course, our um, push to teach every single class in Montgomery County, all of our, all of our classes, we're trying to um, have my partner in the back be able to do that. Um, but yes, we work, we work a lot. We're in schools all the time. We were in schools when folks maybe didn't want us in schools. And I said, I'm going in because my kids need me. And these kids need to hear about having interactions with law enforcement because we were seeing our officers have interactions. And I wasn't going to take that I wasn't wanted in the school as an excuse because I know my kids, I know my kids need us. And I have seen our officers say, yeah, we had a young man who was in complete crisis, but he said, Officer Lori told me to keep my hands here or Officer Lori did this or Officer Lori said something. So please, 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 the importance of police officers looking like me in full uniform, because that's what they're going to see in crisis in uniform, having that interaction and saying what they should do in a police interaction needs to be supported. It's important. Alicia, you're still back there. You also had a question or comment. She was, she was oh. trying to get your attention from me. I'm sorry. You're no. blocked by the camera. Oh, you see. Go right ahead. Uh, well, the person that I was hoping would answer my question left. Mm. Um, my question was around the training because, as everybody has said, Dr. Reyes is awesome, but coming from Alabama and living in Baltimore is not something that I often experience. Uh, similarly, as Ms. Proctor mentioned, as a Black person, that my interactions with the police haven't always been that great, regardless of what kind of training is available. And my wonderful education, my interactions are still not always that great. So I just avoid the the police like like they're COVID. But what I was oh, oh she's back. Yes. Okay. So my question was, given that we have this wonderful training that you do here in Montgomery County. I'm wondering what are the barriers to making these kinds of trainings more of a nationwide thing? I mean, we train the police on how to shoot accurately, right? Like precision and all that stuff. How can we weave in training for de-escalation? Because even in, like I said, in, at my education level, I've had to de-escalate with the police when I wasn't doing anything. So how can we, is, what are the barriers to making these kinds of trainings more on a nationwide level? Is it a funding issue? Is it a willingness issue? Is it a time issue? And I was hoping that, Ms. Burke, since you're back, do you have any perspective on that? Because you, I'm thinking that you have more interaction with uh, a larger variety of, of uh, jurisdictions. So what have you seen to be the biggest barrier to these kinds of trainings? How much time do you have? <laughs> um, I would say um, there, you know, there are 18,000 law enforcement agencies around the country. Sorry. There are, there are 18,000 law enforcement agencies around the country and um, state level um, state mandates the, the actual training um, at the, the accreditation of officers at the, at the uh, local level. Um, so there's no one policy in the United States that mandates training um, for, you know, all police officers. It's, it's at the, the local and state level. Um, the avail you know, availability of training, you know, evidence-based training materials. There's um, the availability of, you know, uh, of, of training time. There's a lot of demand for training. Uh, uh, getting officers in training on a lot of different, you know, important topics and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, the recruitment and retention issues in law enforcement and it taking um, officers off the streets to go into training, you know, there, there are, uh, you know, some compounding factors um, that, you know, relate to that impact on getting this type of training out uh, across the, the country. But, um, I would say that the state level accreditation 
um, for um, mandating what officers need. That is, you know, one one avenue. Um, like um, Amanda mentioned, that in in Virginia, it's one hour uh, of training that um, is required, but it's different in in every state. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, all of the panel members from both the, the earlier panel and the, uh, the, at the later panel this afternoon. I want to thank all of the committee members for really what was a stimulating discussion. I think we heard a lot. We heard a lot about uh, training, about community engagement, about training both sides, um, about thinking about it comprehensively. We heard some about obstacles in the, whether it be with regard to your federal system of enforcement and judges, uh, or whether it be about the balkanized uh, system. For, for someone who deals with trying to, uh, uh, trying to influence medical practice, mental health practices throughout the United States, um, this is a familiar story, right? The federal government actually doesn't often in these cases set standards Right, that's really left up to uh, various other organizations, including state and local government. And so, uh, but thinking about ways that we might recommend some of this work to be done in a national way uh, could be productive. So, thank you very much for engaging on these topics and uh, for engaging as well with the public comments and with this morning's topics as well. Um, Susan, what uh, what other closing remarks do we have? Well, just want to thank you again for wonderful panels this afternoon. We really appreciated all these insights and such an important topic. I'm glad that we were able to uh, take this on and, and have such a great discussion. So thank you very much. And I know that uh, through Department of Justice, there are a lot of different uh, coordination activities going on. We'll continue to engage on that. So Let thank you. And by way of closing out the meeting, we uh, will dispense out of uh, time interest with uh, oral recitation of the round robin updates from the different uh, agencies and organizations around the table, but they have been provided in writing. And all the materials that I've said, oh, that's in writing or you got it before, whatever, that's all on our website. It's all publicly available. Um, and so uh, anyone listening in who wants more information wants to be able to take a picture of that QR code or, uh, or, or click on any of the, the um, links um, you should be able to get that on our website. Um, thank you very, very much. And our next meeting is scheduled for? April 17th. And I also want to give you a heads up that we're tentatively planning for April 16th to be our special event. It's not totally planned yet, but and so I didn't put it on the slide, but you're hearing it and we will let you know the final date for that. Uh, we'll also have our office be in touch about the summary of advances and voting for that and follow-ups with the new report that we're going to be doing on co-occurring conditions. So we really appreciate everyone's engagement today and wish everyone safe travels home and hope that you have a wonderful evening. And once more, thank you uh, to all the ONAC staff who are sitting around the outside of the room. Give them, give them a, a good thanks. Give them a round of applause. Um, and everyone who traveled here have safe travels back.